Let the magic begin! I still have a lot to do with it. Running into you in a place like this? I can see you two still love wandering around. Oh, it's Dia! Hmm, since when are we just wandering around? We're usually taking care of some serious business. Even though it may have nothing to do with our journey. But never mind that, what brings you here? I just finished a commission in the desert for a usual client of mine. Nothing too interesting. Just escorting a shipment of goods. I'm on my way to report back. That's when I saw you two all the way over there, chatting away. What were you two talking about anyway? Huh? Y you serious? Can't say I saw that coming. Mm, but you are travelers after all. I guess you'd never stay for too long in one place. Bumping into you like this will become a rarity. Ah, I'm starting to feel sad just thinking about it. Hey, how about I gather a few mercs to escort you two? What do you say? Thanks, but no need. Oh, Paimon had no clue you'd miss us so much. But don't worry, we'll come back to see everyone when we get a chance. <laughs> Sounds good. All you need to do to get to Fontaine is cross this stretch of desert and navigate some waterways. Knowing you two, I'm sure it won't be anything you can't handle. So, uh, when are you leaving? Oh, wait a sec. Paimon just remembered there are still a few dishes in Sumeru that Paimon hasn't tried yet. Now, where's that list Paimon made? Hmm. <laughs> I see. Guess you won't be needing a going away party or anything. It's sad enough to see you go like this. Though, now that I think about it, Sumeru wouldn't be what it is today without you. Seems true heroes always prefer leaving quietly. <laughs> by the way, should we go say bye to Nahida? Oh, good point. Then there's no need to bother her in the real world. Then... I guess this is goodbye for now, Traveler and Paimon. Whether as a client or a friend, you're always welcome to come find me. Goodbye, Dia. Bye-bye, Sumeru.
sand and water, we finally made it! Oh, this must be Fontaine's port! Wow! Everything looks so advanced in Fontaine! Paimon's heard that the industry here is extremely developed, and there are all kinds of unusual machines! Just seeing the sights as a tourist is nice, but maybe it would be better if we found something to do! What do you think? Good idea! Nahida gave us loads of useful information. Seeking out the seven is probably still our best source for information at this point. Yeah! The more we can learn, the better. So, what do you think the Hydro Archon's like? Will we get along? Nahida said that she has a very unique personality. Whatever that means. To learn about a nation's god, start with the nation's people. There seems to be some locals talking over there. Let's go see if we can join the party! If you ask me, it's a tragedy how things ended for him. Clearly, he was a pretty decent person. Yeah, I didn't expect that kind of ending for him. I thought he would at least fight on a little longer for his family. I was expecting a sudden plot twist, but it's a pity that it never happened. Still, his story is quite the tearjerker. Uh, excuse me. Can I help you two? I couldn't help but notice you standing here listening. Uh, hi. <laughs> We're travelers new to Fontaine, and we had something we wanted to ask. But you seem to be really busy talking about some kind of play, so we didn't want to interrupt. A <laughs> uh, play? Oh, no, no, no. We're talking about something that really happened. In fact, it's a case that was just heard a few days ago. Really? Like, a real trial? But the way you were talking about it and the words you used just now made it sound like some kind of story. Well, good tales are often based on true stories, aren't they? And what you see in reality may also be someone deliberately putting on an act while harboring ulterior motives. Whether something is true or not simply isn't that important. The main thing is whether the story being acted out on the stage is splendid enough. Oh, but it looks like you're not from around here. You probably don't know that the Fontaine Court of Justice is called the Opera Epicles, or more commonly known as just the Opera House. But, uh, shouldn't court cases be treated a little more seriously than that? Not to question Fontaine's way of doing things. It's just that putting someone on trial is usually a very serious thing. <laughs> no worries. Other visitors to Fontaine have wondered the same thing. You could say that we just don't want to waste the moving stories behind those cases. And as for your worries about whether the cases are treated with due reverence, we have the absolutely just and honorable Chief Justice Nouvellette, as well as the Oratrice Mechanique d'Analyse Cardinal, a machine created by the Archon. Between the machine and the Chief Justice, false charges and injustice are a thing of the past now. The Oratrice? Is it some kind of machine too? Oh, Paimon's curious. We should check it out if we get the chance! Wait, I might almost forgot to ask you a question. Um, do you know what we should do if we want to meet the Hydro Archon? Oh, that's easy. Just go to the Opera House. Lady Farina practically lives there. You could definitely say it's her biggest passion. Huh. I think what they mean is that they wish to speak with the Archon personally. In that case, I'm afraid it's going to be a tad more difficult. You'll have to make an appointment well in advance, and it'll depend on whether or not she has any time slots available. Huh. Is the Hydro Archon super busy taking care of official stuff? Wait, didn't you say that she's always at the Opera House? No, no. Lady Farina seldom takes an interest with the nation's affairs. The reason it's difficult to make an appointment is simply because she's incredibly popular. That's right. After all, she is the Archon. Though she may tend to get a little dramatic from time to time, people can't get enough of her. Huh. 
first time Paimon's ever heard of an Archon being described that way before. <gasps> Wait! Paimon gets now! The Hydro Archon is kinda like a big celebrity here, right? Yeah, I suppose you could say that. <laughs> Perhaps you could even say our mascot. Hang on. This is still Fontaine's Archon you're talking about. You should show some more respect. Yes, you're right. I guess I should at least try to be a little more respectful in front of visitors. Otherwise, I might get arrested and find myself face to face with Monsieur Nouvellette. <laughs> Come on. Sure, there's a lot of laws here. But nobody's going to be arrested for saying something disrespectful about the Hydro Archon. we can find the Hydro Archon at the Opera House. But who knows how long making an appointment will take. <sighs> Guess we could have a look around the city in the meantime. Hey, what are you looking over there for? Huh, maybe something's the matter. <gasps> she isn't going to jump into the water, is she? Uh, maybe we better go check on her. things, actually. But there's nothing I can do but just keep my troubles to myself. I was just reminiscing about a place my brother and I would play when we were kids. It was just atop that hill over there. See? Uh, you're pointing at the sea. <laughs> Wait, are you saying that you and your brother lived in the water? No people call the waters around Fontaine a sea. It's actually just an inland lake that's filled with fresh water. And though I can still see that hill clearly in my memories, now it's been completely submerged. He would skip and jump, tossing sand in the wind. The sun shone brightly, and the air was filled with the scent of the sea. But now, the water is gradually swallowing our memories. <sighs> it won't be long before it swallows us. Get what you mean. Ah, I don't believe we've had the pleasure of meeting. Are you Lynette's new friends? Oh, and you are? Thanks for looking after my sister. She often comes here to reminisce about our childhood, that's all. There's no need for any concern. Oh, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Linny, and this is my sister Lynette. If I had to guess, I'd say you must be travelers from abroad. Nice to meet you! Paimon is Paimon, and this is the Traveler! We just arrived in Fontaine! We were just talking with your sister. Uh, even though we didn't really get what she was saying. Hmm, I see. It's unusual for Lynette to be so willing to talk with anyone. In fact, she seldom speaks at all. I'm usually the only one she ever talks to. Really? Then you two are just like us! Paimon's always the one talking for some reason. <laughs> so that's how you think it is? I also think my brother can be too talkative at times. Oh. <laughs> Seems you were right, Paimon. We are quite similar. when she said that the water is engulfing your memories and that it won't be long before it engulfs you too. Oh, that. It's from a prophecy that's been circulating in Fontaine for some time now. 
Well, I suppose prophecy isn't exactly the right word, because that implies a certain amount of uncertainty. There's no doubt about what's happening in Fontaine now. Where to begin? Hmm... Let's put that question on hold for a moment. We still haven't formally greeted each other yet, have we? Uh, did all the introductions earlier not count? Hello, Traveler. And hello, Paimon. Hey! Why didn't Paimon get a handshake? Oh, you're not poking fun at Paimon, are you? <laughs> Please, don't take offense. Just consider it a sort of etiquette we have here in Fontaine when making new friends. You should remember it. It might prove useful. Oh, all right then. Well, Paimon's just happy to have a local friend now. By the way, we were just getting ready to go to the Opera House to meet the Hydro Archon. Would you be able to show us the way? <sighs> so you're going to see Lady Farina? No problem at all. In fact, I was planning to go to the Opera House later myself. I'll gladly take you once I finish things here. Please follow me. Just what will we come across?
You said you were going to see Lady Farina? Well, it seems Lady Farina has come to see you. in hand and those with nothing at all raise your glasses in celebration if you don't have one then just raise your hand and little as you can all see two unfamiliar travelers have arrived in our nation come let us make a toast in honor of this traveler and his companion who have journeyed here from distant lands. Uh, is she talking about us? I've long heard of the turmoil and chaos you've left in your wake as you visited other nations. But I welcome you nevertheless. No, I have come to receive you personally. Fear is for insignificant cowards. I am a god, and I will never entertain the notion of such meaningless wariness. You can be rest assured. I see clearly your sincerity. Of course, seeking an audience with me is the most sensible thing to do. It will allow you to truly behold my power and witness my authority. Intelligent people always gather under the <laughs> correct banner. I, Fosalor, hereby welcome you to the nation of Hydro and acknowledge the value and significance of your trip. Now, you may rejoice in this. Yeah, Paimon still can't believe it. Feels like we've only been here for a few minutes. But the Hydro Icon's entrance was, uh, how should Paimon describe it? A little over the top? Ahem. <clears throat> uh, Miss Hydro Icon, how did you know we were coming? I see. As Outlanders, you inevitably lack even some of the most basic understanding. Don't forget that even the gods can be divided into the mediocre and the excellent. I suppose it's only natural for you to be awestruck by my abilities. You had best stop and consider. Do you really have the noble qualities and etiquette necessary to communicate with a god? All it takes is a flick of my finger for me to know everything about you. Whoa. Talk about sounding high and mighty. <laughs> oh? What's with these looks? Perhaps the welcoming ceremony still isn't enough? Hmm. What else should I say, then? Uh... Is she waiting for us to start talking? Wow, I didn't expect to see Lady Farina here. What a surprise! Wait, does this mean they're the legendary blonde traveler? How did I not notice before? Hey, what's all the commotion? Oh, is that Lady Farina? Is there some kind of drama going on? Of course! 
That's the blonde traveler, the one all those stories are about. Lady Farina came here to personally see him. Oh, I bet this is going to be the duel of the century. Oh, I've got to see this. I knew Lady Farina would never disappoint. <laughs> yes, but don't get too excited now. My dear believers and spectators alike tend to get quite rowdy. And despite the noise, I've come to tolerate all their ruckus. You may consider this my reward to all of you. I have determined that there will be an epic duel between myself and this traveler from another land, just as you were hoping to see. Uh, now she wants to fight? Aren't we getting a little ahead of ourselves? Might I remind you that this is a duel against the Divine? What are you trying to do, Traveler? Provoking a god in front of her people? Ahem. Stand down, Clorant. I admire his bravery. Few have the courage to draw their sword against a god. He is obviously a true warrior. <laughs> Unfortunately, people nowadays only crave to be thrilled, and a mere duel will not slake their thirst for excitement! Huh. Yeah, she's right. Just a duel wouldn't be all that interesting. <sighs> On Araneus, criminals are always requesting duels to defend their honor. I'm getting a bit old, to tell the truth. You see. Then, as the god of justice, I shall face this traveler in another kind of duel. A duel in court! Oh, all right! Now that'll be worth seeing! Right. This is Fontaine, after all. Such a grand opera house, it would be a pity not to use it. Why do you care so much about the crowd's reactions? Seems you've spent a little too much time in the opera house. you plan to have a duel in court? You mean you're going to put us on trial? <laughs> oh, we have reason to put you on trial. It's obvious, isn't it? According to Fontaine Law, no one is permitted to release any flying objects within Fontaine city limits during the first three days of each month. You are clearly guilty of violating this law, no? Oh, so that's what they've done wrong. Mm, that's our Lady Farina. No one knows the laws of Fontaine like she does. Uh, you call that obvious? What kind of law is that? Wait, flying object? <gasps> you mean timing? Precisely. Now, if you two have no objections, then, in the name of the Hydro Archon, I order your arrest! My apologies, Lady Farina. I don't mean to spoil the fun. But if you would allow me to interject, I don't think that Paimon here meets the definition of a flying object. You tell her, Linny! Finally someone who's not crazy! How could anyone call Paimon a flying object? Ah, great magician Linny, my beloved citizen. I'll permit you to object, but how exactly do you plan to prove your claim? <laughs> As a magician who just rained on your parade, I naturally should shoulder the responsibility of saving the show. So, with such an audience gathered here, allow me to perform a trick for everyone. There. 
As you can all clearly see, Paimon should be classified as, well, something like a balloon. This rope has been in the Traveler's hand all along. It was just that no one could see it before. <laughs> you call that magic? <laughs> You've got to be joking. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Nice one. Huh. I'm not sure what to think. It seems Lady Farina's charges no longer hold water. of unexpected twist that I enjoy. With you here, today's performance can finally be called complete. Performance? You see all this as a performance? In which case, consider the matter of your trial resolved. The God of Justice will not bring charges against an innocent person. But when there are valid grounds, I will not only judge travelers from abroad, but even the gods of other lands. <laughs> I look forward to seeing your upcoming performance at the Opera House, Mr. Linny and Miss Lynette. That's enough for now. Toodaloo! Don't mention it. I just happened to remember that there was such a law, so I did a little preparation, just in case. I didn't think it would actually come in handy. So, now do you see what kind of god Lady Farina is? She can be a bit confusing at times, but she is still amenable to reason. Anyway, Paimon had no idea you were a magician, Linny. It sounded like you'll be performing at the Opera House, right? <laughs> I just know a few simple tricks I use to make a living. Lynette is my assistant. It will actually be my first time performing on the most prestigious stage in Fontaine, the Opera House. But isn't the Opera House where criminal trials are held in Fontaine? When there are no public trials being held, the Opera House hosts a variety of other performances. To the people of Fontaine, the line between a trial and a performance can be a little blurred. And speaking of performances, I would be remiss to forego this opportunity gifted by fate. Might I invite the two of you to see my performance? My brother's always excited to make new friends. Oh, sure! We don't really have anything to do now, and we wanted to go to the Opera House anyway! Splendid. In that case, why don't we go together? I'll show you the way. I just have something to take care of first. Oh, you really mean it? Then I'll take you up on your offer. This is a magical item known as a magic pocket. Perhaps you can help me distribute them to the people here. Huh? What are they going to use it for? About that... Hmm. You asked me before about the prophecy, right? Let me start by telling you a little more about what it entails. I'm not sure exactly when it began, but a prophecy has been circulating around Fontaine. It says that every person in Fontaine is born with sin. No matter how the Nation of Justice holds trial after trial, this sin cannot be absolved. Until one day, the water levels in Fontaine will rise, and the sinful people will slowly be drowned. In the end, the people will all be dissolved into the waters, and only the Hydro Archon will remain, weeping on her throne. 
Only then will the sins of the people of Fontaine be washed away. That sounds pretty gloomy. Why are people in Fontaine born with sin? What is that supposed to mean? There are lots of guesses. Some say that the ancestors of Fontaine stole the power of the seas and stirred its wrath. Others say that the people of Fontaine never heeded the first Hydro Archon's warnings and offended Celestia. But here in Fontaine, evidence is what matters. There hasn't been concrete evidence for any of these claims, so they can only be regarded as conjecture. If even the people in Fontaine don't know what sin they committed, wouldn't it be better just to ignore the prophecy completely? Why bother feeling guilty all the time? That's exactly what the people did at first. But in the last few years, the water levels in Fontaine have actually started rising. Many places have already been completely submerged, and now lie beneath the sea. Many people carry on with their lives as before and shrug it off as a natural phenomenon. But my family and I think that the people of Fontaine shouldn't ignore the possibility, which would end up sentencing them to death. We hope that at least the people who reside near the waterfront can move away before it's too late. So, we've started distributing magic pockets to them. As a magical item, these magic pockets have astonishing capacity. I'm sure they will come in handy when people are moving their belongings. Oh, Hyman gets it! It's like preparing for a rainy day! But this is more than a bit of rain. Hmm. Perhaps only absolute power could ever contend with such a catastrophe. <laughs> But who knows? We're just tiny specks in the grand scheme of things. Now, if you'd like to help, then please give these magic pockets to anyone nearby. Be sure to convince them to take it, regardless of what they say. Blonde Traveler that everyone's been talking about. My apologies for not recognizing you earlier. Oh, a magic pocket? Seems you really thought of everything. I guess it's better to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Thanks. Oh, please, also thank the Magician on my behalf when you get the chance. this? Ah, so you also believe in the prophecy. <laughs> Keep it. I won't have any use for it. What? You mean you don't believe in the prophecy? No, no, I believe in the prophecy. But I also believe in another story. The story says that people once lived in the ocean. They were one with the ocean and couldn't live apart from it. But as time wore on, People desired to live on land and developed blood vessels, encapsulating the sea within their bodies. Thus could people set foot on land. So, if you ask me, when the water rises and takes us all, it'll be like we're going home. Oh, we hadn't heard that one before. But people can't live underwater. They'll die. You should probably still take it. <sighs> All right, I'll take it. I guess I just feel that being dissolved into the water doesn't necessarily mean death. Huh? <laughs> I don't want that thing. The way I see it, if the prophecy's true, it's still gonna be a long time before the water can cover everything. Life is all about living in the moment. 
What use is there in worrying about the future all the time? We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. You should still take it. You never know when it'll come in handy. Oh, all right, fine. Thanks. It's just that... If I start moving, that means I've already given up on the life I have now. I'd really rather not. Oh? You already handed out all of the magic pockets? Hm. That was fast. So, what did people have to say? I bet you heard some, uh, interesting opinions. Yes, but that will change once disaster strikes. I know they'll change their minds, so it's only right to help them prepare. Is there anything else you need to do before we leave? Yes, one last thing. I have the magic pockets made by a workshop in the Court of Fontaine. Since we're out and about, I was thinking about bringing him some more materials. So, you want to collect materials? Just tell us what the materials look like and we'll help! Many hands make light work! Oh, that would be much appreciated. We'll need some Romaritime flowers. I remember seeing them near the waterfront on the east side of the harbor. Quick work of that. I can tell you're an experienced traveler. I've also finished collecting a few here. Maybe next time you'll feel like helping too, Lynette. No way. I'm in power saving mode today. Otherwise, I fear I may not have any energy left for the performance at the Opera House. Ah, <sighs> fine. Though the performance is still a long way off. Now that we're finished here, we should get ready to head back to the Court of Fontaine. We're going to the Court of Fontaine before we head to the Opera House? Good. Paima wants a tour of Fontaine's largest city and try... Wait, shh. Have you noticed that person over there? The young girl. Huh? What's wrong with her? Paima didn't notice anything. <laughs> She's obviously a thief. Magicians and thieves practice similar methods. We divert attention and a distracted audience is one that won't discover what you're really doing. Watch her movements carefully. Oh, he's right! Shh, keep your voice down. We need to think of a way to catch her, but it seems she's very alert. Perhaps we should split up. You two can ride the lift over there and wait up top. I bet that'll be her escape route if she tries to run. All right, let's go.
should we do? Should we chase her? <sighs> You're right. She might also be trying to lure us away. Nothing's happened for a while now. Paimon wonders if Lenny caught the thief. Are you sure that's all she took? You should check to make sure you're not missing anything else. N no, that was all. Oh, I can't thank you enough. I didn't notice a thing earlier. Anyway, I should be going now. Thanks again. Oh, were you returning with the thief had stolen? That's right. Pity I wasn't able to catch her. She distracted me by dropping the thing she stole on the ground. By the time I looked back, she was already gone. I saw the general direction she went, but Linny twisted his ankle, and I needed to make sure he was okay. Oh, did you get hurt, Linny? I'll be all right. It's just a twisted ankle, that's all. In fact, it's feeling better already. If you want to play at being a hero, at least try not to get hurt doing it. Imagine what would happen if you managed to derail our performance as a result. <laughs> you're right, you're right. Sorry, Lynette. <sighs> I have to admit that the thief was even more skilled than I had anticipated. But at least we were able to get the stolen items back, so it wasn't a complete failure. What a slippery little thief! Guess things turned out alright in the end, though. Lenny's initiative paid off! All right, let's put this little detour behind us. We should go to the Court of Fontaine now. This is an aqua bus. It allows people to travel between several key locations around Fontaine. It's pretty convenient, but the ride can become a little dull after a while. The scenery is always the same. That's why it's better to travel with friends. So you mean it's still boring even when I'm riding with you? Uh, no, that's not what I meant. It's just that, uh, well, you don't really talk that much. Besides, it doesn't really feel like a real trip when it's just the two of us. It's the same as being at home. <laughs> hmm. Whatever. Guess that's what it's like to be an older brother. <laughs> it's about time for us to leave. Let's get on board. Introductions, Paimon. I would recognize the great magician Linny and his assistant Lynette anywhere. I wouldn't be much of a reporter if I didn't know who they were. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Charlotte, a reporter for the Steambird. 
Nice to meet you. From the Steambird, huh? We've often relied on your paper to promote our performances. It's an honor to meet you. <sighs> now that everyone knows each other, Fontaine suddenly doesn't feel like such an unfamiliar place. So, what have you been up to lately, Charlotte? Any big news? Not too much. When there isn't any breaking news, I mainly cover the trials at the Opera House. You can still manage to keep readers' attention as long as you tell things from a clever enough angle, even if it's the same old topics. For example, reporting on how a scammer once deceived vulnerable girls into relationships, or how a financial criminal was once so poor that they ate a single piece of bread for five days. Ah, <sighs> you're right. Seems you know me pretty well. What I'm really after is exclusive, sensational news pieces that could shake the country. These smaller stories are a waste of my talents. Oh, I just remembered. I've been following a case lately. Well, a series of cases, actually. You mean the Serial Disappearances of Young Women case? That's right! These stories are the talk of the town right now, and it's probably the most mysterious case we've ever seen. If I'm the first with a draft ready to publish when the case is finally cracked, and it's the headline story in the Steambird, oh! when that happens, I bet all the other reporters will shed tears of envy. I've already gathered all kinds of materials. I just can't wait for the truth to be revealed. So, what is the serial disappearances of young women case? You mean the culprit hasn't been found? That's right. The first missing girl case happened almost 20 years ago. And ever since, after a period of time, another girl disappears. What the cases have in common is that the girls are all of a similar age, and that they've all vanished without a trace. But the scariest part is that to this day, none of the girls have ever been found. Many suspects have been arrested over the years in connection with this case, but shortly after each arrest, another disappearance would always happen. Yes, it's possible. But either way, I believe that every case has some precise truth behind it, waiting to be exposed! Yes, I agree. And at the very least, the family of those missing girls deserves some sort of explanation. <laughs> I just imagined for a second what I would do if Lynette were to suddenly disappear. I'd pay any price to get her back, and then find a way to track down the culprit. Please don't imagine that, Lenny. chatting with you. Life should be full of pleasant little surprises like this. Yeah, us as well. The ride went by too quickly. Ah, I have an interview to get to. I should get going before I'm late. Okay, Hyman hopes we can chat again soon, Charlotte. See ya! <laughs> Bye now. Oh, be sure to stop by and see me at the Steambird when you have time. Job. Always running around and interviewing everyone? <sighs> well, where should we go now? If you don't mind, how about we stop by my home first? Besides, I still have all the materials we collected. Sure, we wouldn't mind at all. 
This city is so huge, Paimon wouldn't know where to start anyway! This is our current abode. Ah, Fremine, your home. Where did everyone else go? I have some new friends that I would like to introduce. Oh, they all just went out a moment ago. I see. Everyone is getting busier now that Father will be returning soon. I suppose that can't be helped. Allow me to introduce you to my little brother, Fremine. He is a phenomenal diver. Uh, hello. Nice to meet you! Paimon is Paimon, and this is the Traveler! Oh, you sound very proud to have a diver as a brother, Linny. <laughs> Uh, Linny, could you come here for a moment? Hmm? What is it, Fremine? Do you have something to tell me? Hmm. Okay, I see. Is everything all right? Oh, it's nothing. We were just discussing a little housework. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, before I forget, the Traveler and I collected more materials to make magic pockets. Were you able to get any, Fremine? Yes, I went diving and gathered lots of materials. I was about to give them to you. That's our Fremine, always quick with the underwater work. All right, I'll take these to the workshop. Hmm, looks like rain. Oh, you're right. But wasn't it clear and sunny just a moment ago? Fontaine's weather sure is weird. <laughs> I'm afraid that's just how it is here. It often rains on days where there are trials being held in the Opera House, but don't worry, it'll clear up soon enough. <sighs> hmm? What's wrong, Fremine? There's a legend about the rain that I tend to believe. It's said that a dragon of water once resided in Fontaine. Though we don't know where the dragon went, every time it weeps, the skies will cloud up and pour out rain. When I was a child, my mother told me that if I wanted to go outside and play, I should yell toward the sky at the top of my lungs. Hydro Dragon! Hydro Dragon! Don't cry! Hmm? Hmm. Huh. 
doesn't seem to be of any use. It is just a legend, after all. You know, you might be a more popular magician if you understood the concept of romanticism. Or could at least play along. <laughs> Sorry. It might be because we've never met the Hydro Dragon. Perhaps it can't be comforted by the words of strangers. Hmm. It rained for longer than I suspected. Oh, it's already getting late. Was there something you needed to do, Lenny? Yeah, some preparations for the show at the Opera House. I need to find a way to catch the last Aquabus of the day. On the day of the performance, just ride the Aquabus to the island of Araneus. I'll have Lynette meet you at the fountain in front of the Opera House. Oh, uh, are you leaving now? What is it, Fremenet? I'm in a hurry. Oh, I get it. You feel nervous delivering the materials for the Magic Pockets, is that it? Perhaps we could trouble the Traveler to help us take these materials to the Beaumont Workshop and deliver them to the owner there? I'm afraid that Fremenet can be quite introverted, and the boss there tends to be pretty talkative. <laughs> Fremenet has always been a little afraid of her. No trouble at all! Don't worry, we're on the case! Sorry for the inconvenience. I'm quite useless when it comes to such tasks. I'll think of a way to make it up to you. Oh, no need, no need. This will be a walk in the park for us. New customers? Looking to buy, or do you need something made? Or perhaps you're just looking for a chat with me. Oh no, we're just here to deliver some materials. Here they are. They're for making... Uh... What were they called again? Ah, these must be for Magic Pockets. I could tell right away. I've already made several orders worth now. No, no need. They've already prepaid several batches worth. When they told me what they'd be using them for, I even offered them a discount. But they insisted on paying the full amount, saying that I had a business to run. <laughs> it seems both their hearts and their pockets are made of gold. Wow. So, is Lenny actually loaded? Mm, I can't say for sure, but who knows? Maybe there's good money to be made being a magician in Fontaine. Hey, is this machine what you use to make stuff here? It looks really advanced! Why use your hands when a machine can do the work? It would be a waste not to use the latest technology. And wasting is a kind of crime. But where does a big machine like that get its power from? Ah, uh, well... It's a little complicated. I'm not sure I can put it in layman's terms for you. But basically, everything we usually use here in the city is powered by indemnitium. It's a type of energy that's produced from trials. Huh? How can trials produce energy? Well, I'm not completely sure of all the details myself, but basically... When a trial is in session, the Oratrice Mécanique d'Analyse Cardinale harvests people's belief in justice and converts it into energy to be used all around Fontaine. So that's what its other function is? Hmm. Hyman heard that the Oratrice was created by the Archon to make judgments! But... Hyman still doesn't get it! How could something unreliable like people's beliefs be turned into a stable power source for these machines? Oh, yeah! So that means the Hydro Archon relies on the machine to take the energy created by belief and turn it into power for all of Fontaine, right? Even though I've never heard anyone really put it that way before, it sounds like it makes sense. 
Besides indemnidium, we have another type of energy called pneumosia. It isn't produced by the power of the Archon, but it is unstable by nature. Even now, it still cannot be widely used by civilians. <laughs> I thought I'd find you hard at work, but here you are chatting the day away. Since you're already talking, I'm sure you wouldn't mind a few words with me. Y you again? Didn't I already promise you that I'd have the more I owe to Conferee of Cabrier by next month? Why are you hounding me now? Yeah, but how do we know that you won't go running off by the end of this month? I want 50% today. Wait, no, 70%. Huh? You... Seems business isn't so great for the workshop. We've already finished our job and delivered the materials. Maybe now's a good time to leave? Hey, hold on! Before you go around trying to collect payments, why don't you settle your own debts first? If Confrere of Cabriere wants to poach clients from Northland Bank, that's fine. But I'm afraid you still owe the bank a hefty sum of more. So why don't we work things out between us first, before you get back to your little conversation here? Ah, uh, you're from Northland Bank. But we said we'll pay everything we owe next month. Why are you hounding me now? <laughs> Traveler, Paimon! I didn't think I'd run into you here in Fontaine. What are the chances? We're surprised to see you too! What are you doing here in Fontaine? You didn't want to stay in Snezhnaya? <laughs> Long story short, I've already been in Fontaine for some time now. And honestly, things have been pretty boring. But it seems that fate brought our paths together today. Not only will I have some good friends here now, but ones who always seem to find trouble. Either way you look at it, it seems things are going to get a lot more interesting now. Pretty sure we'd want to avoid anything that you'd find interesting. Besides, our trip here has gone pretty well so far. Right, Traveler? <clears throat> uh, hey, you, Northland Bank boy. Aren't you forgetting something? Don't interrupt. It's not often I run into the Traveler like this. Why don't you wait for me over there for a while? You kidding? Aren't you the one looking for us? You really expect us to sit and twiddle our thumbs while you catch up with your friends? Listen to me, boy. If you want your mora, fine. Why don't you come and take it? Hey, I just said not to interrupt. Oh, by the way, Traveler, the last time I took Tonya and Tuser ice fishing, Tuser said... Hey! That's way over the line! All right, boys, let's see who has to pay up now! Uh, can you at least let me finish one sentence? Fine. Though the bank told me not to get rough with our clients. You're the ones who started it. This is an act of self-defense. <laughs> you two will have to be my witnesses, okay? I'm sure this won't take long. You can run! Oh, what's your deal, Brad? How are you so strong if you're just a staffer from Snezhnaya's Northland Bank? Wait, don't tell me you're... Uh... Oh, now you notice. It's a little late, don't you think? Just make sure you understand that you don't mess with Northland Bank. Got it? Uh, huh? Now's my chance! Huh. That was weird. I'm not sure. It's as if I suddenly lost control of my hydro powers when I needed them. Maybe there's something wrong with my vision? Strange. How could that happen? First time Paimon's ever heard of someone losing control of their vision. Never mind. It doesn't matter. 
If I want to stay sharp, I shouldn't be relying too much on my vision anyway. Besides, I always have my delusion in case I need it. So what are you doing in Fontaine, child? I don't see its work for Northland Bank. Well, I guess it's because I've been in a bad mood lately. Huh? What kind of reason is that? Wait, since when do you feel down about anything? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I still have a lot to learn about myself. But recently, there seems to be some sort of restless power stirring inside of me. And I don't know why, but every now and then I feel like I'm in a terrible mood. Hmm. Maybe you losing control of your vision just now is connected with that power you're feeling inside. Hmm. That is a possibility. I can't remember if I ever mentioned it before, but when I was 14, I fell into some unknown abyss. It was during that time I learned nearly all of my abilities. The one who took me under her wing and taught me was named Skirk. She was always quiet and very mysterious. Nobody knew where she came from or what she had been through, and she was always very strict when teaching me combat techniques. One time, I asked her why she was willing to take me on as an apprentice. From what I could make of her answer, it was... Because I had awakened it, and traces of it remained on me, she said that all my combat training would be useful in the future. But what is it? What did you awaken? She never explained that, but my guess is that it's related to a dream I saw when I had just fallen into that abyss. In my dream, I was in the deepest depths of the sea, and the boundless seabed was all around me. But in front of me appeared a whale that was so massive, I felt like I couldn't breathe. A whale? Oh, that sounds familiar! When we fought against you before, you summoned a huge whale that seemed to leap at us. Is that the one? <laughs> That's just an abstract form of a whale that I create using my elemental powers. It takes that shape because the scene I dreamt of the whale has always been stuck in my mind. I'll never forget it. So you used the whale as inspiration for one of your moves? Huh. Seems a little twisted to Paimon. So why don't you just go ask your master? Maybe she knows the answer. You make it sound so easy. Ever since the incident I experienced there, I've never stopped searching for Master Skirk and that unknown abyss. But it's been years now, and I've still found nothing. There isn't even a trace of the place where I remember falling into the abyss. Oh, it sounds like some kind of ghost story. Yeah, I'm out of leads at this point, but there's nothing more I can do. It seems that strange encounters in this world tend to be elusive like that. Oh, seems the time really flies when I'm talking with you. I just remembered I have somewhere else I need to be, so I should get going. What? More work for the Northland Bank? Uh, no. It's more of a personal appointment. Lately, I've been sparring with some of Fontaine's official champion duelists whenever I'm feeling bored. Official champion duelists? You mean it's their job to duel? Yep. In Fontaine, before a criminal goes to court, they're given one chance to defend their honor by requesting a duel with an official champion duelist. The champion duelists are all powerful fighters selected from among the nation's best. And the duel itself is a no-holds-barred fight with no specified stopping point. So engaging in such a duel is regarded as a symbol of defending your honor. If a criminal manages to win the duel, they'll be acquitted. But if they lose, they'll have no choice but to stand trial. And the worst case scenario is that you're simply killed in the duel. Though it's rumored that Fontaine has a death penalty, from what I can tell, no one has ever been officially sentenced to death. So really, the only people who opt to duel are those who have suffered a grave injustice in being accused, or those who greatly value their honor. Otherwise, why gamble with your life? So, do many people actually get out of their trials by winning the duel? Apparently, it's exceedingly rare for anyone to actually win. 
Fontaine probably enacted this system as a way to show that the nation respects the honor of its citizens. Besides, none of the champion duelists are to be trifled with, which is exactly why I was itching to face them as soon as I got to Fontaine. Apparently the one I'm meeting today, Clorend, is the strongest of the champion duelists. I had been asking her for some time before she finally agreed to face me today. Well, that's child for ya! Hmm. Paimon feels like we heard that name somewhere before. Clorand. Huh. Oh, before I forget, I want you to have this. I'm just worried that it could become uncontrollable again. I'd be pretty upset if it got in the way of my duel, so I think I'll be better off without it for now. Besides, I just need you to hold on to it for a short while. I'll come retrieve it when I have some time later. Paimon knows what you're up to. You just want an excuse to come talk to us again, don't you? <laughs> Whatever gave you that idea? I'll be in touch later. Sneaky guy. He said he's been feeling down lately, but he seemed the same as ever to Paimon. <sighs> well, seems we don't have much to do for now. We might as well walk around and see the city before Lenny's performance. Wow! Who could have seen that coming? The reporter who was barely around for most of the story was the murderer all along! Sorry. Paima was just surprised, that's all. <sighs> Paima never saw that twist coming. The murder mystery novels here are amazing. The whodunits here in Fontaine are a lot different than the light novels you see from Yai Publishing House. Both have their merits, but Paima thinks this style of novels are more... well, novel. It's so exciting to reach the moment when the mystery is uncovered, especially in the one Paimon was just reading. You should buy a copy and read it, too. Oh, sorry about that. Paimon will be more careful next time. Uh, hey, shouldn't we be heading to the Opera House to see Linny's performance soon? It's almost time for the show to start, so we should get going. Linny said that the Opera House is on air in ES, so let's go ride the Aqua Bus!
Welcome to the Navia Line. I am Elfan. The boat will be departing imminently. Please do not stick your head, hands, or other body parts outside the boat. The Aquabus operator is not responsible for any accidents or injuries resulting from doing so. Also, please remember to buy the Steambird, though I don't read it myself. The destination of the current tour is Erinias. Points of interest worth visiting include the Fountain of Lucene and the Opera Epiclus. If you look to the left in the direction we are currently traveling, you will see the famous Fontaine Research Institute up in the sky. An experiment gone wrong turned new sightseeing opportunity. Human ingenuity truly is a wondrous thing. Approaching our final destination. Please be sure to bring all your personal belongings with you as you disembark. Even though I will take any forgotten items to the lost and found, the paperwork is rather annoying as Melazine hands are not suitable for grasping pens. Please be careful when disembarking. It has been my honor to be your tour guide this trip. Thank you. Guess we can rest a bit. forward to it. Huh. Looks like there's a lot of people standing around the fountain up ahead. Oh, Archon. Please bless us with a bright and healthy child. We pray. I don't know why you always feel the need to ask so much. I'll be happy as long as our child is healthy and lives a peaceful life. <laughs> I guess if there are, kid, then there's no doubt they'll turn out smart. Maybe this is one of the customs in Fontaine. There sure are a lot of couples here. Vache. What's wrong? Vache. Vache. No, Paima didn't say anything. Are you hearing things? Welcome to the Fountain of Lucene. All the water flowing through Fontaine converges here. It's customary for newlyweds to come here and wish for children. Ah! Oh, Lynette! You scared Paimon! Why did you get here? Hmm. When he asked me to wait here for you, remember? Ah, right. What do you mean? There are a lot of people here right now. Huh? Hey! You're not trying to scare Paimon, are you? Besides, it's the middle of the day! It's not the time for eerie things! Hmm, I see. 
I might be able to tell you something that could help explain the voice you heard. In fact, you might not be imagining things at all. I suspect that what you heard is a result of your hypersensitivity to the hydro element. Others in my family have had similar experiences. It's because of his sensitivity to the hydro element? But what would hearing a voice have to do with elemental power? When do you cry, Paimon? Wait, what? What does that have to do with anything? Just answer me. When do you cry? Uh, when Paimon's really sad? Oh, and when Paimon's super happy. Oh, and also when Paimon's really, really scared. Then you should understand that tears contain your most intense emotions. Like I just mentioned, the Fountain of Lucene is where all the flowing water in Fontaine converges. Even the tears that fall to the ground will eventually gather here. So maybe what you heard was the intense emotion coming from someone's tears. So, what did the voice say? Huh. If you were hearing their emotions, then Paimon wonders what happened to them. Rather than worrying about them, we should worry about my brother first. Don't let that calm look of his fool you. He tends to get pretty nervous just before a performance. So chatting with Linny might help him relax a little before he goes on stage. Oh, right. That makes sense. Let's go in and see Linny. Traveler and Paimon, good to see you. I knew you two would come. Are you kidding? We wouldn't miss it for the world! We've been looking forward to it! <laughs> I can tell, judging by how early you've arrived. But you're actually right on time. The audience still hasn't started entering the venue yet, which means now is the perfect chance for us to take you to the best seats in the house. Wait just a moment. I'll fetch the tickets. The Opera House has assigned seating, so you always have to make reservations. I've already reserved your seats, and here are your tickets. Ooh, front row seats! Thanks, Linny! Don't mention it. There's no need to keep thanking me. Hey, Lenny! Could you come over here and take a look at this? Oh, I'll be right there. Seems there's an issue with the stage props over there. That's Cal, my assistant, calling me. I'll go lend him a hand. Yeah, we'll just go to our seats. You go ahead, Lenny.
<laughs> hey, Traveler! Maybe we should strike up a conversation with the person next to us. Since we're sitting together and the rest of the place is practically empty still, it's kind of awkward if we don't say anything. <laughs> Excuse me, I did not realize you felt awkward. I am terribly sorry. I would be perfectly happy to chat with you if that is what you would like. Oh, uh, so you heard all of that, did ya? <laughs> Boy, you sure have good ears. Paimon thought she was keeping her voice down. Uh, wait, that's not it, Paimon. Sorry, um, Paimon's the one who was being rude, talking under her breath like that. Uh, so, let's talk, but, uh, what should we talk about? Uh, oh, Paimon's got it. You're also here early and sitting in the front. Are you a friend of Linny's, too? A friend, you say? Well, if Mr. Linny would like to be my friend, I would be more than happy to reciprocate. Oh, so you're not friends with Linny, then? Oh, this is getting more awkward by the second. <laughs> ah, uh, Paimon nearly forgot to make her introduction. Nice to meet you. Paimon is Paimon, and this is the Traveler. We just arrived in Vaudain. It is an honor to meet you two. I have heard of your deeds across Tevat. And as required by proper etiquette, I will also introduce myself. I am... Oh, Monsieur Nervillette, what an honor it is to have you here to see my show. Ah, Mr. Linney, I should say it is in fact an honor for me to see your performance in person. Oh, wait, Nervillette? Could he be... Hmm? I saw you all chatting just now, but it seems you still don't know who Monsieur Nervillette is. Allow me to introduce you to Fontaine's Chief Justice. That seat is always reserved for him. It wouldn't be too much to say that he's the symbol of justice and honesty here in Fontaine. Ooh! Uh, sorry for being so rude just now. Paimon had no idea you were such an important person. No offense taken. Being Chief Justice is merely what I do for work. Nearly every person has their usual reserved seat, so... I'm not so special, really. And by the way, I should probably let you know, even though I would prefer not to. There's someone sitting up there in the VIP seats that has been striking a pose for quite a while now. I believe she is trying to give you a most elegant and impressive first impression. So I think you should take notice of her sooner rather than later, otherwise she may become... flustered. <laughs> huh? Oh, it's Farina, the Hydro Archon. Huh. She sure has a smug and satisfied look on her face. Guess she has no idea that you saw right through her act. Very good. That is for the best. No need to pay her any more attention. We may now enjoy the show. Huh? So is this what things are like between the Chief Justice and the Hydro Archon? All right, please wait just a moment longer. I've pretty much finished my preparations, and the performance will start as soon as the audience has made their way to their seats. Yay! The show is finally about to start! Ooh, Paimon can hardly wait! Paimon's never seen a real live magic show before! Oh, they're dimming the lights! The show must be starting! Sorry, Paimon will try to stay quiet. <laughs> Welcome, one and all, to the Opera Epicles. I am the star of today's show, Linny. And over here is my sister, Lynette, who will be working as my wonderful assistant. Please, let's give her a warm welcome. Hello, everyone. 
<laughs> I know she may seem to be a little sleepy right now, but that's just a sign that she's nervous. Whatever. Now, some of you may be thinking, two vision holders who can freely manipulate elemental powers performing magic is not true magic at all. So, I would like to take a moment to assure you that elemental powers will have nothing to do with what you will witness on the stage today. Both Lynette and myself have removed our visions for the show. That way, even the gods won't be able to help us. Oh, good point. That's what makes the show real magic. Now, without further ado, let the show begin. Lynette will now exit the stage to make some preparations. I know you might miss her, but don't worry. She'll be coming right back on stage momentarily. Perhaps in an unexpected way. I'm sure she'll be stealing the spotlight soon enough. Oh, and before I forget, there's one more thing I should say. You never know what can happen in the blink of an eye. A magician's greatest skill is making things disappear or appear. The possibilities are endless. <laughs> but this isn't what you came for. These little tricks, you've seen them all before. So it's time for something truly extraordinary, don't you think? This one's a little tricky. Using this water tank, I shall make my sister vanish completely, right before your very eyes. <sighs> it's actually quite simple. She'll just turn into air bubbles and float right out of the top. I told them to check all the props carefully. With the lid on, even air can't escape. An amateur magician would be getting very nervous right around now. <laughs> Luckily, it's me on stage, so let me show you what a true virtuoso can do. Lynette, are you still there? Don't go too far. We don't want to use up all our magic. Hi, I'm back. Uh huh. If we could see easily through his tricks, then that would mean that his skills are still lacking. To appreciate magic, you should focus on the show happening on stage, rather than getting caught up in trying to see that which has been intentionally hidden. Ah, guess you're right. Paimon couldn't believe her eyes when Lynette reappeared. Amazing! Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad you enjoyed that performance. But our magical journey has only just begun. I've prepared even more astonishing surprises for everyone here. The magic of transformation and disappearance can go far beyond what you've just seen. 
I'm sure many of you are thinking that escaping the water tank was impressive enough. But Lynette is still my assistant, after all. In which case, I have ample time to make all necessary preparations. So, for my next trick, I will require the participation of one lucky audience member. Please, if my assistants could bring out the magical boxes now... There are two boxes, and only two boxes. One is here, and one is there in the aisle among the audience. I'm sure many of our clever audience members have already guessed our next magic trick. <laughs> a swap! Our lucky audience member and I will each enter a magic box. After one minute, we will each emerge from the opposite box. Now please, everyone pay very close attention to the box you see here. Don't give me any chance to make a move. Wow! How's he gonna do this? Hey, do you think this is all magic tricks, or does Lenny have actual superpowers? The lucky audience member will be generated by this random number selector. It selects numbers entirely at random. Even I don't know who will be chosen to participate. Now then, let's begin. Oh, uh, let me see... Oh, row 7, seat 3! Congratulations! You now have the chance to experience magic firsthand for an entire minute. Please, come forward. My assistant will take you beside the magic box. I'm sorry, it might be a little cramped inside, but no need to feel nervous. We've carefully arranged everything for you to be as comfortable as possible. You don't need to do anything, but no matter what strange things may happen, don't come out of the box. If the magic is interrupted, who knows where you might end up. You might even find yourself in the Fortress of Meripede. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right. Before I enter the magic box, there is one more thing I need to ask the audience to do. Could you all give me a countdown? Like this. 60, 59, 58. Just keep counting down. You can go a little faster or slower if you like. I won't be able to see anything in the pitch black box, so I'll be relying on your voices to know when time is up. Oh, and no tricks now. If you quickly count from 60 in just 30 seconds, then I'll be in a tough spot. Ooh! Paimon kinda wants to count faster after hearing him say that! <laughs> no, no, that won't do. I can see it in your eyes. You still can't be trusted. Let's practice together. Come on, repeat after me. 60, 59, 58. 60, 59, 58! That's right, perfect. Keep it going. All right, I'll see you all on the other side once you've finished counting. I am counting in my head. I think things are exciting enough in here as it is. Merely a consequence of my identity and personality. Do not worry about me. Just enjoy the show. Oh! Alright! You look so serious that Paimon thought you might be feeling uncomfortable or something. 40! 39! 38! Mr. Linny, are you all right in there? Is everything ready? Yes, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm just double-checking the direction of the magic. It would be a disaster if we get sent to the wrong places. For example, mid-air right above the audience. Even though he's saying that, Lenny doesn't seem nervous at all. Sure. Anyway, it doesn't seem like anyone's worried about it. 25! 24! 23! What's wrong, Mr. Linny? I can still hear you moving in there. I seem to have accidentally knocked over a decoration. 
I'm trying to fix it, but it's pitch black in here. I can't tell left from right. Never mind the decorations. There's no time for that. The show is what's important. No, that's unacceptable. I want my show to be perfect. Don't worry, we still have 20 seconds. Hear them counting? 19, 18, 17! Uh, it seems things aren't quite going as planned. I apologize, everyone. It feels like you're all starting to count faster, but that's all right. I know it can be tiring to do such a long countdown. Ten seconds and change is still plenty of time. Ten! Almost there now. Eight. Whew, swapping two people is harder work than you might think. Even a master magician like me can't guarantee I'll get it right the first time. <laughs> hey, wait! Is this the back one? I can't tell. They both look the same inside. Huh? Nope, that's not it. I'll try again. Seven! Hey, slow down! Six, Honestly! Five! Four! Three! Uh, whoops! Two, that doesn't count! One, zero! show the girl was still in that box right this performance is over medical staff with me guards secure the scene and detain all the performers seal the exits no one is allowed in or out at this time <laughs> yes that's right if this was just an accident then we must investigate the cause but if this was all part of some scheme then then those accountable will not escape the judgment of the God of Justice! No need to be alarmed, you two. We'll get to the bottom of this soon enough. Unfortunately, the person who is in the magic box has been pronounced dead. His name was Cowell, one of the assistants in Linny's magic troupe. Apparently, the fireworks on stage ignited the ropes that were suspending the water tank, which then caused the tank to fall onto the stage. As of now, we are still not sure why we found Cowl in the box, rather than the guest from the audience. And after an initial search of the area, the guards have confirmed that the girl is nowhere to be found. It appears that this incident was not merely some mishap with the performance. And there are many indications that it is connected with the case of the serial disappearances of young women. Well, uh, the... the serial disappearances case? <gasps> That's the case that Charlotte mentioned before! <laughs> I know... I know the truth. I can see through the whole thing. Really, using such a shallow and obvious mystery as his finale. Did he really underestimate us that badly? I say that our powerful magician, Mr. Linny, is now the prime suspect for the serial disappearances case. Huh? Why me? This whole thing was an accident. Oh, this all occurred during your magic show, did it not? The missing girl disappeared after being chosen, did she not? The deceased is one of your assistants, is he not? Now that I think about it, that whole 
speech about magicians making things disappear was nothing more than a provocation, a bald-faced challenge. That can't be right. How can Lenny do this? He was in the box on the stage the entire time. We can even hear his voice. Besides, before the show, he told us that he would like to catch the criminal behind the disappearances. He could have possibly mean catching himself. Save discussion for a later time, please. Lady Farina, may I assume that your comments just now constitute an accusation against Mr. Linny and his associates, and that you are pressing charges? Huh? I just think that he... Well, I uh, think it might be a little early to talk about formally pressing charges. But what Lady Farina said just now makes perfect sense. Looks like she's gonna personally deliver justice. A kidnapping and murder carried out under the cover of a magic show. Lady Farina said it all. <clears throat> uh, I mean, of course, my dear people. But what excites me even more than the obvious truth before our eyes is the opponent I'll be facing. That's right. I mean you, Traveler. You'll support Linny, won't you? After all, he was the one who helped you the first time we met. <laughs> then there's no problem at all. You know, the Traveler and I already had a duel the first time we met. But with Linny's help, our little duel ended in a draw. <laughs> but draws really are the most boring possible outcome. So, no more draws. Between the two of us, there must be a clear winner and loser. And what better place to hold such a riveting showdown and decide the true victor than here, on the grandest of stages, the Opera Epicles! Huh. It wasn't a draw! She obviously lost last time! I understand. Charges have now been pressed, and as such, a trial is in order. Well, Traveler, seems Lady Farina has set you in her sights. But putting her dramatic rhetoric aside for a moment, I would like to ask you, are you willing to act as Mr. Linney's attorney and defend him in this case? Very well. The trial will be held a day from now in the Opera House. Both sides may investigate the scene to build their cases and search for the truth. Linny and his troop are all potential suspects and shall remain within the Opera House. The audience may begin to leave in an orderly fashion once they have been cleared by the guards. A day isn't that long. Let's see what kind of case this big shot outlander can build in such a short amount of time. <laughs> I'm really quite looking forward to hearing it. Lenny! Sorry about everything that happened just now. Were you frightened? Of course! Who wouldn't be scared after witnessing an accident like that? Yeah, I'm a little shaken up myself. How could this happen? And poor Cal. I know you already claimed that you would defend me, but now it's just us talking. Tell me, do you think I could possibly be the murderer? Good to hear. Thank you so much for trusting me. I'm sure everyone sees me as the biggest suspect at this point. But, if you ask me, the whole thing is mysteries layered upon mysteries, such that all that's left... is confusion. I don't know whether what happened there on the stage was purely an accident or not, and I don't know why poor Cal was in the box. As for how that girl chosen from the audience could suddenly disappear, I'm afraid I don't have any answers either. If someone tampered with my performance, then we need to figure out what they did. Even a skilled and knowledgeable magician like myself couldn't pull all that off in just one minute. Which is precisely why we need to investigate! As this book says, 
The impossible could not have happened. Whatever happened must have been that which is possible. Paima bought them when we were reading at the bookshop in the city earlier. Pretty cool, huh? Don't worry, Paimon used her own savings to buy them. It wasn't from our travel funds. I think they look cute on you, Paimon. You have good taste, Lynette! <laughs> <laughs> That's the right attitude. Feeling depressed isn't going to help me now. I need to get back to my normal self. But with the guards watching our every move, it's going to be especially difficult for Lynette and I to prove our own innocence. Good thing you agreed to be our attorneys. <sighs> Thanks for that. We'll be counting on you. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, just leave it to us. Oh, uh, since we're going to start investigating, Paimon has a question first. Where did Lynette go during the performance? Ah, oh, well, I'm afraid that would involve some of our essential trade secrets as magicians. The secrets behind our magic are past saving, Linny. I suppose you're right. The truth behind our tricks is going to be important evidence that will be weighted during the trial. <sighs> Tis truly a pity. As a magician, our magic show is a work of art. We've poured countless hours and spared no effort in perfecting it. But if revealing our secrets will help you uncover the truth behind what happened, then it will be well worth it. We should go somewhere else if we're going to discuss our magic tricks. We'll go speak with the guards, and in the meantime, you can go investigate the stage and the seating areas. Alright! Let's go have a look while the investigation teams are still here! Detective Paimon is on the case! Hello, officer! How's the investigation going? Ah, uh, I see. You must be the traveler that Lady Farina mentioned. Listen, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'd avoid getting mixed up in this whirlpool of a mess if I were you. Huh? What do you mean? Come with me and you'll see. The deceased is one of Linny's assistants named Cal. Even though he hadn't joined the troop long, he was hardworking and everyone generally liked him. The assistants are usually in charge of setting up and inspecting the props, as well as assisting with the show and keeping the crowd engaged. As you probably saw when you were in the audience, the water tank suddenly fell and smashed the box with cowl inside it. This is the real mystery. We've already searched the scene and were unable to find any traces of the girl. However, if you look carefully, the box was positioned directly under the water tank. The ropes holding the tank were then burned by the pyrotechnics on stage, causing them to snap. All these factors lining up so perfectly makes it hard to see this as a mere accident. If anything, the more logical explanation is that the whole incident was intentionally planned, and Linny is the most likely person to have access to all these areas. But he doesn't have a motive! Are you both good friends of his? Uh, well, you can't say we're good friends, but... We've known each other for a little while. So in just a short time, he was not only able to win your trust, but even convince you to act as his attorneys. I know there's no such thing as magic. The real trick of a magician is holding the audience in the palm of their hand. I've seen a lot of cases, and I can tell you that people are the least reliable kind of evidence. Sorry, I tend to be pretty straightforward. Just know that I'm warning you for your own good. Anyway, you may investigate the scene of the crime yourselves if you're curious. Who knows, maybe you'll be able to come up with some new evidence.
whoever the murderer was, they must have made preparations well beforehand. Why would it be him? Hmm. How strange. Why would it... I see that you're investigating the area. Well, it just so happens that I'm interested too. If you find any new and interesting leads, be sure to share them with me, all right? We don't have too many thoughts yet. <laughs> then why don't I tell you my hypothesis first? The way I see it. And I'll start it with that loud thud. The thud? You mean the sound that happened during the countdown? Yes, exactly. It wasn't terribly loud, but I suspect that most people heard it. It's just that everyone was awaiting the results of Linny's trick with bated breath, so no one paid it much mind. But now that the incident has happened, the thud has become an important clue. Hmm, that makes sense. So, what do you make of it? I'm of the opinion that it may have been the sound of Linny's accomplice. Lynette, perhaps. Jumping atop the water tank, or something like that. And when the pyrotechnics went off, she cut the rope, sending the water tank crashing down. But wasn't the noise we heard too loud for that? Perhaps the balance wasn't right, leading to a particularly rough landing. Oh, well, that's true. Hmm... I suppose... I must reconsider. Hmm... That does remind Paimon, though. What was with that sound? How can it be burned through so quickly by fireworks? Hmm? Why are you suddenly so serious, Traveler? The investigation team has some new findings. Turns out there's an issue with the random number selector after all. See, I told you. What if the machine picked some big guy's seat? You think the murderer would have still made his move then? Sorry to interrupt, but we're helping Linny and Lynette with their side of the investigation. What were you saying about the number selector? There's something wrong with it? You're trying to help them? <laughs> That'll be a tall order. Lenny used the machine to pick a random member of the audience during his performance, right? The lucky girl that later disappeared. 
Well, we thought there might be a serious problem with the machine, so we had it taken away for further inspection. It turns out that the seat number it picked wasn't random at all. The machine picks that same number every time. I'm sure you already know that you have to make a reservation in advance to get a seat, regardless of whether it's a trial or some performance. In other words, Linny knew who would be sitting where from the very beginning. Hmm. That much checks out. Linny reserved our seats for us, too. Bet you see why I was saying it'd be tough to make a case for Linny. Hmm. Even though it's bad for Linny's case, Paimon had better write it down. Hmm. Oh, this location has also been cordoned off because the Magic Troop members are currently considered prime suspects. The investigation team is still collecting evidence. The seats were all booked in advance, so we were able to deduce the missing woman's identity by checking the guest list. Sure, it's not like this is confidential information. We will publish it later anyway when we petition the public to help us find the missing person. Her name is Halsey. She's a painter from Fontaine who's made a bit of a name for herself. Apparently, she wasn't a regular at the Opera House, but she'd been feeling some pressure with her work lately, which made her decide to come see the Magic Show. The Magic Troop members all claim not to know her, and we have looked into her social connections. It seems that she has no personal grievances or conflicts of interest with the suspects. Simply put, she wasn't related to the Magic Troop at all, which matches the features of the previous serial disappearances. Hmm. Were the victims of previous cases also chosen at random? That's how it seems to us, in any case. Apart from the fact that they were all young women of around the same age range, there really weren't any other connections between them. <sighs> okay then. I don't need to be so formal. If you do happen to see the missing girl, Please be sure to contact us. It is of utmost importance that we get to the bottom of these disappearances. for a while now. Huh? You mean us? That's right. If I'm not mistaken, you're also among those who wish to cut down the thorns and pursue the truth. No? And by the looks of it, you're not from Fontaine. Well, you're right on the more about that one, but who are you? Have you never heard of the Spina di Rosula? From mediating disputes and providing protection to solving conundrums, you name it, Spina di Rosula does it. And I, Navia, have the honor of being its renowned president. Though those who play by our rules call me boss. I'm Silver, her attendant. Pleased to meet you. And I'm Melus. Demoiselle's various daily needs and affairs are under my purview. Huh? Boss? Demoiselle? What gives with the names? <clears throat> well, I am the second generation president. Malus and the others are still used to my previous title. My apologies, Demoiselle. Should you prefer, boss, I will endeavor to use that instead. No, no need. You don't have to call me boss. Just Navia is fine. Okay, if you say so. Not that we're members of Spina di Rasula anyway. 
<laughs> All merely trifling details. Never mind. Now, back to the situation at hand. That's right. I've always kept an eye on the serial disappearance cases. My interest stems from a matter back from my father's time. Judging from the look of things, I find Linny an unlikely mastermind. Really? We think so too! That's why we're looking for clues now! But... how did you come to that conclusion? Intuition, naturally. My unparalleled intuition. Farina sure was quick to point the finger at Linny without any decisive evidence whatsoever, wasn't she? But that's not uncommon for her. If you remember, the Justice had to interrupt her and ask if she was pressing charges just to keep her from getting carried away. Anyway, a trial begins the moment someone levels charges. And, of course, there was no way Farina was going to back down in that situation. Sounds more like you just don't trust the Hydro Archon. Well, what's your opinion? I must admit that she can be interesting at times, but liking her doesn't mean that I'll blindly agree with her. Alright, I've answered your question. Now, it's time you answer mine. Wait a minute, did that answer count? Well, I say it does. But don't worry, you won't hear any pointless questions from me. In your opinion, do you think it's right to treat a trial like it's an opera? Um... well? And why would that be? I told you they'd be different. Most astute of you, demoiselle. I too think that the Traveler's response was most excellent. No matter how wonderful the script or how fervent the audience's expectations may be, the trials that go on stage here must be based in fact. And if that can be done, boss, then... All right, that's quite enough, Malus. Anyway... I like your answer. You pass with flying colors. Now, I need to make some preparations, following which our joint investigation shall commence. You two shall be my assistants. Wait! That's when did we become assistants? Mm hmm? Oh, uh, well, I can be the assistant. Sure. Or your companion, if you like. I'm really not that fussy. Hmm. That's more like it. Far be it from me to brag, but I believe that Demoiselle's intuition will be instrumental in uncovering the truth. You wish to save a friend from false accusations, and we wish to unravel the disappearances. In this sense, our goals are aligned. Hmm, you have a point. Huh. You're quite the talker, aren't you, mister? And what about you over there? What do you think? You seem like you've got something on your mind. I have nothing to add. Oh, alrighty then. We'll be making some preparations first. Uh, just be sure to let us know if they start revealing Linnea's tricks. <laughs> Thanks! No one can freely enter or exit the Opera House at the moment. If you wish to leave, you must register your identity with us first. Uh, no! We're not leaving! We're representing Linny and Lynette as attorneys, so we're investigating the case! Were you always guarding this entrance? Yes! After the Chief Justice gave the order, everyone coming in or out must undergo a strict inspection. So, the missing girl couldn't have left from here. At least, not from that point on. I doubt there was much opportunity then, either. How can you be so sure, hmm? Well, 
because I was in charge of security near the entrance at that time. I couldn't see Linny's performance from here, which was quite a shame. Just my luck. But still, I did not abandon my post, and I stayed put no matter how loud the applause was. If someone had so much as even approached the door, I would have noticed it, let alone if they had tried to leave. We Melazines are good at that sort of thing, you know. So, it's safe to say the girl couldn't have left through here. Alright, thank you for your help. This will be useful info. Checked everything of note here at the performance venue. Hmm. Paimon wonders how Lenny's discussion with the guards is going. Let's go see, shall we? Ooh, things are getting interesting, huh? We're about to see how magic is made. Understood. Then I will be going with you. Just so you're aware, I will be monitoring your actions and making notes as necessary. Very good. Thanks for being so agreeable. I'd pull a rose out of my hat as a gift for you if I could. You may spare the pleasantries. I'm just doing my job. You've arrived. Uh, who's this? Me? <laughs> I'm Spina de Rosula's guardian angel. If you've got a problem, I've got the firepower. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little carried away there. Call me Navia. I'm a partner of theirs, and will be helping investigate this whole situation. And these are my companions. Would you mind if they join as well? Hmm? Fine by me. Oh, new helpers? I would be most grateful. Well, let's just say we're tagging along. It's not every day you get to see the secrets behind magic performed on such a large scale. <laughs> I appreciate your kind interest. Come with me. We'll be heading below stage. Huh? Below stage? Yes, a world of secrets is hidden beneath this magic box, prepared specifically for this switcheroo trick. But before I reveal everything, you should have a look first. Notice anything strange here? I'm not trying to be dramatic. Remembering the details of a trick will help you understand the methods used to perform it more easily. Huh. Weren't there balloons and other decorations here? Where did all that go? Ah, good eye. That said, you're still far from discovering the answer. Uh, the back? You mean the inside of the door? What's different about it? Paimon didn't notice anything. <laughs> Very good indeed. I thought you might not be able to catch that, given that you were sitting in the first row. The back of this door was patterned. Those patterns are now gone, replaced by a smooth wooden board. So, if you put two and two together, what do you get? <laughs> exactly. All right, let's go. I'll tell you how it works as we head down. Oh, so there was a passageway under the magic box! <laughs> I knew you'd figure out most of it as soon as you saw this place. The two magic boxes are positioned right above the two entrances of the tunnel. See this flatbed trolley? The box with the lucky audience member in it would be shuttled over to the other side using the trolley. This trolley can raise and lower and even rotate, ensuring that the box will face in the right direction. I see. So that's the purpose of the box inside another box. Precisely. The inner box would descend after the audience member was put inside and be moved along the trolley, all while the outer box would remain on stage as if nothing had ever changed. So that's how you did it! 
Once the box was lowered, the trolley would store some energy through this device here, with which it would complete the rest of the steps. The audience member would only be able to feel some slight movements in the dark, and by the time she walked out, she would already be back on stage. Right! You were talking that whole time, and you even came out for a moment near the end! Ah, yes. A phonograph operated by Lynette was used to achieve that effect. My assistant and I had already scripted our conversation beforehand. When the countdown began, I had already gone to the opposite box via a tunnel using that ladder. And what about Lynette? Where was she? I was in the mezzanine space in the back of the box. Oh, interesting! That's how we were able to coordinate Lenny's lines with the assistant. And, by the way, I was the one who walked out of the box at the end. I mean, we are twins. All it takes is a change of clothes and no one can tell who's who. <laughs> and that's my favorite part of this trick. Only Lynette and I can perform it. So that's how it all worked! Wow! Every detail you revealed was more amazing than the last! Lynette would briefly walk out of the box and then go back in, jumping into the tunnel and escaping before the box on the trolley could finish ascending. And then I walk out of the other box in the audience area, and the trick would be complete. The operative word here being would. But as you saw, Cal was in the box, not our audience member. She, on the other hand, mysteriously vanished. We really don't know how that happened. If not for that interlude, this would have been an astonishing trick. I probably never would have figured out how you pulled it off. And yet, to think that someone was able to use this magic trick to commit a crime. Could we have a look around? I think we can come up with some more leads. This is the scene of the crime, so Linny and Lynette are not permitted to stay here. I'll escort them back up. Yes, of course. No need to be so strict now. I won't disappear into thin air, you know. Thanks, everyone. We're counting on you. a prop for a different trick. But why would it have been left here? Whatever it is, let's make a note of it first. Uh, the floor is wet. Please be careful not to slip. Speaking of which... Why would there be water here? Oh! Hi, my nose! It's one of those tricks where you pour water into a jug and then flip the jug over only for the water to disappear? And here's a broken vase! Huh. Did the trolley knock it down while moving? Uh, that can't be. The trolley moves along tracks from start to finish. It couldn't have hit the vase at this distance. Let's note this down too and think about it later. Oh, these are the clothes that the lady chosen from the audience was wearing, right? Her clothes are here, 
but she's nowhere to be found. Right. And do you really need to do that if you're kidnapping them? Ugh, this is so confusing. Paima doesn't want to be a detective anymore. It seems someone could fit through here. Hmm. Huh. Could this have been the suspect's escape route? Hmm, alone, perhaps. But if they had to pull another person with them, the space would be too narrow. But there are no other ways in or out of here! Oh! You're right! Let Paimon write that down! We're just about done investigating down here. Yes, let's head back up. Well, we've ascertained the state of the crime scene. Let's find a place to sort out our findings once Malus returns. It seems to me that there are several things that don't add up here. Apologies for the wait, demoiselle. So, what did the guards say? Did the criminal escape through the vent? They believe the odds of that are very low, since the vent leads to the opera house's basement. The guards have checked the area carefully. No one left through the basement during the performance or after the incident, and no one was found hiding there. So the tunnels become like a secret chamber then! You know, like the kind you usually see in novels! Hmm... The plot thickens. Halsey's disappearance and Cowell's death are both quite inexplicable. <sighs> no wonder Farina was so confident in her accusation. All the current evidence points toward Linny and Lynette. In other words, the charges are very likely to be upheld unless we make some considerable progress. Charges and then trial. So if the charges are upheld, they'll announce a sentence? That's right. This is how a trial goes in the Opera House. During the proceedings, the Chief Justice and the Oratrice will hear statements from both sides. That's right. This is how indemnidium is produced. The statements from both sides, the defenses from attorneys, witness testimonies, and even the audience's emotions will all be projected on the oratrice. To put it simply, it's as if the oratrice has its own will and is a judge in its own right. This also precludes any kind of favoritism on the part of the Chief Justice. And not that this has ever happened anyway. Once both sides have finished speaking, the Chief Justice will make his final decision. This, too, will be used by the Oratrice as a reference. Then, finally, the Oratrice will be consulted by officials. The result it returns is the will of justice itself. Huh? So that machine is the one that actually decides? I'm on that Novelet called the shots. In practice, there is very little difference. Both have always come to the same judgment. Which is why people have great faith in the Chief Justice. Ah, yes, the guards also asked me to convey that none of us will be allowed to leave this place before the trial. Huh? Why? Because we've chosen to act as the twins' proxies. That makes us persons related to the case. 
concerned that we might be colluding with outside parties. Or that we might find outside help to disrupt the case. And even if that were not so, it could prove problematic if we happen to spread key information about the case ahead of time. I'm ready to break out at any time. Whoa, whoa! There's no need for that! Hyman thinks they have a point! That said, are they providing food? Of course. I just hope you don't mind the lack of options. I'm afraid that catering to all tastes is not in the cards, nor is any guarantee of balanced nutrition. In that case, let's just sort out our findings together here. Pity. I was hoping to take you to try some of Fontaine's famous desserts, too. I mean, what better way to properly think through our findings than over some tea and sweets? Huh. Breaking out suddenly doesn't seem like such a bad idea after all. Just kidding, just kidding. Paima will still do her best, even if there are no snacks. Hmm? What do you mean, no snacks? Of course we'll have snacks. If we cannot buy some, then we'll simply make some. Huh? Here? But how? Understood, demoiselle. Everyone, please come with me. Wait, you're carrying a portable stove with you? Yes, I must be prepared to meet the demoiselle's baking needs whenever the fancy strikes her. I have eggs, sugar, and almonds at the ready. <laughs> Good work, you two. Then I'll get to it. Please sit tight for a moment. You'll get to taste my awesome snacks soon enough. These three are quite the interesting group. Even better now. Paimon can't stop drooling. From the way you had these two guys carrying all that stuff around, Paimon thought you'd have them do more during the baking process. But you ended up doing the entire thing by yourself! Beating the egg whites, grinding almonds, everything! I was applauding. And I was giving encouraging smiles. Aren't you worried about getting your fancy dress dirty, beating egg whites, and baking like this? <laughs> well, I don't think it's carved in stone anywhere that fancy ladies can only read books, sip tea, ride horses, and play the piano. I just really enjoy making snacks. Don't underestimate beating egg whites, by the way. It's a real arm workout. You also need to beat them to just the right consistency, or your macarons will crack. Anyway... Give these a try, fresh out of the oven. There's three for each of us. Only three? Well, eating too many sweet treats might send all that sugar to your head. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to think clearly about the case on a sugar rush, would you? Tea is ready to be served as well. This is Demoiselle's favorite, strong black tea with a floral fragrance that clears the mind and lifts the spirit. No need for concern. I'm merely doing as I should. All right, then. <clears throat> Down to business. As Paimon mentioned previously, the tunnel seems to be something of a secret chamber. However, we can assume that Linny and Lynette were not alone within it. Some criminal also occupied its sealed confines. The magician twins could have committed the crimes, of course, but they lack any logical motive. Exactly! Why would they do such a thing right when everyone was watching? The flower vase and the thud we heard during the performance could indicate some altercation between Halsey and the criminal in the tunnel, resulting in the shattering of the vase, the discarding of her clothes, and her abduction. Perhaps the criminal thought that since she was chosen from the crowd, she would be too easy to identify if she was still wearing the same clothes. Paimon thinks that makes sense, but the real trouble is... <sighs> True. 
None of the clues we've found thus far support the existence of this third person. But the only people left to consider are both technically victims. Whether it's the missing girl, Halsey, or poor Cowl. Huh. Could Halsey have secretly made modifications to the magic props in order to murder Cowl before making her escape? Uh, that's right. And even if she had tampered with the setup, she would need to understand the entire trick to pull it off. Nor does she have any motive. The guards said that she has never had any dealings with the magic troops' members. <sighs> Were we not thorough enough in our search? From the sound of things, this is turning into an impossible case. Your macarons are amazing though, Navia. They smell great! They're nice and crisp and super sweet! <laughs> they are my specialty after all. And I see you've already had five of them. <laughs> what? Five? Oh, that can't be right! Five are only counting three! Honest! Please don't worry about it. At my age, a few less sweets might actually be a good thing. Uh, no, no! Being greedy is one thing, but Paimon knows how to count! Besides, Paimon knows that if she ate too many, then others wouldn't have enough! Wait! Even you don't believe Paimon?! Oh, how could you?! If Paimon ate those two extra macarons, then may they turn into stone in her stomach! <laughs> All right, we get it. Well, I suppose one of us might have gotten too engrossed in our chat and eaten them by mistake. No big deal. Belus, set up the stove again, if you would. Huh? What are you doing? Making sure everyone gets three macarons, of course. Exactly. We don't want to trouble you. As you wish, demoiselle. And I have the egg, sugar, and almonds. Time. I'm going to have another look around the area. I don't know what we're looking for yet, but we've still got some time. As attorneys, I suggest the two of you think the case over again. It would be awkward if you got all tongue-tied on stage during the trial. Alright, thanks for your help, and for the snacks! <laughs> it was nothing. A small task for the Spina di Rosula. Silver, Malus, it's time to go. I'll be back if I find anything new. All right, it's time to put our heads together. We've got to get our defense ready for the trial. Oh, it's probably going to be a long and difficult case. <laughs> There's no point in worrying about that now. We just need to prepare. Review the situation. Another. Uh, just relax. Even if everyone else suspects Lenny and Lynette, at least we will be supporting them from the stands. Besides, I doubt Farina understands any more about what happened than we do. <laughs> Thanks, Navia. Well, we'll be going then. Best of luck to you.
Ah, finally, you're back. Well, how did your investigation go? To be honest, you might be disappointed. No, no. We're already very grateful that you were willing to help. Well, now, don't you all look disappointed. Don't tell me that your investigation came up empty-handed. That was to be expected, of course. The guilty can never produce proof of their innocence. But don't let that stop you. I shall be terribly disappointed should you, my most anticipated foe, concede so easily. Since both parties are present, I declare that the trial regarding the magic show incident is now in session. Firstly, in order for the audience to understand the causes and results of the incident, could we please have Mr. Linney explain the trick? Yes, of course. I will explain while Lynette demonstrates on stage. All the necessary items have been prepared. Thank you, Mr. Linney. In that case, I take your statement to be that you ran to and remained hidden within the magic box in the audience stands once the trick began, and thus could not have committed the crime. Is this correct? Yes, that's correct, Your Honor. In that case, I call upon the prosecution, Lady Farina. Do you wish to refute his statement in any way? Why, of course I do. Allow me to take the first shot and break this case wide open. Mr. Lenny is clearly lying. There is no way you could have been in the box the whole time if you were to abduct Halsey and murder Cowell. In fact, I'd say you were hardly in that tunnel at all. That is simply your hypothesis based on the presumption that I'm guilty. Oh, is that so? And if I may ask, what did you hear while you were inside your box? The roaring countdown of the crowd, of course. That's how I kept track of the time and built anticipation for the finale. And you didn't hear anything else at all? Nothing that might leave an impression of any kind? No, nothing. I see. But when the count reached 30 seconds or so, there was a thud. One so loud that I believe practically everyone heard it. Huh? Hey, hang on. Something's not right here. Yeah, I'm sure he could have heard a noise that loud from inside the box. I was right by the box and I definitely heard the thud. Look at those scales! Could those mean... <laughs> well then, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to use the words of the magician himself. You never know what can happen in the blink of an eye. Indeed, it seems his alibi can also collapse in the blink of an eye. <laughs> of course, I have armed myself to do far more than smash your alibi. Confidence cannot go unfounded, and my foundations are rock solid. Tell me, aren't you and Lynette actually from the House of the Hearth? The House of the Hearth? No wonder they did something like this. So the serial disappearances were the Fatui's doing. Now it all makes sense. I've got a feeling that what happened on stage probably wasn't just an accident. That's irrelevant. Our identities have nothing to do with what happened. Indeed. Then perhaps you could tell us everything that happened during that one minute. Your first priority is to prove yourself innocent, after all. I'm sure there is little that needs to be kept secret now. Unless your script already has holes in it. <sighs> the Outlander is speechless. My, oh my, don't they look flabbergasted. <laughs> now comes the infighting in Discord, I suppose. 
This was almost too easy. Oh, good thing I made all those preparations. Seems the all-nighter I pulled last night is really paying off. <laughs> hey, Linny! Why didn't you tell us this before? Order! Order! Mr. Linny, allow me to re-establish the facts. Lady Farina has raised two points. First, when the thud was heard in the Opera House, you were neither in the box nor the tunnel. Second, you and Ms. Lynette are both members of the House of the Hearth. Are these claims true? Please answer my question, Mr. Linney. I'm sorry. Yes, they're true, Your Honor. I knew it! Well, that's it. We might as well move on to the sentencing already. What should we do now? Granted. In that case, what is your request? Is that really necessary? They're already as good as guilty. The defendant deceived their own attorneys. What is there left to discuss? Order! Order, I say! Your request is reasonable, and we shall adjourn. This trial will reconvene in one hour. <laughs> so you would stick to Mr. Linney's defense even after knowing what you do now? You certainly have more professionalism than I thought. In that case, my dear audience, let's allow the joy of victory to steep for a little while longer. <laughs> Well, this is awkward. I didn't think the Hydro Archon would dig all that up. I'm sorry, Traveler and Paimon. Yeah, sorry. Ugh. Paimon just knew where to start. We trusted you two. We based our entire reasoning on the assumption that you weren't bad guys. Not to set the wrong tone or anything, but Paimon's really mad! I'm very sorry. I know you're angry, and reasonably so, but please, let me explain. I know you've clashed with the Vatui several times before. I wouldn't be surprised if just hearing the word is enough to make you upset. But our organization is very, very large, and the Harbingers have very different personalities and goals. Right now, we want to save people as many as we can. That's right. I'm sure we're on the same page when it comes to this nation and the disaster that its people might face. I knew if it weren't for our respective identities, we could become good friends. That's why I didn't wish to flat out lie to you, but chose to hide some details instead. The truth is very important, but being completely transparent about everything would see us spending more effort than we need to. Right. So, you be the judge. Heck, if I were you, I fear that I'd even struggle to trust me at this point. You met a Fatus who works as a magician, a trickster by trade. All by coincidence, too. But still, I'm asking you to trust me. I am no criminal. At least, not in this case. Sorry. Please forgive us. You both say that, but... Right, let's hear your answer first, and no lies now! Of course, I'll answer any question you ask. 
We've been trying to find out how the Oratrice operates. We want to know why it has a consciousness. Why can it deliver sentences accurately? During our investigations, we learned that the machine's core is beneath it. From that moment on, Lynette and I have been designing this box swap trick with the objective of getting close to the core. Is that why you needed a whole minute? That's right. In truth, the audience would take about 75 seconds to count down from 60, while I would only need 15 to get to the opposite box. So, after jumping into the tunnel, I accessed the Opera House basement via the vent, and went to investigate the room in which the core is stored. That air vent was created during the construction of the tunnel specifically to execute this step. Well, nothing. As soon as I reached that room and was about to investigate, I heard someone's voice. Which should have been impossible, of course. I was quite certain that I was the only one in the room. That voice seemed to recognize me and tried to speak to me. I chose to err on the side of caution and retreated the way I came. On the way back, I saw the broken vase and the clothes on the ground, but the countdown was almost finished, so there wasn't time to give it any thought. After that, the homicide occurred just as you saw. Well, that explains why you didn't hear the thud. Because of that prophecy I told you about, of course. We must know all we can about this nation's secrets in order to deal with that prophesized crisis. That's the only way we can save everyone. So, there you have it. The whole truth. I swear, I didn't hide anything from you this time. It was never my wish to proceed under this cloud of mistrust either. But, like I said earlier, you can be the judge. If you want to leave because you don't trust the Fatui, there's nothing I can do to stop you. Well, Traveler, you decide. Paimon will follow your lead however you choose. Okay, thank you. Thanks for giving us a chance. The current problem is that the scales are tipped pretty badly against you two. If we want to refute the Hydro Archon's accusations, we're gonna need a seriously watertight defense! Huh? Hmm... Oh, Paimon thinks she gets what you mean! Both parties have returned to their positions. Let us continue the trial. When last we left off, Mr. Linney acknowledged the new evidence presented by Lady Farina as fact. Therefore, Lady Farina may continue stating her reconstruction of the events. Ugh, that took long enough. Now then, if everyone would lend me their attention. At this stage, let's revisit that scene from Linney's perspective. Down began, he entered the tunnel. When the flatbed trolley passed, he opened the box and got into an altercation with Halsey, which caused the loud thud. He did not realize that this sound could be heard by everyone in the Opera House, which is why he claimed earlier that he could not hear the sound. Finally, he used the vase to knock her out before making her change clothes to prevent others from recognizing her. At this time, Cowell arrived in the tunnel, having heard that strange noise, and caught Linny red-handed. 
So Linny proceeded to knock him out too before stuffing him into that box. Afterward, Linny passed the unconscious Halsey to his accomplice through the magic box in the audience stands before operating the devices such that Cal's death would be ruled an accident. And there you have it. That's the truth behind what happened. Does the defendant's side have any objections to Lady Farina's description of the events? The key to refuting Lady Farina is the order of events, what Linny experienced, and what he saw. According to Linny, he left via the vent after entering the tunnel. He couldn't have had that altercation with Halsey. Hmm, seems this won't produce. Linny went to the room that contains the Oratrice's core. This is the actual truth. Linny did not take part in the underground altercation. He only witnessed traces of the aftermath. into the tunnel. But he immediately used a vent to access the Opera House basement, which is where the underground core of the Oratrice is stored. Once he reached that area, he heard a voice in what should have been an empty room. Since he felt something was amiss, he returned immediately. The crime scene had already developed by the time he reached the tunnel again. And in order to complete the magic trick, he did not remain there for any length of time. Finally, he reached the surface, and that was when the accident happened from his point of view. Therefore, he's innocent! Oh, 
They have a point. <laughs> that's right, you tell them! And that's why they're partners of mine. They've managed to turn things around. Oh, well, your denial is very strident. I'll give you that. But what proof do you have to back your claims? <laughs> of course I do. If he had been in the magic box the whole time, how could he have not heard that sound? Why do you ask? <laughs> You're saying that he wasn't? The deceased's name is Cowell, Linny's assistant. He would have been able to tamper with the equipment. Halsey is the missing person and an ordinary audience member. Or did she have her own scheme all along? Could there have been a third person involved? Is that really a possibility? Halsey is the missing person and an ordinary up. The deceased's name is Cowell. must do next is recreate the truth, what Cowell did, and how he went from would-be perpetrator to victim. <laughs> Linny was not in the tunnel at that moment, which gave our criminal ample time. It would have been tough for both people to fit into that vent. They would likely have bumped into Linny as well. The sound we heard may have come from a clash between the missing Halsey and the criminal. Halsey's clothing was in the tunnel, so there must have been some fear that she would attract attention. The deceased's name is Cowell, Linny's assistant. No one entered or left the opera house through its entrances, so where would the criminal have wanted to take Halsey? The deceased's name is Cow.
The sound we heard may have come from a clash between them. Halsey's clothing was in the tunnel. No one entered or left. Linny was not in the tunnel at that moment. The deceased's name is Cowell. Halsey's clothing was in the tunnel. It would have been tough for both people to fit into that vent. They would likely have bumped into Linny as well. you had something to show for it, but it seems you're still far from the truth. Look, since we're at a dead end, why not consider a different track? Just like the trick as it transpired, the end result must have been utterly different from the magician's initial design. If only we knew how Halsey disappeared. Well, that would be nice, but the tunnel only has three exits, and none of them seem very likely. trick where you can just make a real live person disappear. You know, like you did from that water tank, Lynette. <laughs> Excuse my interruption, dear opponents, but do you not see that the crowd is growing impatient? There is no greater sin in this opera house than an awkward delay in the performance. If the defense is unable to make further effective arguments, we will move on to the next stage of the trial. Lenny was not in the tunnel at that moment, which gave our criminal ample time. The sound we heard may have come from a clash between the missing Halsey and the criminal. The deceased's name is Cowell, Lenny's assistant. He would have been able to tamper with the equipment. No one entered or left the Opera House through. The vase was not broken by chance. It was used to cover important evidence. The water! Oh! Paimon gets it! It all comes together if Halsey disappeared instead of being kidnapped! Lynette escaped from the water tank, vanishing gradually and leaving only clothes behind. If there's a similar method where a person could be transformed into water... <laughs> oh, just a moment, please. I do hope you know how preposterous you sound at the moment. How could a person ever be transformed into water? This is reality we're talking about here, not some magic trick. <sighs> Must we really? I should think that of anyone, your friend Linny already knows this truth very well. Magic tricks are ultimately just illusions and misdirection. But Halsey's disappearance is very real. We're talking about two completely different things! Even so, I trust the Traveler's judgment. The truth must be out there somewhere. 
Perhaps some new line of reasoning may open if we try to gather all the focal points that don't make sense. Since Cal was the deceased, we haven't placed much attention on him. But given that we aren't making much progress with the case, it wouldn't hurt to have a look at his belongings, would it? <sighs> People really do come up with all sorts of harebrained schemes when at the end of their rope. The way I see it, your suggestion that we broaden the scope of our investigation is nothing but a tactic for stalling the trial. Nevertheless, I believe that this is a reasonable request on the part of an attorney. Since the trial does indeed appear to be at an impasse, I believe that additional evidence may help us make more progress. Guards, please step into the lounge and examine the personal effects of the deceased Cowell. We are still examining the items, but we have already made critical progress that we feel must be shared with everyone post-haste. We discovered several test tubes of fluid within Cowell's baggage, each labeled separately. The notebook in his backpack claims that these fluids are... water from the Primordial Sea. The Primordial Sea? The note's contents also indicate that Cowell belonged to an organization that sells illegal drugs and that he had an accomplice. The notebook has many entries concerning safe usage of these fluids, in which the keyword dissolve appears many times. One of these tubes was labeled Opera Epicles, along with yesterday's date. It is empty. The notes also state that these dissolution properties work exclusively on people from Fontaine. It's likely that Halsey was chosen as some sort of test subject. As such, we believe that the defense's hypothesis is, in fact, supported by sufficient evidence. You've got to be kidding! People dissolving into water? Could something so ridiculous actually be true? Wait a moment. This reminds me of a certain prophecy, but it's just a coincidence, isn't it? Huh. If people can become water, does that mean that the water tank's real use was as a means to hide water stains? And if Cowell was targeting that girl... Wait just a minute. Could that mean... You two, with me, quick! Demoiselle, wait! What about your partners? Mm, let's go. Just trust me. Order! Order! <laughs> it is undeniable that further examination of the deceased's personal effects has yielded some surprising results. But we cannot yet verify the veracity of these clues. Still, let us assume that these clues are indeed authentic albeit with the understanding that Ms. Halsey has yet to be found. Guards, please continue examining the items along these lines. Mr. Linney, it appears your hypothesis is supported by the evidence, so please continue speaking. Of course. Thank you, Your Honor. If we uphold this hypothesis, I believe that many of this case's seemingly unrelated clues can be connected together. Right! Like the metal hook! That one didn't make sense at all! Hmm. Let's think about this! Cowell's methods must have something to do with that water from the Primordial Sea. The rope that held the water tank up was lit by the fireworks and snapped. As such, the focus here is on the water and not the tank. The deceased's name is Cowell, Linny's assistant. Now it seems like the hook rope was not meant for another magic trick, but was instead some form of triggering mechanism. The water from the Primordial Sea should already have been prepped before Halsey entered the magic box. Lynette was in the magic box on stage the entire time. Did she have something to do with this? I remember there was something else within the inner layer of that box. Now it seems like the hook rope... The water from the primordial... Th 
the rope that held the water tank. The deceased's name is Ka- Lynette was in the magic box on stage. I remember there was something- Unexpected in the tunnel, and wound up being fatally hit by the same water tank he meant to use to cover his tracks. Huh, that does make sense. That actually links together a lot of the more confusing pieces of evidence. <sighs> oh dear, what do I do? Even I think they sound convincing now. Have I falsely accused an innocent person? <sighs> what a humiliation. Now, it seems like the only point of contention remaining is the exact circumstances that led to Cal's death. His notes mentioned he had an accomplice who could be related to the situation. On that note, the guards have just contacted me indicating that they uncovered new evidence. I shall now invite him on stage to share it with us. Thank you, Your Honor. We were just inspecting the luggage of the other people involved in this case. And we found an identical sample of the water from the Primordial Sea among Linny's personal effects. What? That can't be. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, how wonderfully comedic to have your own counterattack only to come back and wound you. <laughs> Does this not clear all doubt? My dear citizens, my loyal audience, allow me to present my reasoning and bring this performance to a swift close. Linny did not need to take part in the dissolution of the young woman at all. Indeed, he did leave the scene via the vent. Having made modifications to the props beforehand, his accomplice Cowl then caused Halsey to vanish using the water from the Primordial Sea. But upon his return, in cruel avarice, Linny desired sole credit and prepared to do away with his partner in crime. Ultimately, he knocked Cowell out, and the tool meant to cover the crime up also became a murder weapon. Now, as much as I regret having come to such a viciously straightforward conclusion, it does seem that the famed Fatui is quite the cold-blooded and ruthless organization. Am I right, Mr. Linny? We've used up all the evidence we collected. There's no way for us to make a rebuttal here. Is this the end of the road? Oh no! Mm, Paimon can't think of anything either! It doesn't look like there's any way around this! Uh, seems using the water as new evidence was too good a move. I think we've all seen enough now, and we have ample witnesses to my flawless reasoning. I believe this is indeed the finale! No, 
Now then, my good, noble Chief Justice, should we not, in your view, move... Huh? Excuse me, everyone, but I must interject! Miss, I must ask you not to shout, and to respect the ongoing legal proceedings. Oh, come on, don't be hasty. I have a good reason for interrupting, you know. Now, would anyone here like to take a little break from all this debate, and see a little magic? I'll show you an amazing trick, one that can bring a young woman who has disappeared back in the flesh, right before your very eyes. Please, do the honors, Mr. Linny, if you would be so kind. What, what in the world is she saying? No offense, miss, but miracles like that are beyond my scope as a magician. Come on now, don't be silly. Magic is all about misdirection, isn't it? It often conceals the truth while presenting a fascinating illusion. But once everyone believes the illusion, can't magic reveal the truth to them once again? And wouldn't such a trick be the most marvelous finale to today's performance? Come on, Lenny and Lynette, give it another go! Don't worry, Spina di Rasula has made the necessary arrangements on your behalf. But, as the magic makers and stars of the show, I think I should leave the final performance to you. I understand. Voila! Um, uh, sorry for the interruption. Wait, isn't that Halsey? So, the whole thing about people dissolving wasn't true after all? To be clear, I'm only here because this person told me that if I testified, the merit of doing so would lessen my sentence. I was hiding outside this room listening to the proceedings because I was afraid that I would be the one put on trial. I was just feeling happy that no one had noticed me, and then before I knew it, she caught me. <laughs> That'll teach you to underestimate us three. Where should I begin? <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm the one who killed Cowl. I admit it. But, what Why? Firstly, my name isn't Halsey. It's Lillian, and I'm originally from Mondstadt. I heard that Linny's show was gonna be a real thriller, but I missed the chance to buy a ticket, so I stole one. That's how I make a living. I steal stuff here and there. And I'd never been caught before. But I was noticed at the harbor a few days ago, and I barely got away. Lenny was the one who caught me in the act. Hey! No wonder you look familiar! So you were the thief! Lenny even mentioned that you were pretty skilled! Well, and I thought that would have been the end of it, but then the number selector chose me. He even mentioned the Fortress of Meripede. That's a prison, isn't it? So you can imagine how shocked I was. I thought he was on to me for sure. So I played along with the show while looking for an opening to flee, but then I got water poured on me for no reason, and then someone jumped into the tunnel to nap me. I wasn't going to take that lying down, so I knocked him out and stuffed him into the box. <sighs> there was nowhere to run from there, though, so I had to change my clothes and hide in a box containing performance costumes. I slipped out after the first guard arrived at the scene, and continued hiding inside the Opera House. Can a person even hide in there? But I swear, I didn't know that the water tank would fall down. Really, I swear it. Had I known that, I wouldn't have put him in the magic box. I may be a thief, but I'm no killer. Well, that makes everything pretty clear now, doesn't it? This time, we need to tell the entire story from Lillianne's perspective.
Hmm. Seems this won't pro Hmm. The strange sound wasn't from a fight. It was Lillianne's attempt to break out when she was frightened. The flower vase was not broken to cover anything up, but it was smashed during the struggle between Lillianne and Cowell. Lillianne was afraid that she would be recognized if she left, so she changed clothes and hid, biding her time. Just what one might expect of an experienced thief. And it is Detective Paimon time! Having been selected out of the blue, Lillianne panicked. Her panic only intensified after she entered the tunnel and had water poured on her head. So she kicked the door open, producing the thud we all heard. Hearing the commotion, Cowl leapt into the tunnel, only to discover that Lillianne had not dissolved. He did not know that Lillianne was not from Fontaine, but was a thief who made her way in by stealing a ticket. Mistakenly believing that the water from the primordial sea needed time to take effect, he tried to force Lillianne back into the box. The two broke the flower vase during the struggle, but Lillianne came out on top, knocking Cowell out and putting him in the box. With no way of escaping, she changed her clothes and hid in the costume trunk until the performance ended. that she would have to go through guard inspection if she tried to leave afterward. So, she has been trapped in the opera house these last two days. She had already become desperately hungry by the time we were chatting over macarons. So, she swiped two of them right under our noses. Talk about a sneaky thief. At this point, all the events that happened in the tunnel have now come to light. Ah, so that's the whole story. Bravo! Bravo! Now then, Lady Farina, do you wish to speak against the defense's statements? I... Uh, um... Please answer the question, Lady Farina. Also, if I may add, the trial has not yet ended. As such, I request that the prosecution not leave the room before the proceedings have concluded. <sighs> what? Are you reading my mind now? <sighs> no. I have no further arguments. I admit defeat. But really, could you at least have left me with some dignity? Wow. Look at that. She's like a deflated balloon now. If there are no objections, then as the Chief Justice of Fontaine, I shall once again repeat the full sequence of events. The actual perpetrator of the serial disappearances, Cowell, selected his next victim from the audience reservation list. With some modifications to the selector, he could ensure that the pre-selected young woman would be chosen. To cover up any evidence while committing the deed, Cowell thought of allowing the water tank to fall, which would conceal the water left behind after the young woman was dissolved. He also tampered with the rope suspending the water tank, using the fireworks at the end of the performance to cause the tank to drop and hide the watermarks. He poured the water from the primordial sea into a balloon during the preparation of the magic box and stuck it to the box's lid. Finally, he passed the prepared hook on a rope through the gap in the magic box's door when bringing the young woman to said box. When the magic trick officially began, the box containing the woman was lowered into the tunnel, tightening the hook rope and bursting the balloon containing the water. If all had gone to plan, the young woman would be dissolved at this time. However, Lillianne was not from Fontaine and thus fled the box with a loud noise. Realizing that there was trouble, Cowell entered the tunnel and met Lillianne. 
Thinking that the waters had not yet taken effect, he decided to proceed. However, his opponent was more capable than he thought, and he was overcome, knocked unconscious, and placed into the magic box, and thus became his own final victim. Lillianne, according to her own statements, then changed clothes and hid until the performance ended, before hiding in other parts of the opera house. As for Linny, he was in the underground structures within the opera house, and was thus ignorant of these happenings. From this reconstruction of events, we can conclude that Linny, the accused, is in fact innocent. While there is much in Linny and Lillian's conduct that should still be investigated separately, this case, at least, can be handed over to the Oratrice to make the final decision. As such, Linny and Lynette are officially declared not guilty. <laughs> Victory for Ace Detective Claiborne! Great work, partners. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Next, I think we deserve an explanation, Guard Vaughn. How did you find the water from the Primordial Sea in Linny's baggage? Discovery caused me to make a serious mistake, you know. Or was that not a discovery, but false evidence that you dare to bring before this court? I suspect that the accomplice mentioned in Cowell's notes was not Linny, but you, yes? I... Uh... I'm sure you know what you must do to lessen your sentence. Speak quickly! Unless you want to earn yourself a one-way ticket to Coupon Town. I... I was just following orders. We were supposed to place blame for the serial disappearances onto Linny, and thus cause suspicion to fall on the Fatui. The higher-ups said this was the best opportunity to do so. And now that your plan has fallen through, and the secrets of the water have been revealed, you have become a liability to said higher-ups, yes? Therefore, you would be wise to tell everything you know and seek the protection of the guards. Yes, I'll tell you everything I know. Our boss discovered that the water can cause people to dissolve. It can also be made into a potion, which when extremely diluted, can cause people to experience unforgettable exhilaration. We've been in this business for a while now, and have made decent mora off it. The disappearances were also the boss's idea. I mean, this is the boss we're talking about, the... <gasps> what? And now he can no longer talk. Such ruthlessness. I shouldn't have expected any less of them. An outrageous act. All present, please submit to inspection immediately. Traveler, Paimon, please wait. Lenny. I know you may not want to speak to me right now. Maybe you don't even want to look at me. But still, let me thank you again for defending me to the end, even after you learned that I'm a member of the Fatui. I guess. But regardless, I'd like the opportunity to set things straight. I didn't approach you with any ulterior motives or ill intent. I've spoken to you as myself, just plain Linny, this entire time. As for why I'm a Fatus, it's because the goals of the House of the Hearth align with those of an orphan like me. That's all. That was how Father, who you might know as the Knave, approached recruiting us back then too. The Knave? The one who controls the House of the Hearth? She's your father? 
That's right. And since we're here, I was wondering, would you mind hearing a story? It's about my past. Back when our parents first died, Lynette and I were left wandering the streets. To survive, I took to surreptitiously observing an older street performer who did magic. It took me several days to figure out how he pulled off his amazing tricks. I took my sister through several streets until we found a crowded corner, and we began to perform magic tricks there. To my surprise, we proved to be pretty popular, and we could at least stop worrying about where our next meal would come from for a time. But I didn't want my sister to remain a street rat together with me forever. Before long, an aristocrat came to me and claimed that he wished to take us in after watching my performances. So you went from orphans to nobility just like that? That was how we felt at first, too. As if fate was on our side and we could say goodbye to those painful days. But I gradually discovered that while we were called foster children, he was really after my talent for magic tricks. He would constantly take me to all sorts of banquets to garner attention, which he would then use to expand his social circles. That doesn't seem too bad either. Better than roaming the streets at any rate. <laughs> it took a while for me to realize just how dark his heart really was. After one particular performance at a banquet, I discovered that Lynette was not on the same return vehicle as me. I waited a long time after we returned home, but she did not come back. I went to that noble's bedroom and asked him about her whereabouts. The answer he gave me was, She caught the eye of the most eminent person at the banquet, so I sent her over as a gift. I mean, you'll be able to perform your magic regardless of who your assistant is, yes? Oh no. So he was gonna... <sighs> but wouldn't Fontaine's laws deal with such people? As far as outsiders are concerned, this is a relationship akin to adoption or foster care, and they have their ways of escaping the eye of the law. I managed to ferret out the location of the mansion of that so-called eminent person and hurried through the night. But by the time I leaped over the walls, avoided the guards, and made my way in, all I saw was the moonlit ground covered in blood and the knave standing there in the darkness. So, she'd already taken care of that guy. That's right. She had rescued my sister before she could come to any harm, and had even discovered several girls hidden in a basement, all of them orphans. Father, I mean, the knave, might have seen something in me, and so she made me an offer. The House of the Hearth welcomes you, for your interests align with ours. Here, none will ever betray you. Indeed, betrayal shall never be permitted here. I was hesitant to trust her. I mean, I had just been betrayed by nobles. But she was also quick to destroy the noble who had taken us in at first, giving us back our freedom. Oh, so that's how the two of you joined the House of the Hearth. She has her own plans. She has gained permission from the Sarita to first use the Gnosis' power once she obtains it. She plans to use it to find a way to break the prophecy and save Fontaine. So, she believes in that prophecy too? That's right. The whole House of the Hearth is currently working to combat that crisis. Today's case has also proven that people from Fontaine can indeed dissolve into some sort of water, thus further supporting the prophecy. All of us house members here, Lady Arlecchino herself included, are from Fontaine. We won't give up on defending our homeland. To us orphans, the only connection we have left to this world, apart from our family, is our homeland. So... From small deeds like distributing magic pockets, to huge schemes like stealing a Gnosis, everything is aimed at dealing with that prophecy. It's alright, I understand. The only thing I can do is relate all this to you. 
I just hope you can understand that even as a member of the house, I have never stopped making my own decisions, and that I believe what I'm doing is right. If you should need anything at all in the future, feel free to find me. I will do my best to help you, as plain Linny. Hey there! What was with the disappearing act you pulled right as the trial ended? Were you looking for us, Navia? Well, this whole thing isn't exactly over, is it? I do feel that we're getting closer to solving the serial disappearances case, though. Don't you think so, too? Huh? What's wrong, my dear partner? We're the ones who can crack a case that's been cold for decades now? And given that there's new evidence from the trial, there should be a trail of breadcrumbs for the Hydro Archon's people to follow now, right? Huh. I see. Well, I won't lie. I'm a little shocked to hear that from you. But I suppose you are just travelers who have only arrived in Fontaine after all. Sorry. I might have been too presumptuous. Don't say that, Navia. Ah, oh, and we were having so much fun investigating with you, too. It was like having new waters flowing into a stagnant mire, causing new hope to spring forth and the reflection in the murk to become clearer. Well, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm a bit prone to nostalgia. Don't mind me. Wait, shall we have a farewell meal? You know, to commemorate our time as partners? Huh? Do we really need to get that formal? Uh, well, guess you really did treat us as partners, huh? Well, I just like to have a proper ending to every important memory. That way there are no regrets later. Anyway, it would just be a meal, so it shouldn't take up too much of your time. You don't have to twist Paimon's arm if Boss Navi is treating Kim Paimon in! Oh, wonderful. In that case, why don't we return to the Court of Fontaine and head to the Hotel de Boer? I believe we'll make it just in time for dinner. All right, then. Let's have our farewell meal! I came here several times with my father when I was little, but stopped eating here as often after growing up. I hope the food here will be to your taste. Oh, don't worry! We haven't eaten at a hotel like this in a while! <laughs> Paimon's getting excited already! Oh, in that case, I'll go order for us first. Please wait here a moment. 
Ooh, everything looks so good. People in Fontaine sure know how to enjoy life. Why, of course. Go ahead, try whatever you like. If the food's good, I'll make a group reservation for the rest of Spina di Rosula next time. And if it's not? Well, uh, <laughs> then I'll still bring everyone. Albeit with only one dish per table. Yeah! Sure have your own way of doing things. Oh, we called this a farewell meal, but we could also treat it like a victory feast, right? We did just win that case after all. Oh, true. Very true. In that case, boss, we'll have another two dishes. Huh? Paimon didn't mean that you had to order even more food. <laughs> Speaking of cases, do you think that the mastermind behind the serial disappearances will get caught soon now that this has all happened? Well, we've certainly taken a big step forward, but I feel that's about it. We know that there's an organization that means to dissolve these young women, but we still don't know what they are really after. If it hadn't happened right in front of us, Paimon wouldn't have ever believed that a person could be dissolved like that. <laughs> right? Yet it was because this was such a preposterous notion that the investigation could never really move forward before. Ugh. If only that guy could have finished speaking! We were so close to hearing who was behind it. In such investigations, even the smallest step can seem like a yawning chasm if the trail of clues is cut off. To be honest, I don't have high hopes for any follow-up that the authorities might conduct. It's not that I don't have faith in their ability, it's just that a different perspective is required in some matters. It's easy to guard against and deceive a single, narrow perspective. A shift in thinking is required at such times in order to produce a breakthrough, which is exactly why the Spina di Rosula exists. Those highfalutin folk are not all-knowing. That's why we exist to seep into the cracks where filth falls through, where their watch fails them. That's the kind of problems we solve. Hmm. Seems Paimon thought things were simpler than they actually are. <sighs> it's all right. Well, <laughs> this was supposed to be a farewell meal, so I doubt you have further interest in this business, right? Let's talk about something else. Like, uh, what are your future plans? That's true. We didn't have a chance to speak to her after the trial ended. It didn't really seem like the right time or place to do it anyway. Hmm. I see. So, your primary objective, which has been foiled so far, was to have a chat with the Hydro Archon. I've heard that there's a long line of people waiting to meet Lady Farina. I suspect you'll be waiting for quite a while, considering that you missed your chance today. Yeah. We've heard that she's super popular here in Fontaine, and that it'll be tough getting any of her time. Hmm. Well, would you consider some more, uh, unique ways? Perhaps even methods of, uh, let's say, questionable legality? Guess that's Spina di Rosula's boss for you. Chock full of sketchy ideas. Well, what did you have in mind? Well... One way would be to infiltrate a performance troupe at the Opera House, only to abandon your act at the play's climax and ask to speak to her after the performance. I'm sure Lady Farina would be eager to see the ending, and would agree in order to finish watching the play, don't you think? Uh, could you suggest something a little more practical? This plan seems pretty hard to pull off. We'd have to go learn how to act, and acting's really hard! <sighs> Alright, here's another. Find a way to conceal yourselves under her bed. Then, wake her up in the dead of night and demand answers. Don't let her go back to sleep until she answers all your questions. I can personally testify that this one works. When I'm sleepy, I'll do anything as long as I can finally get some sleep. Uh, that might work, but that's not really the problem. The problem is we don't want to get ourselves arrested. Ah, valid point. I overlooked that part. 
I was just thinking about leveraging a person's desire for sleep. <laughs> all right, all right, no more joking around. Huh, perhaps you could... Oh, I don't know. Cut the line when she's on a break. You did defeat her in court, clearing citizens of hers from false accusations. False accusations she had nearly upheld personally. I imagine that she feels quite ashamed about the whole thing. You mean that if we catch her while she's on a break, she might be too embarrassed to refuse? Oh, that does make some sense. Why don't we give it a try after this meal? You know, strike while the iron is hot and all. Huh? Paimon, did you drink my Fanta? Uh, was this your drink? <laughs> Sorry about that. Paimon wasn't really paying attention and the cup was right next to Paimon. Would you like to order another? No, it's fine. We're just about done here. Alright! Honestly, Paimon wouldn't recommend Fanta anyway. It tastes kind of salty and icky. Is that so? Huh. Well, in that case, we'll have to blacklist the Fanta here then. If we're all finished eating, then I'll go pay. Yeah, we're stuffed. Thanks for the treat, Navia. Oh, so full. Paimon can barely float anymore. Can't you see Paimon's barely an inch off the ground? Hmm, okay. As for expenses this month, we're left with... Huh. Hey, Navia! What are you doing over there? Oh, nothing, nothing. It was just a meal, you know? Nothing the Spina di Rosula can't cover. <laughs> <sighs> Let's get ready to try to meet the Hydro Archon again. Bye, Navia! <sighs> so this is goodbye, huh? Well, if you do encounter any other trouble in Fontaine, you're always welcome to contact the Spina di Rosula. I'll give your requests the highest priority. Uh, in any case, I wish you smooth sailing. I'll see you again, partner. See ya! I fear I do not know. 
My memories feel like they have been washed away like a flood. So many fragments dissolved amidst the tide, never to be recovered. How much have I lost? How many things that I once held dear while on land have I since forgotten? Yes, that is what I was once. But now, I am but the consciousness of one who has lost their form. I do not know how I came to be like this either. I only vaguely remember being covered in light blue water, and then all grew dim. I also remember going to many places. I loved adventure, loved exploring places of peril. No matter where I went, Vache would go with me. I knew how dearly he loved me, and I also loved him equally as much. But now, we can no longer go back. The pain of such parting I never knew how heavy it could be. No, our reunion no longer has any meaning. There is no way for us to create any new memories. The thought of me gives him no succor. So let it lie forgotten beneath the waters. If you meet Vashe, tell him not to look for me. Tell him to move on. That is the only thing I still remember. Perhaps that is so, as I was submerged in the waters, losing consciousness. I saw Vache above the surface. His eyes were filled with such sorrow, such longing. If only I could have comforted him, told him that I did not suffer. Indeed, I had felt a great warmth. Is that what you call it? Dissolving? If anything, I consider it a form of release. It was a state of neither fear nor frenzy, with only an endless peace, like the water still surface. I could also liken it to being a thirsty person who drinks water for the first time, and only then sees how they have lived for so long in a world of endless want and anxiety. I think I hear your companion. It's time for you to go, I think. Farewell, then. I am glad that you were able to sense my presence. Remember, if you see Vache, tell him not to seek me out any longer. Army of Gardamex. Clorand? Quick, now's our chance! <laughs> Ugh. <sighs> 
I should thank you for lending us your sword there, Clorand. But before I do so, could you explain how you managed to show up here? I... followed you. It seemed to me that danger has followed you more closely as of late. I believe that following someone without their knowledge is actually called stalking, is it not? Mr. Callus' last wish was for me to ensure your safety, and I will not betray his trust. He would do the same, were he alive today. Do not speak of my father! Sorry, demoiselle. I was not strong enough. Thank you for your aid, Miss Clorand, but do keep an eye out for your manner of speech. I believe we all wish to avoid unnecessary emotional harm. Sorry, I... did not consider your feelings. Whatever. What else do you know? How did you come to the conclusion that I'd be in grave danger? I doubt I know much more than you. But I believe that the mastermind behind the serial disappearances is very powerful. Your performance tonight will almost certainly attract their attention. Huh. I'm sure they've known about me. To be honest, I'm shocked it's taken them this long to act against me. And what about these Gardamax? I thought only those associated with the Maison Guardianage could control them. None of these mecha have serial numbers. I was sure to check a moment ago. They are not the ones used by the authorities to enforce the law. I can only conclude that some powerful or wealthy party must have obtained them via illegal means, deploying them as a private force of sorts. What? Your point being that they're out of Spina di Rosula's league, then? Yes. Be careful, and do not act rashly. I will continue investigating, no matter what. We will bring the truth to light. That's my father's true last wish. <sighs> Regardless, thank you for your help today, Clarand. But if you get any ideas, tell me first. I don't much appreciate being followed. I do not think that they'll strike again anytime soon. So I shall stop following you. Good day, all. Right. I suppose that's the best news we've gotten today. Demoiselle, I believe that Miss Clorand was being sincere with you. If we tried, we could attempt to thaw relations a little. <sighs> I know, I just... She's... Ugh. Oh, thank goodness! Paimon thought we were done for! Those Gardamex came out of nowhere while you were unconscious, and Nadia and her gang saved us! Oh, and there was that champion duelist named Clorand who came out to save us too! We got lucky there. Paimon probably couldn't have fought them off otherwise. Oh, <laughs> come now. Forget all that polite talk. That wasn't really a farewell meal we had back there. Not for me, anyway. In truth, I hope that every meal we have together shall be a victory feast. As such, we're still partners. There's no need to thank me. It will take... Fifty years for me to match Demoiselle's magnanimity. If it were me, I would have joined the Spina di Rosula on account of her goodwill long ago. <laughs> All right, you two. That's enough. Actually, Navia, how did you know that we were in danger? You sure did show up in the nick of time. Well, to be honest, you're the one who tipped us off, Paimon. Huh? Really? Paimon contributed to that? Ooh, Paimon's even more amazing than she thought! Yes, all thanks to you grabbing my drink by mistake. Uh, how did that help? After we parted ways, I was on the way back to one of our bases, when I suddenly thought of what you said. That the Fanta tasted kind of salty and icky. Fanta only comes in sweet flavors, so how could it have tasted salty? The color of the drink, if I recall, had also been a bit off. So the Fanta had been spiked with water from the Primordial Sea? Yes. So, if you hadn't drunk that cup for me... Spina di Rosula is preparing the grandest of awards for you as we speak for saving the boss. Huh. Really? I 
sent people to Hotel de Boer to investigate. But whoever did this left no trace at all. That's when I figured out that you might be in danger, and hurried here as quickly as I could. But... why would they go after us too? All we did was defend Linny in court and help clear his name! Ugh, oh, now we're caught up in this mess too, aren't we? Well, you did foil a plan that they were probably pretty proud of, and almost got their name in the process. Speaking of which, did anything strange happen when you drank the primordial seawater? Well, it can't be a coincidence that the Traveler fainted just now. He said that he heard that voice calling for Vashe again. Oh, and this time Paimon heard it too! But it was real faint. Does this situation have to do with the primordial seawater then? Does that mean the primordial seawater raises someone's sensitivity to Hydro when it's used on people who are not from Fontaine? That doesn't sound like too much of a bad thing, to be honest. New intel? While you were out cold? Uh, well, let's hear it, shall we? Oh, that is important. Vache, that name doesn't ring a bell. I suppose he hasn't stepped forward as a witness in court lately. Since he saw that young woman dissolve, he was at least at the crime scene. But he never gave testimony or any information regarding people dissolving in the primordial seawater. Could he have been... threatened? Yes, thank you. This is very important information indeed. We will continue to investigate. You mean, you'll help us investigate? Well, you did say that our farewell meal didn't really count. That means we're still partners, right? And besides, we're in this now whether we like it or not. You're not gonna let those people who targeted us get off the hook so easily, are you, Traveler? Demoiselle, do try not to look quite so pleased. You are the face of Spina di Rosula, after all. <laughs> you talk too much. Well, in that case, let's head back to one of our bases, shall we? I'll arrange accommodations for you. We also have some plans to go over, and hopefully we can deepen our bonds as partners. But we'll take that one step at a time, I guess. Don't worry, you two. With us around, our base is definitely secure.
It's right up ahead. But let's make sure we weren't followed first. I've been keeping watch, Demoiselle. I haven't spotted anyone suspicious thus far. Huh. Very good. But let's not let our guard down for now. I shall find rooms for our respected guests. Thank you, Malus. Now, let's continue, Traveler. Imagined. Your accommodations have been arranged. Under the present circumstances, I can confidently say it's the best we have. <laughs> well, our funds have been a little tight lately. After all, we don't allow illegal or unethical profiteering. In fact, our funds often come from citizenry who support us. Seems like it's tough times for everyone. But if you have the support of the people, that does sound like it's worth it. <sighs> to be honest, our financial situation was a lot better back when my father was in charge a few years ago. <sighs> I'm afraid I'm not quite his equal. Your father... He was the previous boss of Spina di Rosula, right? How did he... Uh, Demoiselle, if you'll allow me to explain. Uh, no. I I'll explain it myself. I suppose I couldn't run from this topic forever. And, as partners, this is something I hope they can understand. My father's name is Callus. Yes, the same one they call Callus the Unfaithful in the streets. Three years ago, he was accused of murdering his own friend. But he chose a duel to defend his honor instead of standing trial. He died in the duelist's ring. But I do not believe my father was a murderer. I'm sure he was set up. At the time, I believed that if he only stood trial and was duly investigated, something amiss would crop up and prove his innocence. But strangely, he not only requested the duel himself, but rumor has it that even after being seriously injured, to the point where he could be deemed as having lost the duel, he refused to surrender, determined to die in the arena. <sighs> Three years later, I still don't understand why he did that. How could he protect his honor if he's dead? <laughs> if anything, he gave up his chance to defend himself. The closest piece of info I have is that my father had been investigating the serial disappearances case at the time of his death. Ah, so that's why you're so determined to get to the bottom of that case. That's right. I've also tried to investigate the murder my father was implicated in, but I haven't found a single new clue in my countless reviews of the investigation records. However, I believe that if the murder case is related to those behind the disappearances, they must know something. I must know what really happened. Was my father coerced? Framed? Even if he really did kill his friend, I must get to the truth. <sighs> If only he'd been more open with me when he was still alive. He even hid the fact that my mother died due to complications when giving birth to me. And now, here I am investigating his death. <laughs> you really are a handful, aren't you, Papa? Demoiselle, please. 
If there is anything I can do, anything at all. I also will never believe that Master Callus murdered anyone. There are none whom I respect more than the two of you, demoiselle. Master Callus did so much good in life, yet all it took was one murder case for him to be dubbed Callus the Unfaithful. Even our supporters decreased greatly due to that incident, hence our uh, strained finances at present. Wait! If Callus was such a good man, wouldn't people at least be a little suspicious when he was accused? Uh, no. Perhaps people just revel in that kind of drama. It's not something exclusive to people from Fontaine, really. Everyone's like that. People love watching the evil turn over a new leaf, but they also enjoy watching good people fall into an abyss from one slip-up just as much. But how could... Ugh, never mind. If Callus was really falsely accused, we have to find the truth. He didn't deserve to have that happen to him. And there is one other thing. Master Callus' opponent in the duel was Ms. Corand. Oh, her? Well, then, isn't that as good as saying that she was the one who killed him? Yeah, that's not the sort of thing that you can just let go and move on from. Miss Clorand has always placed great emphasis on the honorable nature of the duel. If her opponent doesn't yield, she will not stop either. She knew Master Callus beforehand and greatly respected him, but seeing how he was resolute in the arena, there was only ever one choice she could have made. It's not that I don't understand her at all, but I... I just can't deal with this yet. Don't worry, Navia. Paimon knows how you feel. You don't have to force yourself to do that. Afterward, Ms. Koran told us that at the start of the duel, Master Callus requested that she ensure Demoiselle Navia's safety. Yes, that is our understanding as well. <sighs> Oh, Papa. What madness drove you to ask the person who killed you to take care of me? All right. Anyway, that's the information I wanted to share with you. Even if it did sound like I was just complaining towards the end. Uh, thanks. You two should go and rest. This was quite a day after all. Yeah! Paimon's beat. Please, relax and get some sleep. We will ensure you rest soundly. them back to Poisson. It's Spina de Rosula's place of origin, and where we have our headquarters. There's not much for them to do here at the moment. Paimon gets the feeling that you're just trying to get them off your back. But never mind that. When did you get back? Were you waiting here the whole time? No, I just returned after going out for a while. I did some investigating yesterday regarding the name Vache. Wait, so you didn't sleep at all? <laughs> How could I after having such critical new evidence appear? Uh, guess Paimon wasn't speaking for everyone just now, huh? Uh, unfortunately, this name seems to have been wiped from existence. It doesn't seem to have a match anywhere. I suspect that those behind this have already taken steps to hinder an investigation from this angle. But... That does prove that this Vache person is a key witness in the incident. Does that mean we're too late, though? No. There is one ray of hope. One place in Fontaine that they would find almost impossible to threaten. No matter how much they wanted to. And that is the archives kept by Chief Justice Nouvellet. A place where detailed files on all the cases in recent years are kept. If the Oceanet you met is one of the young women who went missing recently, we should be able to find some related information there. 
So Nervalette maintains an archive of case files? Whew. Guess that's the hard-working Chief Justice for you. In that case, let's go talk to him, shall we? Um... Hmm? Aren't you coming along, Navia? Did you get tired? Uh, no, it's nothing. Let's go see the Honorable Chief Justice. State your business here. The Chief Justice is presently occupied with official matters. Huh. This place does look pretty heavily guarded. Guess that proves that Nervalette's files are really secure. Hey, don't you recognize us? Huh? Who are you? Just to be clear, <clears throat> I don't care who you are or who you might be related to. Our rules make no exceptions. See? They've got great discipline, too. Yep, yep. Hyman can tell. If you're here just to crack jokes, I can point you towards the exit. Unlike some, we're busy. So please leave if you don't have a reason to be here. Uh, no, no. What I meant to say is, shouldn't you remember us from a few days ago? We were at the trial of the great magician Linny. Oh, oh, yes, I remember. I read about it in the Steambird. You, you must be Linny's attorneys. Uh, it's all coming back to me now. We're here today to report and archive some information on a follow-up case. Huh, is that even a thing? Hmm. Of course. Don't worry. We're here on official business. You can trust us. Well, all right then, I'll let you through. The Chief Justice is just inside. Ah, thanks so much. Please come in. It's all right. Please let me know how I may be of assistance to you. Uh, so you're not mad at us? We're looking for a man called Vache. He may have been an eyewitness in the serial disappearances case. If we can find him, we may be able to unearth some key information on the case. Ah, oh, I see. In that case, please wait here a moment while I browse through the files. That Nervalette would be so easy to talk to. Unfortunately, I'm quite certain that no one by the name of Vache has been involved in any case, criminal or civil, in the past several years. There are no records of him either in the files or in my memory. Traveler, what if it was really just a dream? Is that so? All right then. Thank you so much, Monsieur Neuvillette. We'll take our leave now. Uh, 
him. Miss Navia, I can understand how you feel. Your father, Callus, was a truly exceptional man. We deeply regret his passing. Hmm. And what are you trying to say, Monsieur Novillette? Are you trying to console me? Extend your sympathy? Or just express some tendril of regret? No. You are not trying to do any of that. I can hear it in your voice. There's no emotion behind your words. You only said those things because you felt like you should. It's just like last time. After my father took his place in the duelist ring, I pushed through the guards to talk to you as a last resort. You even told me then that you thought there was something fishy with the case, yet you still allowed the duel to go ahead. In your eyes, the value of a human life is nothing compared to those cold laws you hold so dear. If you truly regret my father's death, then why didn't you call a stop to the duel? Why didn't you give me the power to stop him from throwing his life away? Why did you just let him die, despised and hated by all? Everything was hanging on a thread at that moment. Just the tiniest effort could have changed everything. There are still so many things I never got to tell him. So many questions he still owes me answers to. If you really have no heart, then just look me in the eyes. I, Navia, will show you the true meaning of regret. <sighs> I'm sorry, Miss Navia. You and my father are truly alike. You keep all kinds of things in your heart and never say a word to anyone. It's not so much that you can't feel, but that you would never express anything. Oh well. In any case, everyone already knows full well the apathy of the Chief Justice. My apologies for taking my emotions out on you, Monsieur Chief Justice. Let's go, Traveler and Paimon. Are you okay? I'm fine. Uh, rain. It's raining. You're right. Wasn't it still sunny when we went into the building? And there shouldn't be any active trials today. How strange. Now that I think of it, on the day my father was convicted of murder, it was also raining. What is it? Did you think of something? Yeah, he was outside. It was uncovered and the rain could fall there. Why? Do you think the rain could have affected the crime scene? That thought has occurred to us before. We've even expanded the search area to try to account for that, but didn't find anything of value. Oh? Wait. Uh, you don't mean... So you're saying that the true murderer could have been turned into water and then got washed away with the rain? Yeah, and if that's what had happened, then no one would have believed your dad, even if he explained what he saw to the authorities. I really think I found a true genius for a partner. <laughs> you're completely right. How did I not connect the dots earlier? All right, let's go to Poisson. With this new lead in mind, We'll get to the bottom of my father's case for sure. Yeah, we're gonna make progress for sure this time. Do you want to go with me now? Or do you want to head over by yourself later? Great, let's go then.
ship be anchored at a place like this? <laughs> There's no need to be so surprised. While it may look like a ship, it's actually Spina di Rosula's headquarters. My father was the one who asked for it to be built like this. Perhaps our taste in exterior design is the only thing we occasionally had in common. A gigantic and glamorous ship embodies discovery, opportunity, ambition, and conquest. It symbolizes Spina di Rosula's bright and limitless future. And Paimon thought you were bluffing when you said Spina di Rosula had a glorious past. Paimon was confused why a group with such a history would live in the sewers. But now that Paimon has seen this ship for herself, she's been convinced! Well, Poisson is where Spina di Rosula began, after all. It's our main base, our home. Apologies for the wait, Demoiselle, and our most important partners. You said before that you still had some business at the court. What brings you back to Poisson so quickly? Uh, about that. It's because my partner here reminded me of something really important. You see, what if my father's case had something to do with water from the Primordial Sea? You still remember, right, Belus? On that night, it was raining? Yes, the case was quite similar to that of Mr. Linney's. Both were what you'd call impossible murders. Could you tell us a bit more about what happened before? Yeah, of course. Many years ago, something called synth began to gain popularity in Poisson. At a glance, it was a kind of drink that could excite your mood and produce many pleasant hallucinations. Wait! Didn't that guard guy who turned into water also mention that the primordial water could be used to produce some kind of potion? Yes, he did. Considering what we know now, it's almost certain that synth is created using water from the primordial sea. If you drink synth for an extended amount of time, you'll suffer many side effects, such as losing the ability to focus or control your emotions. And if you were to stop drinking it completely, you'll experience flashes of paranoia and anxiety, while lacking energy to do anything. It's an extremely dangerous substance. As he oversaw Poisson, my father was compelled to put a stop to synth abuse, and called for a complete ban of it. Boss's uncompromising attitude incurred the synth vendor's wrath, but no matter how much they threatened or bribed him, he refused to yield. Not only that, Boss became determined to find the mastermind behind the synth operation, and put an end to the problem once and for all. Yes, but the enemy was very cunning. <laughs> so he could never get anything out of the dealers, all of whom only sold the stuff and weren't privy to the rest of the operation. Recognizing that, my father decided to contact the dealers in secret and cultivate personal relationships with them. Finally, he was able to convince someone to become his informant. The man's name was Jacques, he felt greatly ashamed about his work after seeing many families destroyed by synth abuse. That night, my father hosted a banquet at his countryside estate. He planned to meet up and exchange information with Jacques over some food. But then, we heard two gunshots from the courtyard. We raced to the scene and found my father, still holding a gun, and Jacques, who was already dead on the ground. Aren't they on the same side? Sounds just like Lenny's case, doesn't it? In both cases, the culprit seemed obvious, but neither appeared to have any motive at all. Looking back on it, though, 
I now believe the most important clue was something we all overlooked at the time. There were pieces of clothing left at the scene. Precisely. It's all thanks to you that I made the connection now. Back then, we all just thought they were some costumes that Jacques used to disguise himself at the banquet. But, considering it now, it's almost certain that they belong to a third person at the scene. With one extra person, we'll also need to reconsider why the two shots were fired. You're right. We still don't know what happened. But my intuition tells me that we're on the right track to figuring it all out. <sighs> I'm finally headed towards the truth. Jacques was an empathetic man who was infinitely remorseful for his past actions. It's unlikely that he turned on boss with zero warning. I think this third person is probably the key to the full truth. On that note, however, even though this will not please you, demoiselle, as you're and your father's butler, I must still offer a word of warning. Our opponent is insidious and cruel. They are extremely difficult to deal with, and Boss has already lost his life trying to bring them to justice. Even though Spina de Rosula has lost most of its former glory, Poisson has welcomed a new time of peace, and we have been allowed to live out our lives. There is no need to follow your father's path. It would be both wise and in line with Boss's wishes to step back and give up on the case. If that's indeed what he wished for, then he should have told me that himself. Was I not the closest person to him? And yet, I was the one most kept in the dark. What was the point of him dying without sharing any of the secrets he knew? Did he manage to protect anything in the end? Synth is still here. Callus the Unfaithful is still his epithet. And Spina di Rosula is barely getting by. Nothing has changed. Did he think I'd just accept his meaningless death? and live out my life just as meaninglessly? I've never accepted that, ever. Not since that day, and certainly not now. I want to find out the real answer for everyone's sake. For the missing girls, for the victims, and for myself. Davia. This is indeed the best moment to act. Your partner appears to be quite reliable, and more importantly, Demoiselle, I think you're also ready to take this on. So you do know something else, Malus. Yes, I do. In fact, even before that banquet, Boss already knew of the connection between Synth and the Serial Disappearances case. But what drove all the tensions to the boiling point was the revelation that you, Demoiselle, had been selected as the next target to disappear. What? Boss also didn't tell you that he had been diagnosed with a rare illness. The doctors told him that he had no more than five years left to live, and the serial disappearances case caused him great anxiety. Five years was nowhere near enough time to resolve this long-standing conflict, but once he passed away, all the danger would pass on to you. Knowing all of this, he decided to use one final intimidation tactic before his death. He claimed to have already gotten his hands on some key incriminating evidence for the other side, and even told some members of Spina de Rosula about the details. But as long as you remain safe, he would not share the evidence with the public. If something were to happen to you, then he and all those he told would immediately expose all they knew about Synth and the disappeared victims. Right, so nobody would be able to get off scot-free. As we've seen, Boss's tactic has worked. Even though Boss has been gone for a long time, the other side has not tried to take Demoiselle's life. No, I don't believe it. He never appeared to look sick to me. No father wants their daughter to see them weak and haggard, especially someone as proud as Boss. To him, dying in a duel and suffering lasting dishonor as the unfaithful 
was still far preferable than losing face in front of his daughter. <laughs> so he chose to die in silence, so that he could protect me. I'm afraid you're not understanding this correctly, demoiselle. What boss wanted to hand to you was not a parasol, but a sword. If Boss's spirit could hear you telling me that you want to find the answer for the sake of everyone involved, I'm sure he'd be extremely proud. Uh, that fool. <laughs> Couldn't he have just given it to me straight? No. He might have set up everything precisely because he never thought I'd be able to understand him. Is that the amount of confidence he had in me? And what if I was never able to make it to where I am now? Yeah. I suppose that's true. With the way he'd set things up, if I had wanted, I could have just lived out my life without a care in the world. But thankfully, he rarely talked to me about complex matters, and thus understood little of me as a person. In this case, he really didn't need to give me an easy way out. Huh. Malus. What was the key evidence that he shared with you? It's the location where Synth is produced. Essentially, it's the enemy's headquarters. When he was threatening the enemy, Boss didn't share the specifics of the incriminating evidence he found. But if you want to use it against the enemy, you'll still have to take several things into consideration. Why? If we know where the place is, can't we just go storming in? You mustn't forget that we're fighting against a mysterious and dangerous organization that's been in operation for decades. There's no telling what might be lying in wait at their headquarters. We also have no idea what kind of evidence we may be able to find inside, nor what people we may be able to capture. But a single visit to their headquarters would be tantamount to a formal declaration of war. The worst case would be that we leave empty-handed, but also open ourselves up to full retaliation. Then, in that case, why not work with the Fontaine authorities? Well, you saw one of them dissolve during Mr. Linney's case. We have no idea just how thoroughly they may have been infiltrated. Huh. That's true. Seems my father really had no choice. But things are different now. It should be a lot easier to prove the other side's guilt, now that we've connected Synth with the Disappearances case. You sound like you've put a lot of thought into this, Malouse. I am the butler, after all. I live but to serve the boss and Demoiselle's will. I've always been willing to take on any kind of risk for your sake. But considering my relative lack of ability, I've spent my time keeping secrets, performing basic investigations, and waiting for the right time to come. Thank you for all of that, Malus. Have you discovered anything new in the past few years? Let me think. One conclusion I came to was that the enemy must be quite familiar with Spina di Rosula, or at least have an informant planted here. When I announced orders to the organization's members on Demoiselle's behalf, I used to deliberately keep a few people in the dark and observe the reactions of the synth vendors. If the vendors didn't change their plans, then the individuals informed of our orders must be innocent. If the vendors packed up and fled, however, then someone must have given them the news. After several rounds of testing and investigative tracing, I've narrowed the suspect list down to three people. The first is Florent, Spina de Rosula's senior advisor. Huh? Florent? Yes, yeah, surprising, isn't it? He was one of the people Boss trusted the most, which also means that he was someone who understood Boss really well. Thanks to his position within Boss's innermost circle, he always knew our upcoming plans and could thus avoid capture this whole time. There's someone else like him too. Marcel, the head of Confrérie of Cabriere. Uncle Marcel. It's a guild in Poisson. Boss helped it to grow to its current size and prominence. 
In the beginning, they were only reselling some daily goods, but now they're one of the richest guilds around with a lot of business connections in the city. So, they're like a sister organization of Spina di Rosula? Yes, you can say that. When we were fighting against the synth dealers, they provided us with plenty of support. It's a bit difficult to imagine someone using their own money to hunt down themselves. The final suspect is Thierry, the man responsible for coordinating information between Spina di Rosula and the guards. Although the guards mostly leave us to our own devices, there are still many activities we have to report to the local authorities. Since Thierry is always in the know about our current activities, he could theoretically always plan one step ahead. I see. These are all people who I communicate with quite regularly. To think that the enemy we've been fighting against has been right next to me all along, among those I trust the most. It's almost too hard to believe. If you want to investigate them, please take every precaution to not alert the quarry. Judging from our experience, the enemy is extremely cautious. Mm, of course. And thank you, Malus. You've provided us with a lot of great information. You're too kind, my lady. I'm just doing my duty. Uh, and before I forget, uh, proving Boss's innocence would also mean clearing him of blame in Jacques' death. After that incident, Jacques' wife and daughter were taken into the Spina's care. They still live in Poisson today. If it might help, you could also pay them a visit. I can make the necessary arrangements. Aw, oh, thank you so much, Belus. You really are the best. A new case awaits, my dear partner. I hope we can work together to uncover the truth and end this case once and for all. It is settled, then. Please excuse me, and enjoy your conversation at your leisure. Thank you for arranging everything for us, Malus. Excuse me, miss. Do you need anything from us? Mm. Oh. Hey, Navia's all quiet. This isn't like her at all. I'm sorry that I only came to visit after all this time. <sighs> after what happened, I, I didn't know how I was supposed to face the two of you. Ah, if it's about that, there's no need to apologize. After my husband died, Spina di Rosula sent us a lot of mora and support. I understood your guilt and apology to be genuine. But aren't all of those things nothing compared to the loss of Jacques? I can understand the kind of pain that comes with losing a father so needlessly. You don't understand at all. I didn't know how to face you, because I didn't know what I could possibly bring as a consolation gift. I know only the full truth could bring closure to you, and to all of us. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I appreciate the sentiment. But you don't have to carry all that guilt. On the matter regarding my husband, my daughter and I have more or less found our answer already. Would you mind sharing it with me? I really can't believe that my father could ever bring himself to shoot Jacques. I always knew that my husband's money was earned through others' suffering. He told me countless times that if he could turn back the clock, he would never go into the synth business again. He had many regrets, and felt that he took the idea of providing for his family too literally. For the longest time, he thought Mora was everything. So when Mr. Callis came to him with a proposal, he accepted it almost immediately. He tried to be as careful as he could, but even so, he was still found out by the higher-ups. They found out about his betrayal? 
Papa didn't say that exactly, but Papa did tell me that I should never be ungrateful. Before he left that day, he told me that he had no choice. It was only later that I realized it was his final farewell to the two of us. I don't know that for sure, but you could say that's the conclusion I eventually came to. Which is why I'm the one who should feel guilty. Callus had always taken great care of us, both when he was still alive and after he passed away. Even if he fired the shot that killed my husband, it was likely in self-defense. It is impossible for me to hate him for what he had done. But Mama, why is Papa still the bad guy if he did the right thing? Papa always wanted to be a good man, so why did he have to do a bad thing in the end? Well... Things aren't always as they seem. You still feel like your papa was a good man, right? Yeah. Papa was a really good man. The best in the whole world. Then you should hold on to that. If a good man had to do a bad thing, then he must have had his reasons. Regardless of whether he left you a parasol or a sword, he must have done so to give you a better life. Oh. Thank you. For everything you've told me. I will definitely find the truth. The current state of things is not something I'm willing to just sit back and accept. Thank you. I'm very grateful to hear this from you. Even though your personality is quite different from your father's, your determination when you speak is really similar. You really think so? That's the first time anyone said that to me. Are you okay, Navia? Uh, I'm fine. Don't worry. Let's investigate the three suspects next. Florence should be nearby, and we should be able to find Thierry and Uncle Marcel in the city. I'll get my son. Greetings, boss. How may I be of assistance today? I'm sure you've heard about what happened at the Opera House. Someone got turned into water right in front of us. Yeah, I've heard. With something that dramatic, I'm sure journalists will milk it for all it's worth. And it'll be all the talk for the next several weeks. It also reminded me, on the day that the incident happened with my father, it was raining outside, and we found some clothes left at the scene. After my partner here put the dots together for me, I feel like we should try to reopen his case. Can you do me a favor and try to recall what happened that night? Hmm, let me think. Mr. Callis was feeling pretty upbeat that day, so he was drinking and bantering away with us at the table. After that, he told us that he wanted to go get some fresh air, so we let him go without thinking much of it. Who knew that we would hear two gunshots ring out right after? My first reaction was that Mr. Callis' life was in danger, so I grabbed my holster and made a mad dash toward the scene. But when I got there, it was already too late. Mr. Callis was standing over a dead body with a gun in his hands. All we could do was look back and forth at each other not knowing what to say. So you also remember two gunshots, then? Indeed. The guards said that the first shot didn't hit anyone, while the second killed Jacques. But I've never really bought that explanation. Reason being, Mr. Callis had left his gun on the table. I even made sure to confirm that before running to the scene. But according to the guards, that doesn't mean he couldn't have had other guns on his person. About the clothes left at the scene that you mentioned. Do you think there was a third person there who was turned into water? At least from our perspective, my father had no reason to kill. So he would also have no reason to bring an extra gun with him. The gun he was holding probably belonged to Jacques, or a third person on the scene. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you're saying Mr. Callus ended up with the gun because he seized it from one of the other guys? 
But hold on. If that's what had happened, then why didn't he share the truth with any of us? He didn't even want to face the Oratrice machine, and chose instead to prove his honor in a duel. Did he lose all faith in the courts after seeing someone dissolve right in front of his eyes? Mm, about that, Malus told me a thing or two. So, I think I can understand why he committed to the duel. I'll tell you everything, once the whole truth has been revealed. I understand. Then, I'll leave Mr. Callus's honor in your hands, boss. And if I may just say one more thing. The whole Callus the Unfaithful epithet has been a thorn in my side since the day it was invented. Many people have laughed at me for still calling him Mr. Callus, even after so many years have passed. But it was Mr. Callus's trust that allowed me to rise through the ranks of Spina di Rasula and live the life I lead today. No matter what others might say, he'll always be the man I respect the most. And he'll always be my boss. Don't worry. I will definitely find the truth. You and all our other comrades at the Spina deserve to know the truth as well. Hey, Thierry, it's me. Oh, now, what brings you here, Miss Navia? I've heard that you made quite the name for yourself at the Opera House. Oh, so you've caught news of that already. Oh, okay. Hey, I'm also a member of the Guards, you know. The way you make it sound, people would think I was sent off to Poisson because I had done something wrong. Are you sure there isn't a little bit of truth in that? Under normal circumstances, shouldn't you have been called back to the city already? <laughs> I mean, where I work is really up to me. Let's just say I enjoy the ambiance of Poisson. Callus did a fantastic job running the town, building Spina di Rasula from the ground up and clearing many obstructions in my way. It would be next to impossible for me to find a similarly easy but high-paying job in the city. <sighs> anyway, enough chit-chat. Are these two friends of yours? You, uh, here for some formal business? Ah, uh, yes. These two are my partners. What happened at the Opera House made us realize that Linny's case, and my father's, may be related. We're trying to reinvestigate the details of my father's old case. Ah, I get it. You think there might be more to the case now that we know people can be dissolved into water, right? I was also flabbergasted when I first heard of it. If you want to go through the original files from your father's case, I can help you look for them. That'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Actually, I have another question. Do you have the authority to dispatch Gardamex? Of course. Without them, I couldn't possibly handle Poisson on my own. Why do you ask? We definitely can't use them to forcefully get more evidence for your father's case. Well, you see, just recently, we were attacked by a horde of unnumbered Gardamex in the city. So... <laughs> if you, hypothetically, wanted to do something against me, all you would need to do is get rid of the Mecha serial numbers and send them after me. <laughs> then you think too highly of my abilities. Dispatching Mecha is very different from controlling them. If I had to make an analogy, when you order a dish, the chef will make it for you. You can ask the chef to cook, but... Not to massage your shoulders or carry your baggage. If you try to make unreasonable demands, the chef would just think you're out of your mind and ignore you completely. The same goes for me and my Gardamex. Removing a serial number is also not as easy as you might think. There are a lot of complex steps to it, and it's almost impossible to keep it a secret. So I can promise you, those mecha were definitely private units. 
They're certainly not cheap. So, whoever their owner is must be super rich, powerful, or both. Now that you mention it, though, being in the synth business would definitely be profitable enough to afford this. Oh, <laughs> then you're officially in the clear, Thierry. Oh, <laughs> thank you for the vote of confidence, Navia. Jokes aside, I'd like to wish you all the best with your investigation. I'll be staying in the city for a little while, so just come find me if you need any support from the guards. How may I help you? I'm here to see Marcel. Could you please let him know? You can just say Navia's looking for him. Sure. I will let him know right away. Ah, Navia. Hello. Sorry to keep you waiting. I'm not as young as I used to be, so my legs are giving out a bit. Oh, it's all right, Uncle Marcel. There's no need to stress. I just wanted to talk to you briefly about what happened in the Opera House. I'm sure you saw everything too, right? Yes, uh, I've never seen anything so strange. Oh, you were at the Opera House too? That's right. I went there with Navia to see the magic show. Who knew it would turn into a whole murder mystery? I also witnessed your marvelous sleuthing work. Quite impressive. To beat the Hydro Archon at her own game on her own turf, I can already imagine everyone in Fontaine discussing your exploits over a few glasses of wine. Oh, Paimon doesn't want to become the talk of drunkards! <laughs> Apologies. It's just how Fontaine is as a nation. Everyone loves drama and theatrics. Uncle Marcel, you've also noticed that other thing, right? The fact that humans can dissolve in water? Yes. I was reminded of your father's case right away. Is that what you're investigating now? Exactly. I still don't have much solid proof, but I can sense that the other side has already begun to act. Oh, and what makes you say that? We were attacked on Araneus by some unnumbered Gardamax. And there was also an attempt to get me to drink water from the Primordial Sea. If not for the vigilance of my partner, I probably wouldn't even be here talking to you right now. Oh, you're giving us too much credit. Wasn't it you who protected us? Alas, it seems things are heating up again. The peace that Callus sought so dearly will soon become a thing of the past. But rest assured, Navia, Poisson will always remain a safe haven for you. If you're scared, you can always return there. If anyone dares to lay their hands on you there, the Confrérie of Cabriere will use its funds to the last Mora to bring them to justice. Thank you, Uncle Marcel. But I don't intend to go into hiding. I'm going to strike while the iron's hot. Do you have any new thoughts on my father's case? Ah, <sighs> about that. Sorry, my age is catching up with me, so it'll take me a while to recall my memory. The Confrérie was responsible for that banquet, so I was out and about the whole time making sure things were running smoothly. I didn't even have the time to drink with the guests. Then I heard the sound of a gunshot, and the rest was history. Oh, it's okay. No need to push yourself. We'll ask around some more, see if there are any valuable clues elsewhere. Sounds good. Just let me know if you ever need Mora. All my wealth comes from Callus' patronage and support. I'll spend however much it takes to clear his name.
We've talked to all three suspects, purely based on their conversations with me. None of them sounded particularly suspicious. Mm, I, I suppose that's to be expected, though. If a single conversation's all that's needed to find them out, then my father wouldn't have needed to investigate the case for so many years. Anyway, even though we didn't make a breakthrough, let's still compile what we were able to find. Hmm... But where should we start? Ah, you're right! Flora mentioned that Callus probably only ended up with the gun because of circumstance. Hmm... That makes sense. According to Jacques's family members, he already told them that he had been discovered and that he had no choice before he left home that day. Hmm. If I had to guess, he probably received an order from the synth boss to kill my father. Had he refused, he and his family's lives would have been forfeit. So, Jacques fired the first shot? Oh? And why is that? That's a good point. Jacques probably already knew that he was just being used as a tool for murder. And once he had completed his mission, he'd be of no more use to his boss. Huh. So, what would make more sense from his perspective would be to turn his back on the Order and seek protection from my father. Mm, makes sense. But without evidence, that's still just a theory. Beside Jock, the attack from the Gardamex has been bothering me quite a bit as well. It's obvious that our enemy has become more antsy after the secret of the primordial seawater was revealed. Do you think he knew, even then, that we'd follow this lead to the end? Given everything that's happened since, uh, it's quite possible. But who among the three suspects would have the ability to control privately owned Gardamex? Uncle Marcel? Uh, hmm. My father did really trust him. And they worked together on a large number of projects. Maybe that's how he got to know Jacques. And with funds from the Confrerie, he could also afford a large number of Gardamex. It's still really hard for me to imagine, though. After all, Uncle Marcel has been around since I was just a child. Also, wouldn't this mean he has been spending a whole lot of mora and energy to fight his own synth business? Thierry, you say? Huh. It is possible that he's figured out a way to convert the Gardamex for personal use. But I didn't feel like he was lying when he was talking to us about the Mecha. I also don't think he'd be able to keep that kind of tampering under wraps. Yeah, had he actually tampered with the Mecha, we'd be able to prove it with a simple check of the guard's inventory. If the Mecha were taken from the guards, it should be pretty easy to find out when and how that happened. Flora? Uh, it is true that he was closest to my father, and thus had the best chance of learning about his dealings with Jacques. But, as Spina de Rosula's advisor, his work mostly deals with personnel and security, so he shouldn't have much means when it comes to finances. So you're saying he's too broke to afford a mecha army? Exactly. He can't. And even if he could, I don't think he would be able to dispatch a whole group so quickly. <sighs> Who could it be? You know, if you think everything through, Uncle Marcel is indeed the most suspicious of them all. Could we be missing other suspects? Malus didn't know about the people turning into water thing when he narrowed it down to these three, did he? 
<sighs> Malus has always been very reliable, and his judgment of others' trustworthiness has been fair and well considered. When he laid out his case for the three, the rationale he gave me made a lot of sense as well. The suspect is knowledgeable about the Spina's internal affairs, has the means to dispatch Mecha to assassinate us, and possesses significant intellect and foresight. <sighs> Even if I don't want to believe it, I'm starting to see how things could all tie back to Uncle Marcel. Well, we still have another trump card on top of all the theorizing and speculating. Yes. Malus did say that charging straight in there would be extremely risky. But we don't have any other options right now. We need far more solid proof before we can hope to go charging in on our enemy. Navia, here you are. Oh, I've been looking for you. Huh? Aren't you the guy from the guards? Did something happen? Yeah. News came from Araneus just after you left. We've got another trial on our hands. Wasn't that place built specifically for holding trials? What's so newsworthy about this one? I know, I know. But they said the person they're putting on trial is a Fatui Harbinger called Tartaglia. What? Is that someone you know? Yeah, we know him. Maybe even a little too well. Well... He's been accused of being the true culprit behind the serial disappearances case. It's absurd, don't you think? Wait, how? None of our investigations have had anything to do with him. That's what I thought was strange about it, so I came to tell you the news right away. If the charge against him stands, then it'll be next to impossible to get the guards to support any of our planned investigations. Right. Because they'll think they've already found the culprit. Yeah. And it'll be a lot harder than to clear Mr. Callus's name. Hmm. I understand. <sighs> well, partner, what do you think we should do? We still haven't found any conclusive evidence. Uh... Um... Huh? Split up? What do you mean? Just as expected of my partner. Since this is a trial about the serial disappearances case, the culprit's attention will be focused on Araneus, leaving his home base wide open. You're right. This is our best opportunity. <laughs> All right, then. Let's do this. I'll stall them at the Opera House and charge Marcel as the true culprit. I won't have any chance of making that charge stick, though, unless we find more evidence. It'll be up to you to make it back in time and hand the decisive evidence to me. We'll help you, just like you helped us in Lenny's trial! Demoiselle, please allow us to accompany you. I'm ready. Ah, oh, Malou, Silver, when did you two get here? We heard that you'll be leaving Poisson and figured that you might require our assistance. It's our hope that your confidence will be bolstered with the two of us by your side. <laughs> Thank you so much. Then, let's make haste for Araneus. Paimon, Traveler, I'll see you at the Opera House. See you then! Now that Navia has set out for Araneus, we should also get going. The location has already been marked on the map, so let's head over! Huh. According to Malus's info, the synth production base is underwater! Let's go and try to find the entrance.
entrance that leads to the synth production base. It sure doesn't seem out of the ordinary at all. Ah, you're right. An important place like this is bound to have a ton of protective measures and mechanisms. Navi is probably arguing up a storm right now to stall for us. It would appear that I must repeat my question again, Mr. Tartaglia. Do you accept the charge that you are the true culprit behind the serial disappearances case? To be perfectly honest, I don't understand your country's complicated court system, or the reason why I'm being charged with something I've never even heard of. However, I did hear that people who have been charged can choose to participate in a duel to clear their name. Is that right? In which case, as long as I accept the charge, I can have an all-out fight with that champion duelist Clorend, right? I've got to admit, that's one of the most enticing offers I've ever received. When I privately sparred with her last time, she was obviously holding back. Real disappointing. Hey! Don't you understand? You're currently the prime suspect for a major case. This isn't the place for you to be looking for fights. Oh? Sounds like the Hydro Archon wants to lecture me on the ways of the Opera House. Then why don't you duel me too? I'm the kind of student that learns best in the heat of battle. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. That's not what I meant. Alas, it would appear that communication with the defendant is going poorly. And we have made very little progress. In that case, let me explain everything from the very beginning again. The goal of this trial is to determine the culprit behind the serial disappearances case. <laughs> that case had nothing to do with him! You've got the wrong man! Huh? What's going on? <sighs> Why is she interjecting again? <laughs> I told you it couldn't be one of the Fatui Harbingers. Miss Navia, this is the second time you've interrupted the court proceedings. I only tolerated your behavior last time because you were able to provide the court with a key eyewitness. But that was an exception rather than standard court protocol. I can very well charge you with contempt of court for your interjections. Oh, please. Did you ever think I had any respect for this place's pointless theatrics? We can put that discussion aside for now. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm here to charge the true culprit behind the serial disappearances case. And if my charges prove true, then Tartaglia here will be proven innocent by default, correct? Oh, a young lady has charged in and offered to clear my name. How fascinating. Well, I'd gotten half bored to death by all these rules and procedures anyway. So I'll take you up on that offer. So, Your Honor, is there nothing else for me to do now? You may take a seat for now in the audience, but that doesn't mean the suspicions against you have been lifted. Now then, Miss Navia, who is the person you would like to charge instead? That person is... I've heard of them, but weren't they Spina di Rosula's sister organization? Oh, is this going to be a friends to enemies type situation? Please let me remind you, Miss Navia, that charging someone is an incredibly serious matter. Committing to the charge also means taking on the legal responsibilities associated with it. And if the charge fails, depending on the circumstances, you may also be charged with the crime of making a false accusation. Knowing this, do you still wish to charge this man? Yes, I do. 
In that case, I declare the charge to be valid. Miss Navia and attorneys, please take your places on the court. Members of the guards, please contact Mr. Marcel right away so that he may stand trial. Mr. Marcel, you will not require an attorney, is that correct? Ah, uh, apologies, sir. It all just happened so quickly, I still haven't figured out what's going on. I think an attorney won't be necessary. This is probably just a misunderstanding between me and Navia. Very well. In that case, since both sides have now arrived, Miss Navia, please present your charges. I would like to take everyone back to three years ago, to the case of Callus the Unfaithful. Only through elucidating what really happened in that case can we connect all the dots for the serial disappearances case. Navia, do you really think that I was the one who killed your father? Come on, why would I do that? Callus was my benefactor, and remember both you and I only ran to the scene when we heard the sound of a gun. If that's enough to make me a suspect, wouldn't that make everyone at that banquet a suspect as well? I... Uh... I think there's no point in getting into the specifics right now. The audience doesn't even have the big picture yet. Even I'm <laughs> struggling to remember some details of that case. Exactly correct, Your Honor. I must refresh everyone's memory about that case before I can explain my charge and reasoning. I see. In which case, I will recount the findings about that case as originally recorded by Maison Guardianage. On the day of the murder, Spina di Rosula hosted a large banquet in a countryside estate owned by the Confrerie of Cabriere. During the banquet, all attending guests heard two gunshots from the courtyard. When the guests arrived at the scene, they found the primary suspect, Callus, holding a gun, while his acquaintance, Jacques, lay dead from a gunshot wound. The guards' investigation did not recover any other firearms from the scene. As a result, they concluded that the suspect's first shot must have missed, while the second must have taken Jacques's life. The suspect did not dispute this conclusion, and also declined to defend himself in court. Instead, he chose to prove his innocence through a duel. Callus was defeated by champion duelist Clarand in the ensuing duel, and soon succumbed to the injuries. These are the known facts about the case. The one with the motive to kill was Jacques, not my father. And even so, Jacques still had no reason to pull the trigger. Uh, in truth, the third person shot Jacques first, and was shot in turn by my father when my father seized the gun from him. After that, the true culprit turned the third person into water, erasing all traces of him from the scene. <clears throat> Thank you for the summary, Your Honor. Of course, the guard's conclusion appeared quite sensible to us at the time. However, we should revisit the case now that we've gained new information about the abilities of water from the Primordial Sea. of the victim's family confirms that Jacques had thoughts of assassinating Callus when he set out for the banquet. However, in the end he reconsidered and instead shared everything with Callus, hoping to seek the latter's protection. Unfortunately for Jacques, the true culprit had already considered this possibility and had sent out another assassin. First shot Jacques, then turned to shoot Callus. 
Only for Callus to wrestle the gun from him and kill him instead. was found at the scene. The guards once believed they were used by Jacques as a costume to disguise himself. But now, it is clear that the clothes were proof that there was a third person at the scene, and that they were turned into water after committing the murder. Since it was raining that day, the culprit was confident that they could use the rain to wash away all traces of their dissolved accomplice. Realizing this, the true culprit caused the hired assassin to dissolve into water, leading everyone to believe Callus was responsible for Jacques' murder. This is the true version of events. Ah, so that's what happened. Wait! You're telling me something as dangerous as water from the Primordial Sea has been used for all these years? What a great theory. It also explains Callus's and Jacques' respective motives. I guess they didn't shoot each other after all. Mr. Marcel, you are the one being charged with the crime. You should provide a rebuttal if you wish to prove your innocence. Ah, but I think I agree with everything Navia just said. In fact, there was nothing in her speech that directly implicated me. Then, may I ask some questions? In my opinion, we primarily need to determine two things. One, do you have the evidence to back up your claims? I'm afraid not. At least not at this very moment. Boo! <laughs> if you don't have any evidence, you should just go home! I may not have the evidence with me, but I know where I could go to collect it. If we look up the deserted clothes against a record of people who went missing around the same time, we should be able to find a match. Considering the serial disappearances case, the guards probably kept careful records of all missing persons from around that time, regardless of age or gender. That makes sense to me. Monsieur Nivellet, I would consider this to be a reasonable investigative direction. <sighs> Why do I feel like Farina's acting a little differently today? Maybe she's scared of embarrassing herself again? Alternatively, she's become more diligent after charging an innocent citizen in the last trial. My second question has to do with the ensuing duel. If the truth is indeed as you described, then why didn't Mr. Callus explain himself in court? If he had testified that a person had been dissolved, he could have at least mounted a defense. I thought about this too, and the answer is actually pretty simple. He felt there were things that were more important to him. The dissolving power of water from the Primordial Sea is an important secret for the true culprit of the serial disappearances case. My father could have exposed it for all to see, but he chose to take it to the grave. At that time, Spina di Rosula was in dire straits, and his reputation had already been shattered. He had no guarantee that going forward with the truth would allow the culprit to be brought to justice. What was certain, however, was that it would paint a gigantic target on my back. Boss once told me that Demoiselle had already been selected as the next target of the serial disappearances case. What? If the secret had gotten out, the culprit would have fought an all-out war with Espina right there and then. I wouldn't have been the only one in danger. All of us would have stood to lose our lives. Of course, the guards might eventually figure out the truth of the matter and determine that we were in the right. But what good would that do? How can a hollow verdict protect anyone? Had this opera house ever given my father any kind of confidence in its brand of justice, Spina di Rosula would have had no reason to exist. But by staying silent, we retain the ability to deter our opponents and continue the stalemate. I was able to become Spina di Rosula's president, which made me harder to target, as well as giving me more time to grow and learn. 
And once I have figured out the truth and stepped up to the challenge, I will do what this opera house cannot and restore my father's truth and honor back to him. So, you mean to say, your father intended to die in the duelist's ring? That's right. Do you have any proof? Of course. All you need is to ask his opponent, Clorand. I don't need your apology, your guilt, or your support from the shadows. You don't have to do anything for my sake. But since he entrusted his will to you, Clorand, you should tell us the truth about his sacrifice. Um, so, during the duel, did you believe that Callus was intending to die? <sighs> yes, I did. As a champion duelist, I fought many battles and taken a countless number of dishonored lives. In my line of work, I've seen all kinds of people give their all for the faintest hope to continue living. Some were determined, others passionate, and some even manic and twisted. Just one look and I can tell if a duelist is hoping to live or if they're looking to die. I hereby swear on my name and honor as a champion duelist that Mr. Callus never intended to leave the ring alive. <sighs> Since that's your testimony, I have no more questions. It appears there really are good grounds to reopen this case. I concur. However, Miss Navia, you still have not explained the link between your father's case and the serial disappearances case. Right? What she said was fascinating, but kind of beside the point. Wait. Weren't they just talking about the Serial Disappearances case? Of course, Your Honor. The two cases are connected via a matter of timing. In my father's case, the culprit intended to kill both Jacques and Callus. As a result, they planned to act after hearing two gunshots. And, at the end of Linny's trial, the culprit also only dissolved the victim in front of everyone because they realized they were at risk of being identified. The culprit could only time their actions so precisely if they were already at the scene. Coincidentally, Marcel attended both the banquet and the trial. So that's why you suspected me. <sighs> Even after hearing your reasoning, I still can't help but find it a little preposterous. I'm used to it, though. You've always been an impulsive and sentimental child, Navia. It's one of your most endearing traits. No need to appeal to pathos. I won't try to refute your points one by one, but even if everything you just said was true, can you prove that I was the only person present at both events? On top of that, does a person have to be physically present to control the timing? Can't someone remotely monitor the place? Uh... You know what she can say to that? I know that even with that, you might still think you can reduce the list of suspects with some further investigations, until I'm the only one left on the list. Alas, who won't feel at least a little hurt by an accusation of murder from a girl you see as your own daughter? But if I were to dismiss this completely, you'd also think I'm not being considerate of your feelings. Ah well, let Uncle Marcel teach you another lesson. Do you know what the biggest flaw in your reasoning is? I suppose you're gonna tell me anyways. It's timing again. I'm a businessman by trade. From that standpoint, there's no reason for me to kidnap young women. It's a high-risk action with nothing to gain. In addition, I left my home in Snezhnaya when I was young to come to Poisson and work in some trade. My business only thrived when I received Callus's patronage. But the disappearances began before I ever stepped foot in Fontaine. Uh I do apologize, Demoiselle. This was my mistake. No, it's not your fault. I'm sure he had come prepared. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Would you like to check the date of my first business license against the first known case of the serial disappearances? You can also take a look at my border entry records, or ask my friends and family when I left Snezhnaya for the first time. Could those records and testimonies do something to appease the unspeakable anguish in your heart? Oh, 
seems like she got the wrong guy. At this rate, Nagi will be convicted for falsely accusing him. I think you've done a superb job of dissecting your father's feelings as he neared the end of his life. But aren't you going against all of his wishes and expectations right now? He wished for you to become more rational, collected, and conscientious, instead of dwelling only on your own feelings. Once you've learned to be more considerate of others' feelings, and to stop rushing headlong into things, you'd have met most of his expectations. This isn't just about me, and it never has been. The biggest difference between me and the rest of the victims is that I still have the ability to search for the truth, while that same agency has long been taken from then. The people whose families were destroyed by synth abuse, the people who lost their loved ones to the serial disappearances, and the people who suffered tragic ends due to their sense of justice. Many people's images are flashing before my eyes. I'm sure some are coming to those of you in the audience as well. And whose image do you see, Marcel? Is it a man named Vache? <laughs> oh, so you do know that name. <laughs> I'm merely surprised you'd suddenly say the name of someone I've never even heard of. I was waiting for you to say that. Oh. 
Stabilize! Shine down! Time for... Retribution! Solidify! Illusion shattered! I will have order! Verdict is... on the primordial sea 
and use his theory as a foundation to achieve a breakthrough. The experiment was a failure. No individual managed to resurface from the water from the primordial sea. Female specimens 22, 23, and 24 were dissolved! <coughs> Sorry, Traveler. Paimon will try her best. It's just... that... Paimon's never read something so scary before! How can someone write something that terrible in such a matter-of-fact tone? You read the rest. Paimon's too scared to keep going. So that's why he did all of these experiments. Wait, did he really think he'd be able to find a way just by dissolving people over and over? That's just insane! Huh? Is it that the name you heard by the fountain? Paimon thought he was an eyewitness in the serial disappearances case. Ah, <sighs> you mean Vache is the one who did all of these... Uh, experiments? So that's it! Vache was no victim, but personally took his lover and... No, that's not it either! If that's the case, why would he want people to resurface from the water? In any case, Paimon will write it all down.
You take that side and Paimon will take this side. Check everything carefully. We'll find something for sure. Do you see, Marcel? Is it a man named Vache? <laughs> oh, so you do know that name. I'm merely surprised you'd suddenly say the name of someone I've never even heard of. I was waiting for you to say that. Navia, we're back! Uh, as expected of my partner, I just knew you'd return in the nick of time. Just how often do you intend to flout the rules of this court? It's all right, Monsieur Nervalette. Given their confidence, I expect they've found the crucial evidence. But the truth of it, Marcel, is that you've always been Vache. Huh? We've investigated your lair and we already know everything! After your lover, Veneer, was dissolved, you kept abducting young women to experiment on the hopes of bringing her back to you! You even created Marcel as a new identity and destroyed all records of your past as Vache! So that's it. Even the villains in opera performances rarely go that far. And with that, Marcel's motive has now been established. This information regarding your past also dismantles your prior timing defense. Well, Marcel, do you know where you went wrong? <sighs> you fixated your gaze on the lover that passed away, instead of paying attention to the living people around you. So, you never noticed how we changed, or how we grew as individuals. You also never understood Boss's real expectations for his daughter. Or our determination to see things through. Your determination? <laughs> Mr. Marcel, please speak up now if you would like to defend yourself. Otherwise, the trial will move on to the next stage. Do you think... Do you really think I wanted to do any of this? Pay attention to you? <laughs> what for? Have you ever paid attention to me? Ever empathized with my pain? Ever known how it feels to watch the love of your life dissolve right in front of your eyes? No one helped me. No one even believed me. All those decades ago, even the officers from the Maison Guardianage were laughing at me. They said there's no way a human being can turn into water. So I must have gone mad from grief. Vinyar's death was brushed away by all of you as if it didn't matter at all. Well, now you know, don't you? Ha! Well, it's 
too late now. All those who were dissolved are gone forever. You only have yourselves to blame. You set up this ornate opera house in pursuit of your so-called justice, your beloved drama, while turning a blind eye to the suffering of the people. Venier is dead. We promised each other that we would always be together. Wherever she goes, I will follow. But I'm not from this blasted place, so I can't be dissolved, no matter what I do. Hey, is that water from the primordial sea that he's drinking? I can't dissolve, can't dissolve, can't dissolve! <laughs> do you all see? I can't go, I can't follow. So if I can't go where she is, what choice do I have but to try to bring her back? I did all of that, and in the end, that accursed callus still got the better of me. I spent my entire life living on pins and needles, only to get stabbed by his idiot daughter at the very end. <laughs> the suspect is exhibiting signs of mental distress. Guards, please restrain him. Don't touch me! Don't anybody come near me! I still need to save Vinier. A promise! We made a promise! Vinier! Vinier! Please, Vinier! Don't think badly of me. All I want to do is fulfill our promise. At this point, the verdict of this trial is clear. With Mr. Marcel's conviction, the charges against Mr. Tartaglia no longer have any basis. Fine by me. I was in a bad mood, but after a show like that, I'm actually feeling pretty good. Traveler, please submit all the evidence you have collected to the guards, so that I might review and summarize the truth behind the serial disappearances case. The man now known as Marcel was originally named Varche, and worked as an adventurer with his partner and lover, Vignier. During an underwater expedition, Vignier accidentally came into contact with water from the Primordial Sea and was dissolved in front of Vache as a result. Vache learned of the Primordial Water's existence through the work of others and began to kidnap young women for research, with the goal of discovering a method to restore Vignier back to life. To cover his tracks, he invented the new alias of Marcel, and began to operate a business in Poisson. During the course of his research, Vacher discovered that a diluted concoction of water from the primordial sea can induce feelings of euphoria, and began to manufacture and market synth. However, as he accumulated wealth to fund his continued research and expanded the scope, he came into conflict with Spina di Rasula. After exchanging blows with Spina de Rasula for many years, Varche decided to assassinate their president, Callus, at a banquet. Although the assassination did not go as Varche expected, he was able to turn Callus into the murder suspect by dissolving the assassin he sent to the scene. And just recently, Varche attempted to frame Linny as the culprit of the serial disappearances case using a similar method. However, his attempt to frame Linny failed, and the power of water from the primordial sea became public knowledge. This case also exposed enough of Vache's machinations that he was eventually successfully charged in court. Thus concludes the enigmatic history of the serial disappearances case, with the truth revealed to all. The oratrice will now deliver the final verdict regarding the charges against Mr. Vache. According to the judgment of the Oratrice Mécanique d'Analyse Cardinal, Mr. Varche is guilty. Guards! Take Varche away. Good. It's what he deserves. Uh, with that, the serial disappearances case is over now. We really just witnessed history. Who would have 
thought the true culprit would be such a polite and well-spoken guy. Yippee! We helped Navia bring the bad guy to justice! He's hurt so many innocent people and now he's finally getting what he deserves! Huh? Are you okay? <sighs> Demoiselle, you are absolutely brilliant. The day our late boss had always hoped for has finally come. You can rest easy now, knowing justice has been served. Yeah. Yeah. It's finally over. It's all thanks to you guys. And my partner. See, Papa? Spina di Rosula's still doing well with me at the helm. Well now, hasn't this been a most delicious piece of drama? The villain has been caught, justice has been served, past wrongs have been righted, and it's a big ol' happy ending. Since it's been such a great show, I'll just let the false accusations against me slide. Either way, I've still got some business to attend to, so if you'll excuse me... Please wait just one moment, Mr. Tartaglia. Ugh, what now? None of this has anything to do with me. According to court protocol, since this trial was initiated due to a charge against you, a verdict must also be made regarding the initial charge before the trial can conclude. Oh, come on. Is this really necessary? Haven't you already caught the real criminal? Isn't it time for side characters like me to exit stage left? Please respect the laws of Fontaine. This has always been the rule. All right, all right, but this sure is a lot of hassle. All I need to do is stand over there, right? Let's just get this over with. Through evidence presented in the public trial that was just held, it has been established that Mr. Tartaglia has no direct connection to the serial disappearances case. The guilty party has been identified, and thus it is logical to suppose Mr. Tartaglia is innocent of the charges. We now turn to the Oratrice Mechanique d'Analyse Cardinale to render the final verdict on the charges. Hmm. According to the judgment of the Oratrice Mechanique d'Analyse Cardinale, Mr. Tartaglia is... guilty. What?! Hey, hey! That's not funny! Didn't you just say I'm supposed to be innocent? What's with this verdict? Is your justice machine malfunctioning? Huh? This has never happened before. The Oratrice actually returned a different verdict from the Chief Justice. I mean, have you ever heard of an innocent Fatui Harbinger? Do you think the Oratrice might have just convicted him on general principle? But weren't the charges about the serial disappearances case? No matter what else he's guilty of, it shouldn't affect the verdict in this case, right? The judgment of the Oratrice Mechanique d'Analyse Cardinal is, by law, the final verdict of the court. We must accept the guilty verdict. Guards, please take the suspect into custody per court protocol. So this is how justice is done in Fontaine. What a joke. You've got your rules. Well, I've got mine too! I am sorry. If you have been wronged, we will find the truth. But the rules of the court must be upheld.
Apologies. This is also the first time I've encountered such a situation. However, according to the rules established at the conception of Fontaine's court system, the Oratrice's judgment is the final verdict of the court. All I do is follow court procedure. As for why the Oratrice arrived at the conclusion it did, you should probably ask someone more knowledgeable than me. Uh, why are you looking at me? I had nothing to do with it! I, I don't know what happened there either! Hey, stop staring at me! What does Lady Farina mean by that? She says she has no idea either? But that's impossible. Didn't she create the Oratrice herself? Yeah, so are the verdicts reliable or not? Can results like this really be called justice? <sighs> My dearest citizens, did you really think we'd allow an incorrect verdict to be handed out in this court? Did you really believe that the judgment could be mistaken, or be the result of some sort of random mishap? Don't tell me. You thought even I had been blindsided by the Oratrice's result. But the way she looked just now, it was pretty obvious she had no idea what was going on. However, given the state of things, I shall give you an explanation. Everything that just took place including my supposed shock and bafflement, was a part of an elaborate performance, with every action meant to stir up drama and excitement. And, <laughs> of course, for every performance there is a script. Everything has unfolded exactly as I expected from the very beginning. As the embodiment of the very concept of justice, the Oratrice shall never render an arbitrary judgment! If you thought Child had nothing to do with the serial disappearances case, it is only because you've been blinded by the superficial appearance of innocence. Everything he's done, not to mention the danger he poses, are beyond ordinary comprehension and completely unforgivable! All shall be revealed in time. You will come to understand my noble intentions, as well as the absolute correctness of the Oratrice's verdict. <laughs> now, having said that, although I hate to leave things hanging in suspense, it is now time for this performance to end. As the lead actress, I shall be the first to take my leave. Toodaloo! So she chose to make her escape after all, did she? Uh... So you're saying we shouldn't put much stock into what she just said? Hmm... She probably just put on that performance to save face. As for the truth, it's unlikely that she actually has any idea. However, please be assured that I will continue to investigate this case in a personal capacity. Just as I promised, if the judgment has been incorrect, we will do our utmost to clear his name. All right. Even though we feel pretty badly for him, we'll take your word for it for now. After all, he's done plenty of bad stuff, so he should have known he'd go to prison someday, right? <laughs> What are you doing? Quick, stop him! Traveler! Hey! Traveler! Ah! Marcel! What are you doing over here? Stop resisting arrest! Cease, or we'll add another charge to the list! No, 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 wait! I, I just want to ask the Traveler something. I I'm not looking to run away. Please, please, just let me ask this one small thing. Go on. 
Thank you. Thank you. I was being led away when I finally realized something. Where did you first hear the name Vache? I erased all records of that name. So, unless... Are you still trying to prove your innocence? Give it up, you've already been convicted. Uh, really? Y you did? You're sure? You met her? But how could that be? How did you manage to do it? The Fountain of Lucene? Then... Then she's been so close to me all along! And I just never... Please, please give me a chance to talk to her again. Just let the Traveler take me to the Fountain to see her one last time. This is the last request I'll ever make in my life. You can do whatever you want to me afterwards. I don't care. What? Give an inch and you want to take a mile? Do you think serial killers get to make requests like that? Hmm. Paimon agrees. Why should we give him what he wants when he's only done a ton of super terrible things? This request, is it worth as much to you as your life? Of course! Wait, no. It's worth even more than my life. Humans. Will they betray the instinct to live just to satisfy spiritual needs? Very well. I will grant your request. Your Honor, I fear that... I will go with him. You do not need to worry about any escape. <sighs> in that case, I shall leave him in your most capable hands, Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Place? You said she's here, but what do I need to do to see her? Yeah, and even Paimon could hear her after drinking that thing. Didn't you just drink a lot of it on the stage as well? Oh, in that case... Vache! Ah! Yes, that's it! So you heard it too! Vinier, it's me! It's me, Vache! Vache? Vache? I'm here! I'm here! Where are you, Vinier? I'm coming for you! I'm finally here for you! Hey, wait! Be careful! Hey, wait! Vinier, is that you? It's me, Vache! Vinier! Vache, why did you come? Didn't I say? You don't need to look for me. You... You look a lot older than I remember. How long has it been? It's been more than 20 years. I've suffered for over 20 years since the day you left. All this time... Only the thought of bringing you back has kept me alive. Nothing else mattered to me. Oh, I must be dreaming. Who would have thought I'd get the chance to tell you all of my feelings like this? Vinier, you are my everything. I really don't know how I could live without you. But Vache, if you ask me... This world would be better off without you. Uh, wh what are you saying? If not for you, I would have finished my law degree and probably become a top-tier attorney one day. If not for you, I would have continued to pursue my love of the arts, and my works would have been displayed in the Palais Mermonia itself. If not for you, I would at least have been able to take care of my mother. And she would not have grown old and died alone, with nothing but the tears on her cheeks. It's all because of your selfishness, Vache. It's all because of you. 
You... Wait, you are not Vinier. Who are you? You're right. I am not Vinier. I am... the Sacrifices. Every woman who died by your hand, as our bodies dissolved, our consciousnesses flowed back to the Primordial Sea. Our thoughts circulated endlessly within the Primordial Sea, and we were no longer individuals. But we became one, just as streams of water come together in the sea. I'm Cressy. I'm Lemony. I'm Azeen. The only one I am not is Vignier. Why? But then, where is Vignier? She doesn't want to see you anymore. Every tendril of her consciousness is avoiding you. This is what you get for your selfishness. Your selfishness robbed us of our lives and our futures. You said time and time again that you'd do any and everything for her. But did you ever consider whether she'd want to see you do the things that you did? If she would despise you for what you became? I... um... I... You are a liar, a heartless murderer, and a cowardly narcissist. The only thing you are not is Vignier's beloved. From the moment your first victim died and her consciousness merged with Vignier's, she has had nothing but pure hatred for you. No! Vignier! She can't hate me. Let me see her. Please, have mercy. You still don't understand. When I said don't look for me, that came from the real Vignier. She really doesn't want to see you anymore. But on top of that, she also said that because it's her final drop of pity for you. She said that because she knew that if you did come here, we will show no mercy to you. Vashe. Vashe? 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 Drown. to relax. Huh. Well met, partner. I knew something great was going to happen when I woke up in such a good mood today. Even this weather can't put a damper on the demoiselle's mood. It's a pleasure to see you both again. easy to work with and always bring home the bacon. Who wouldn't treasure having a partner like me? <laughs> Sounds like you're really enjoying life these days, Navia. What have you been busy with since the trial? <sighs> it's just been one thing after the other. I've been making non-stop trips between Poisson and the courts in Sen. Everyone from Spina di Rosula organized a memorial for my father. We never held a memorial when he first died, since everyone knew that even if we held one back then, no one was going to come. This time, though, everyone in Poisson, and even many people from the court all attended. Ah, so his name's definitely been cleared now. That's what we like to hear. It's been the dearest wish of Demoiselle all along. <laughs> that blasted stubborn fool. 
I was right to put my faith in him. I'm so glad I didn't give up on the case all those years ago. Oh, by the way, I ran into Charlotte just after I left the memorial service. Uh, well, maybe it'd be more accurate to say I knew she would be there, and there was no way she'd just let me go. Huh? So you know Charlotte too? THE Charlotte? Journalist from the Steambird? Yeah, way back when I first became the president of the Spina di Rosula, she was all over me, wouldn't take no for an answer. I believe the story was called The True Heart of Darkness, Secret Tales of the Yellow Rose. To be fair though, it was a really flattering feature. <laughs> so, we've been on pretty good terms ever since. She was trying to lean on our friendship to get me to do an exclusive piece on the serial disappearances case. Oh yeah, she told us about that. She's always been super interested in that case, so now her wishes finally come true too! Anyway, I told her to make sure that when she writes about you guys entering the opera house with the critical evidence, that you both sound really cool. <laughs> now that's another thing to look forward to! We trust Charlotte's skills with a pen for sure! Oh, and in other news, I also took Clorand out for a meal. Oh, are you two on better terms now? Mm, while you were investigating Vache's headquarters, Clorand gave testimony on my father's behalf. It was thanks to her that we were able to turn the tide. I wanted to thank her. I mean, there's also no point in being awkward all the time, so we took the chance to reconcile with each other. Oh, that's great! Paimon also thought Clorand wasn't actually a bad person. It's always good to have more friends. Anyway, now that the case has finally been solved, perhaps it will slowly begin to fade from the public consciousness. Oh, actually, there's still one last thing I need to do. What is it? I should pay a visit to my father's grave, and tell him the truth of what happened, as well as how it all ended. And on top of that, just how much people still look up to him, to this day. That includes me, too. Miss Navia. Indeed. Mm -hmm. We want to go too! We also think Callus is a really admirable person! Sure thing. I'd like you two to share the moment with me. After all, without you, there might not have been such a positive ending. And in that case, everyone, let's be off. Considering the recent weather, we'll be lucky if we can reach Poisson before dark. Yeah, you're right. It's been raining non-stop for a few days now. Huh. This is where my father's grave is. Hmm. To be perfectly honest, even I haven't been back here for... a long time. Huh? There's someone there already. Wait... That figure... It can't be... Hmm? Isn't that Nervalette? Why would the Chief Justice be here? Huh? Navia? Hmm... hmm. My apologies. I should have asked before coming to pay my respects. Don't say that. Sorry about that. Oh, uh, I was trying to say there's no need for you to apologize. I wanted to show my father how much I've grown. But still, I doubt I've grown to the point that even the Chief Justice would feel compelled to apologize to me over and over. In that case, I will stop apologizing for now. Hmm. You really could use some pointers on understanding human emotions, Monsieur Nervillette. In any case, why did you come to Poisson? Hmm. Well, ever since that day, I've been turning a question over and over in my head. Just what is justice, anyway? There was once a time when I didn't want to believe that there could be anything more important to humans than life itself. Oh, rather than that, it's probably more truthful to say I didn't believe humans were capable of resisting the most basic instinct of living things. That they could rebel against their own nature, 
or consider certain things to be more important than their own lives. Which is also why I didn't stop your father from beginning that fateful duel. I believed that a truly innocent man would never throw away his life like that. That there was nothing, should have been nothing more important than one's own continued survival. But Mr. Callus proved me utterly and decisively wrong. If not for his sacrifice, the serial disappearances case would have remained unsolved to this day. Mr. Callus made the choice he did for his daughter, for his associates, and for many people completely unrelated to him. And in the end, from a certain perspective, one could say that he did it all for the sake of justice. A justice that's higher than life itself. So, you asked me why I came here. I just wanted to say my apologies to Mr. Callis in person. I should have noticed all of this much sooner. This regret has filled me with a sadness that has haunted me for days. That high and mighty chair in the opera Epicles indeed insulates one from many important things. Spina di Rosula, thank you so much for your hard work and perseverance. Uh, I'm sorry for being mad at you before. So, you're actually one of those types that's cold on the outside, but pretty thoughtful on the inside, huh? That reminds me of Silver, one of my guys. Sorry about that. Self-expression is not one of my strong suits. <sighs> Didn't I just say you don't need to apologize? Ah, so Navia and Nervalette seem to have made their peace as well. Let's not disturb them for now. We can wait till after they're done. <sighs> Paimon's never paid respects at someone's grave before. Uh, did Paimon do anything rude there? for a bit. If we can't talk to Lady Farina, we can at least talk to him, right? Oh, it's you two. Did Miss Navia invite you to come pay your respects to her father? Mm-hmm. We ran into Navia on the streets today, so we just followed her here. I see, I see. Then is there something that I can help you with? Uh... Um... Well, it's pretty hard to run into you like this since you're usually super busy. So we figured we could try to ask you a few questions, if that's okay. Please feel free. Though outsiders, you helped us solve one of the greatest mysteries in Fontaine. And it would be my pleasure to return the favor. The bad guys referred to that special water as water from the Primordial Sea, but what is it really? Truthfully, that name is already quite accurate. I can only surmise that Vache and his ilk only learned of its nature and existence after extensive research. There used to be a special sea on the surface of this planet. The nature of its seawater was rather different from that of the sea we know today. Most of Tevat's life forms were first born in that special sea. You could say it nurtured much of the life on this planet. Huh. So it really was where everything began. It makes sense to call it Primordial, then. But today, the Primordial Sea no longer exists on the planet's surface. What Vashe discovered must have been some kind of special case, or a remnant from a truly ancient age. Huh. So that's how it is. Oh, you really know everything, Monsieur Nevelet. But... If that's the case, then why would people, uh, at least people from Fontaine, dissolve in that kind of water? Indeed. Why would the primordial sea, which was known to engender and nurture life, 
suddenly reverse itself and devour life instead. To be frank, that also doesn't match my understanding of this world and its laws. There must still be some unknown secrets around the people of this land. Is there anything else you'd like to ask me about? That the sea levels will rise and everyone will be dissolved in water, leaving Farina crying alone on her throne, but the sins of the people will be finally washed away for good? Does that appropriately summarize the version you've heard? That's right! It was Lenny that told us back then! And that about covers all the main points! Yes, up to the present, I think we reached a point where we have no choice but to confront this prophecy directly. Rumors have it that this prophecy is rooted in the last words the former Hydro Archon left to the world before she passed away. A prophecy? Of the former Hydro Archon? Wow, this is the first time that we've ever heard of it! Two parts of the prophecy have already proven correct. The rising sea levels and the ability of the people of Fontaine to be dissolved. We should be more vigilant and stay on the watch for further signs. Speaking of the prophecy, Farina has also always taken it quite seriously. Indeed, she has been collecting information and intelligence from across Tevat for this purpose. If the rumors were true, then perhaps this prophecy is the conundrum left to Farina by her predecessor. But with Farina being the way she is, can we really trust her to solve it? Is there anything else you'd like to ask me about? My apologies. My investigation has still not reached its conclusion. However, I still believe the judgment of the Oratrice was not rendered arbitrarily. Huh? But you also said you thought he was innocent! For many years, I have been quite aware that the Oratrice does not simply mechanically repeat the verdict that I give on each case. As a divinely created mechanism, the people's unified faith in the concept of justice is integrated into it. Not only can it produce the incredible power of indemnitium, but it likely also possesses other traits, such as self-awareness. Which is all to say, I have been prepared for a situation like this for a long time. Huh. So when Lenny told us that he heard a human voice from the room where the Oratrice's core is stored... I was not aware such a thing had occurred. Perhaps that could serve to prove my conjecture, I will add that to the list of items to investigate. In any case, I am inclined to believe that the Oratrice does have a methodology all its own. We just do not have enough information. Based on Farina's reaction, I doubt even she had any idea what was going on. She managed to bluff her way through it, though. The time-tested twin tricks of bravado and drama. While we do intend to get to the bottom of this, for now, we regret to say that the Fatui Harbinger We'll just have to bide his time in the fortress of Meripede. If we did incorrectly convict him of crimes he did not commit, we will most certainly compensate him to the fullest extent allowed by the law. If you ask Paimon, the only compensation he'll want is a no-holds-barred fight with you. Is there anything else you'd like to ask me about? Your sibling, another blonde-haired traveler, I'm sorry, but I've never seen anyone who matches that description. If she ever stepped foot in Fontaine, I'm sure she followed our laws to the letter, and had no reason to appear on the stage of the opera Epicles. Is there anything else you'd like to ask me about? Very well. It was my honor to provide you with what answers I could. I very much enjoyed conversing with you. It will soon be time for me to leave this blissful tranquility behind and return to Palais Memonia. You really are super busy, Monsieur Nervalette. Paimon thought you only came here to pay your respects today because you had the day off. Crime and villainy do not have the day off, and so justice must work around the clock as well. This is merely the nature of a justice's work. All right, all right, you've got a point. Huh? Paimon just noticed that the rain has stopped. Thank you. 
Lucy, you believe that this warning letter was sent by the Phantom Weasel? Absolutely. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The Phantom Weasel never acts as you expect. He must have faked his own death ten years ago using a body double. Now that he's back, I'm sure the guards who worked on his case back in the day are in for a headache, but however this turns out in the end, the one thing it won't be is boring. Couldn't agree more. As a journalist, I'm gonna get a lot of mileage out of this one. Thank you, sir, for your time. Now, whom should I interview next? Oh, oh, hey! What a coincidence! Fancy meeting you here! Perfect timing. So, the Phantom Weasel's latest warning letter. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is the first time we're hearing of this one. Could you call us in? Huh? Oh, oh, sorry. Yes, this case is from a decade ago. I guess you wouldn't know about it. Well, not to worry. You're in good hands because I'm a professional. The story goes like this. Ten or so years ago, a phantom thief became active in the court of Fontaine. Known only as the Weasel, nobody knew his true identity, and the authorities never managed to catch him. Wow, cool! He sounds like one of those mysterious night burglars that you read about in novels. Precisely. Well, except the part where they actually have a good reputation. Our Weasel targeted whatever people held dear, and no one was safe from his predations. He would just as soon steal a necklace from a rich merchant's safe as he would a toy doll given to a commoner child for their birthday. I know. The phantom thieves you read about in novels rob the rich to pay the poor. But this guy did not discriminate. Unsurprisingly, this didn't work wonders for his public reputation. Every man and his dog wanted to see him behind bars. Yeesh. So, uh, did they catch him? Um, not exactly. There's a good chance that the weasel would still be at large to this day if it hadn't been for an accident ten years ago. A magician named Caesar fell to his death in a botched high-altitude escape performance. When the police went through his personal effects, they found a hoard of stolen loot and gadgets used for criminal activities. And that was how the phantom weasel's identity was revealed to all. Sure enough, thefts in Fontaine went down after Caesar's death. But today, ten years on, the notorious thief has once again issued one of his warning letters and pasted it on the gate of the Opera Epicles for all to see. I had to squeeze through the crowd this morning to get a photo as soon as I heard. Here, it's this one. So, this is the warning letter, huh? Let's see what he wrote. Three days from now, when evening falls, I shall take from you that which you hold most dear at the Opera House. Just as you did to me ten years ago. This is, without a doubt, a clear declaration of criminal intent. After years of laying low, the Phantom Weasel is back with a vengeance. What once seemed like an open and shut case has been blown wide open again. But why has he re-emerged now? And what does he want? I sense an epic scoop. And I'm going for it. Uh-oh. If this thief will steal anything that other people value, does that mean even we might be targeted? Aww. But Paimon doesn't want to get kidnapped. Well, he'd have to go through you first. You would stop him, right? Okay. The people have spoken. It's clear that the public are very concerned about the Phantom Weasel's reappearance. Let's see, I've got a photo of the letter, my interview notes. Yep, that should be enough to form the skeleton of my article. It does feel like something is missing, though. Something exclusive. Who should I interview next? I need someone with a more concrete connection to the weasel. Hmm. <gasps> is that who I think it is? Lenny! Magic. Magician. Caesar! <gasps> the Phantom Weasel! That's it! Let's go interview Lenny! You see, the original Phantom Thief Caesar was a magician too! And what do phantom thieves and magicians have in common? They both have an air of mystery about them. Perhaps there's a connection there. Are you serious? What sort of a deduction is that? Oh, relax. 
My journalistic instinct tells me that an exclusive news story is beckoning. Let's go. No time for delay. Mr. Magician? How did you know which card I picked? Oh, it's simple. Come closer and I'll let you in on my secret. Magicians have a special skill called telepathy, which means we can read other people's minds. Really? Then, what am I thinking now? Well, first you need to relax, because I can see that you're clenching your fist in your mind, as if to say, no, I mustn't let him guess it. Aww. And now you're getting a little flustered. You're trying to find a way to empty your mind, to think of nothing at all. But the more you try to hide a secret, the easier it'll come out. You snuck out from home today, didn't you? You told your family a little lie so you could come out and play. Now, now, that's not a good habit. Y you can tell? Uh, oh boy, you really can read my mind. Of course. Oh, and that's the end of my performance. You should really be heading home. Remember to apologize to your family, all right? They must be worried about you. Uh, all right, got it. Bye, Mr. Magician! Why, hello. We meet again. Are you looking for me? What's the situation? Well, why don't you guess, Mr. Telepathic? Oh, please. You didn't believe that spiel, did you? The power of telepathy is quite beyond me. I'm sure that child would beg to differ. Seemed like you were right on the money. That was nothing more than a little trickery. I made an educated guess based on his micro-expressions. That, plus the fact that he was the only kid here without his parents, and he looked as guilty as sin. He made it easy for me. You guys, on the other hand... Hmm... Let me guess. Don't tell me you're here for the Phantom Weasel, are you? Wow! Cut it in one! Is this more of your trickery at work? Wait, really? <laughs> no, no trickery this time. It was pure luck. His warning letter's been the talk of the town, so I figured that maybe you were asking around about that. Bingo! I plan on writing a column reporting on the latest news about the Phantom Weasel. So, Linny, what are your thoughts on this infamous thief's reappearance? Hmm... To be honest... It makes me angry. Angry? Why? You read his letter, right? The Phantom Weasel claims he's planning something in three nights' time at the Opera House. That's the night I'll be performing there. Huh. What are the chances? <gasps> Wait a minute! You don't think he's after you, do you? Well, if he is, then his warning is clearly a direct challenge to me personally. And if he's not, then it's still going to be a huge headache for me. The mere mention of the weasel's name is enough to scare people off. So once the contents of that letter get out, barely anyone will be showing up to watch my show. But I've been preparing for this for a long time. I'm not about to let him ruin my big day. This leaves me with only one choice. I have to expose the Phantom Weasel's identity before the show begins. Really? So what you're saying is, we might get to see a live duel between a famous magician and an infamous thief? Wow, this has exclusive written all over it! To be honest, I'm not sure if I'll emerge the victor. The Phantom Weasel is a notorious crook, infamous for his inscrutable methods. You're being far too modest, Linny! I think your magic tricks are even more inscrutable than those of a thief. 
Thanks for the compliment, though I have to say I don't care much for the comparison. A lot of people liken magicians to thieves because we both have the ability to make things disappear without the person noticing. But there's an important difference that these people overlook. Allow me to demonstrate with a quick magic trick. Here, I have a flower, just an ordinary flower that was picked not long ago. Watch it carefully now. Three, two, one. Oh, it's gone! That's the question. Where did it go? Therein lies the difference between us. Thieves make precious things disappear, but only magicians make them reappear. If I could now invite you all to check your clothes, there might be a surprise in there somewhere. Don't worry, I didn't take offense. I just wanted to take the opportunity to perhaps change some of the preconceived notions you might have about magicians. Since Caesar's death, a lot of people associate magicians with criminality. It can be quite frustrating. I can imagine. Um, coming back to your trick just now, might I presume that you are well versed in floral symbolism? For example, magicians often use rainbow roses in their flower-related performances to represent passion and romantic encounters. But you used a Lumidu spell, which, if I'm not mistaken, allude to separations. I'm curious to know if there was any deeper meaning behind this choice? Impressive knowledge. It's no wonder you're such a successful journalist. But I'm afraid I don't know the first thing about floral symbolism. I'm just in the habit of using Lumidu spells in my magic. It sounds like something I should look into, though. Hmm. I'll buy myself a copy of Fontaine's Floral Language Facts when I have some time. But it'll have to wait until this phantom weasel business is behind us. Well noted. In that case, this brings us to the end of our interview. I, for one, am looking forward to the final showdown between you and the thief. Please feel free to get in touch to update me on any further developments. Otherwise, I will of course see you at your show in three days' time. But let's hope the Phantom Weasel is caught by then. If there's nothing else, uh, I'll be off. You've given me lots to work with here, and I've got no time to lose if I want to write that exclusive piece. I'll see you all later! So, uh, Nanny... Are you going to tell us how you did that flower trick now? <laughs> I'm afraid that's my little secret. Aww. Well, magicians are entitled to their secrets. But Paimon's really itching to know how it's done. You feel it too, right? So itchy! <laughs> Not so itchy then, huh? Well, since you're so concerned, how would you like to serve as my temporary magician's assistant and help me investigate? Magician's assistants? Oh, that sounds fun! Assistants are technically magicians too! Also, it'll bring us one step closer to figuring out how that darn trick is done! Shall we go for it? The first thing we need to look into is who Caesar really was. If he truly was the Phantom Weasel, that means that the Weasel is dead, and whoever wrote this warning letter is just a copycat criminal. But if he wasn't the Weasel? Hmm. Well, that'll make things more interesting. It would mean that the Weasel lives, and he's been laying low all this time in some corner of Fontaine. And if we're investigating Caesar, his fiancée Gemma is a good place to start. Word is that she visits the cemetery often, so I asked Lynette to wait for her there. We should make a move. Let's go and rendezvous with Lynette.
You took your time. Sorry. I bumped into the Traveler and Charlotte en route, and we ended up chatting for a while. It's been a while, Annette! We're working as Lenny's temporary assistants in the investigation of the Phantom Weasel. Thank you. It's good to have you helping. So, what's the situation? Have you seen Gemma? Nope. I've been here a while, and she still hasn't shown up. How bizarre. Maybe it was bad intel. Well, we won't get anywhere by standing around waiting. Traveler, Paimon, let's go ask around. Excuse me, good sir. Do you by any chance know a Gemma? Gemma? You mean Caesar's fiance? Sure I do. What's this about? I'm just trying to get a hold of her because I need her help with something. I heard she comes here a lot? Yeah, she does. <sighs> Poor thing. It's no secret why, either. She's heartsick. Ever since Caesar passed away, she's been coming here once every week to clean his grave. Often, she just sits there in front of his headstone, lost in thought. Sometimes she talks to herself. I asked her what she was doing once. She said she wanted to speak to him again. She knows he's gone and can't hear her from the grave, but she just likes to spend time there, telling her fiancé all about how her life is going. And she's been doing this ever since Caesar passed away? Oh, so ten years. Wow, their love must have been really strong. I'll bet. Caesar's reputation fell apart after his identity was revealed, so no one else visits his grave. Gemma's the only one who still thinks about him after all these years. I don't know if the mind lives on in the waters after death, but if it does, I'm sure Caesar must be grateful to have someone who remembers him fondly. If I'm honest, I think this is all so unfair to poor Gemma. Her fiancé was a low-life crook. He doesn't deserve someone like her. Anyway, all of that said, she's running later than usual today. Normally, she'd be sitting in front of his grave by now. I wonder if she's okay. Well, that's everything I know, I'm afraid. You might have more luck asking some other people. All right, well, thanks for sharing all of this with us. We'll keep asking around. You're welcome. I just hope she'll be able to move on one day. Did you hear the news? They're saying the Phantom Weasel's back. You're kidding. Wait, isn't he dead? I don't know anymore. All sorts of news flying around nowadays. I can never tell what's true and what isn't. But what if, just hypothetically, I mean, what if this Weasel's the real deal and Caesar was framed? Called it. Seriously, ten years ago, on the day it all went down, I said to myself, you know what? This guy's been set up. The Caesar I knew was a good guy. He gave balloons to children on the street for Pete's sake. What, are we supposed to believe that he was a balloon thief or something? Give me a break. Oh, please. Weren't you the one cursing his name to high heaven when the police announced the news? You were all, oh, that gosh darn lousy son of a, oh, you think you know a guy, or words to that effect. Wait, did I say that? Hmm, I don't seem to recall. Hello there. Sorry for disturbing you, but I couldn't help but notice you were discussing the Phantom Weasel. We're actually quite interested in this topic as well, but we're struggling to get to the bottom of it. Do you think you could spare a moment to tell us a little bit about Caesar? You've come to the right people. Yep, I was there. Back when Caesar used to perform magic tricks on the street. He was a great magician. The best trick I ever saw him do was pop a transparent balloon, only for a whole bunch of doves to fly out from the inside. I was right up close and didn't blink or look away once, but for the life of me, I still don't have the faintest clue how he pulled it off. Really incredible stuff. I saw him perform too. He always used to bring some gifts along for the kids who came to watch his show, and he'd hand them out after he was done. 
Sometimes, he even got the kids to write their wishes down, and then he'd make the items on the wish list appear in his next show. Huh. He doesn't sound like such a bad guy. But after he died, there were also rumors that he used the wish list to find out what was precious to people, with the intent to steal it later. As I'm sure you know, the Phantom Weasel would steal just about anything from anyone. Whatever the case, now that the Weasel is back, Caesar's become a hot topic once more. I bet Gemma must be pleased. If Caesar's name gets cleared, maybe it'll finally give her some solace after all this time. No, oh, speak of the devil. That's her over there. If you've got any more questions about Caesar, she's definitely the one to ask. So that's Gemma. Uh, is it just Paimon, or does it look like something's wrong? Wait, it looks like she's injured. Come on, let's see if she's okay. Gemma, right? <sighs> Who's asking? Don't be afraid, we mean no harm. It looks like you're injured. How bad is it? <sighs> Thanks for your concern, but you didn't answer my question. Who are you, and what do you want with me? My name is Linny, and this is my sister Lynette. We're investigating the Phantom Weasel. The Weasel posted a warning letter this morning. If he still lives, that means that Caesar was falsely accused. You knew Caesar better than anyone else. So if you're willing, we'd love to hear what you think about all this. <sighs> I promise you can trust us. We won't hurt you. In fact, we'll do all we can to keep you safe. I... I never believed that he was the weasel. Huh. I suspected as much. Okay, so going back ten years, do you remember anything strange in the weeks leading up to the accident? Did Caesar have a falling out with anyone, for instance? No. Not that I know of. <laughs> Got it. All right. Sorry for disturbing you. If you don't have any more questions, please leave. I want to be alone with him. Judging by the look on her face, there's definitely something fishy about her. She's lying. She definitely knows something. That's fair. We're just a bunch of strangers who showed up and started questioning her about things that happened a whole decade ago. It makes sense that she'd be wary around us. In any case, I doubt we'll get any further here, so let's call it a day. Meet me outside Hotel de Boer tomorrow, and then we'll start the next step of our plan. Over here. Lynette's not joining us today? I've had her follow Gemma and see if we can make any inroads with her. They should be at a cafe right now. Still, I don't think that Gemma's likely to open up to us. So, we need a contingency plan. 
Today, we'll be looking into a guy named Lorenzo, Caesar's former pupil and assistant. When Caesar passed away, all the stolen goods discovered in his home were confiscated and returned to their rightful owners. But Lorenzo was the only one privy to all his magic secrets, and he inherited his craft. Before long, Lorenzo was the next big magician in town, his fame surpassing even that of his master, and it made him very wealthy. He's since left the magic scene, though, and these days, he's a wealthy businessman with his fingers in a lot of different pies. I had to pull a lot of strings, but I managed to get him to agree to a couple of drinks with me. Be warned, though, I hear he's got a hair-triggered temper. We'd best be careful. You neglected to mention that you were bringing two other people with you. My apologies. These two are my assistants. When they heard that I was meeting with the former magic maestro himself, they begged and pleaded with me to bring them along. Um, and if it's no trouble, a couple of autographs would really make their day. Oh, forget the pleasantries. Just sit. Get a load of this guy. Forget the pleasantries, he says, but he looks pretty happy about Lenny stroking his ego. I only agreed to meet since we're both magicians. Do me a favor and cut to the chase. I have more important things to do than drinking. Much obliged, sir. As it happens, the matter I want to address is also related to magic. Yesterday morning, a warning letter from the Phantom Weasel appeared on the entrance to the Opera House. He claims to be planning something for the same evening that I'm scheduled to do a magic show there. As such, I believe that I may well be his target. I have to get to the bottom of this to ensure that my show can go ahead as planned. Naturally, any investigation into the weasel starts with a few questions about Caesar, who... What is there to investigate? Caesar was the weasel and he's been dead for ten years, so what if some sick creep thought it'd be funny to write a warning letter? It changes nothing. Are you trying to tell me you actually bought it? Please, sir, no need to get so worked up. I do concede that a copycat is but one possibility. Possibility? It's a fact, Linny. Look, my patience is limited, so listen carefully while I'm still willing to put up with you. The weasel is dead. Period. Everyone knows that, so do yourself a favor and quit this investigation. It'll lead you nowhere. Look, if this affects your magic show in any way, I will personally compensate you for any losses. Oh, sir, I'm honored, really. But this isn't about finances for me. My pride as a magician is what's at stake here, Lorenzo. Copycat or not, this person has thrown me the gauntlet, and I must meet their challenge head on. Your pride? <laughs> Don't mince words with me, boy. Just tell me what exactly are you seeking to do? I want to find out the Phantom Weasel's true identity. I have to know for myself what really happened ten years ago. What would that accomplish? And what do the events of ten years ago have to do with you, anyway? Look, you of all people should know that a magician never reveals their secrets. And in any case, dead men don't talk. So if you really care about your magician's pride, then you'll forget about Caesar and move on. Uh... This is getting awkward. Renzo? Is that? Oh, it is you! <laughs> I know that big, uh, booming voice anywhere. <laughs> What's up, my man? Wanna grab a drink with me? Another day, I'm busy. Aw, oh, come on! You can't be all business all the time. You know what they say! Live fast! Die! Young. <gasps> you gotta learn how to kick back and relax once in a while! If I wanted your life advice, I'd ask for it. Now get out of my face and go be drunk somewhere else. Sorry, my good sir. I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Oh, hey! Um... 
Edmondo, he and I are business pals. We worked together a bunch of times. This is your first time meeting him? Oh, he's always like this. Foul mouth and hard nose. Never heard a kind word out of this guy the whole time I've known him. Uh, and he wonders why he can't get a girlfriend, despite being, what, pushing 40, 30, something? Anyway, point is, a lot older than when he first got rejected by the girl he was into. And he's still into, from what I hear. Shut up and get out of my face. Another word out of you and you can forget about doing business with me ever again. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I may have had a little too much to drink. <laughs> All right, I I'm, I'm going to leave. Don't work too hard. I think it's high time I made a move as well. If you really want to investigate this, Linny, be my guest. But if nothing good comes of it, don't say I didn't warn you. Well, that fell to pieces in a rather spectacular fashion. Any thoughts? Totally! And what was all that about compensating you for your losses? Why would someone you just met make an offer like that? He's gotta be hiding something. And not like Gemma. She was a little suspicious, but this guy's definitely covering something up. I think so too. We need to look into Lorenzo more closely. That guy Edmondo seems to know a thing or two about him. He only just left. Let's see if we can catch up with him. You okay there? Uh, who are you? Oh, it's you guys. Don't worry about me. I must have had one too many. Uh, I just need to ride it out. <laughs> I say way too much back there, didn't I? Yeah, I nearly talked myself into complete financial ruin. <laughs> Note to self, no more drunken chats when Lorenzo's around. So he was serious about threatening to cut you off? Ugh. Was a bad egg. Hey, 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 hey! Keep your voice down. Don't go prying into Lorenzo's personal affairs. <laughs> bad things happen to people who ask too many questions or make an enemy out of him. What kind of bad things? Don't even ask. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm gonna have to cut this conversation short. I'm not crossing that line again. And take it from me, trouble with Lorenzo is one thing you don't need in your life. You some flare up back there. I don't know what you said to him, but clearly it touched a nerve. That's not a good sign. You're, you're too young for this. Don't get in over your head. I'm oh. leaving. We're being watched. Someone was listening in to our whole conversation. Don't say anything and don't look back. Any altercation in the city will attract the guards. We better take this elsewhere.
You followed us a long way. Why don't you come out and introduce yourselves? So you're Linny. And where's your sister? Ain't she with you today? Save us the trouble and go fetch her for us. Let's not drag this out. Hyman doesn't like the tone of your voice, mister! Who sent you, huh? Save your questions, missy. You ain't gonna need answers where you're going, capiche? <sighs> Looks like we can't avoid this fight. Now, I'm not the strongest fighter, so I hope you're ready to back me up. Don't worry, we got this! Now disappear! Illusion shattered! Turn kiss? Now you shall perish! Curses! They're tougher than we thought! Vision wielders are always trouble. Intimidation ain't gonna work like it did on the lady. Come on, let's scram! Hey, wise guys! We ain't done with you yet! Oh, they got away! <sighs> did you catch what they said just before they left? Something about intimidating someone else. Sounds like they just wanted to rough us up as a scare tactic. And they've already done it to someone else, but... Who? You're right. She was injured when we saw her yesterday, and she acted like she had something to hide. Maybe she was too scared to tell us the truth because those guys had threatened her. Hmm. Well, if that's the case, she should be more willing to open up to us once she learns that those thugs won't be bothering her anymore. Let's head back to the cafe and see if we can get any information from her. Gemma? You again. What is it this time? We just ran into the men who've been threatening you, and we gave them a taste of their own medicine. So, you can relax now. We're here to protect you. What? Why? I didn't tell you anything. Why would they come after you? <laughs> Sounds like they're no strangers to you. That's putting it mildly. I know them all too well, and I hate them with every fiber of my being. It's been ten long years, and still every time I try to look into Caesar's death, they show up and warn me not to do anything stupid. How do I know I can trust you? Do you really think you can get to the bottom of it all? And why are you doing this? I'm afraid I can't reveal all the details just yet, but I can promise you this. I will expose the Phantom Weasel's true identity. Because you see, this is a personal matter of the utmost importance. I give you my word. Trust me. Okay. How can I help you? I've heard that Caesar used to have a magic workshop where he kept a lot of his personal effects. If possible, I'd like to take a look at them. Do you know where it is? The Fleuvesonde. But the place was sealed up by the police after his death, and no one's been there since. I also know that the Fleuvesonde is dangerous territory. Lots of hostile groups lurking around. If you're serious about going there, please be careful. Understood. Lynette, you stay here and take care of Gemma. Don't let her come to harm. <sighs> 
got it. But if I'm staying here, I'm ordering dessert. I mean, bon appetit, but stay sharp, too. They're likely to come for you while I'm away. Okay. All right. Power saving mode off. I'll start taking this more seriously now. If Gemma gave us the right location, then the workshop should be right nearby. Huh. Looks like these boxes are blocking the entrance. Let's shift them away first. There we go. It should be just down here. Workshop. Hmm. Nothing suspicious here, just normal magic props. Let's head in further. <laughs> what was that? Oh, is this one of Caesar's gadgets? Uh, guess we must have triggered some sort of device. <laughs> One of them looks different from the rest. Let's investigate.
weird. Have we reached the end already? There's nothing here. Oh, maybe this was a wasted trip. This place seems a little too ordinary for a magician's workshop. There's a distinct lack of mystery. We've triggered quite a few devices on the way here. Hmm. I'm starting to wonder whether Caesar built this whole place as one big, elaborate magic contraption. If so, then there must be more to this place than meets the eye. Maybe a hidden room somewhere. Aha! If I just move this book, then hopefully... And... Presto! A secret passageway! How did you know? <laughs> I'm a magician too, and apparently great minds really do think alike. Looks pretty big inside. Let's head in and take a look around. Shattered, Inazuma shines eternal. familiar somehow. Let me check this out for a second while you guys go on ahead. If anyone makes a major discovery, let's rendezvous here. Finish it in one run, huh?
bookcase is full of Caesar's own notes. He wrote a lot about the principles of magic. Whew. Much too advanced for Paimon. <gasps> hey, look! Is that Caesar's diary on the table? This book's thick as a brick! Let's take a peek inside it, shall we? At one of my shows a few days ago, a child asked me how I pulled candy out of my hat. As a joke, I told the kid that the hat has a built-in wish-granting machine. Next thing I know, today a whole bunch of kids were pestering me to pull all sorts of things out of the hat. So I told them another white lie. The machine needs time to power up, but in the meantime you can write your wishes down. Well, they took me up on that offer. Enthusiastically. As I write this, I've only just got back from running around all over town, buying the things they wanted. Boy, are my legs sore. I wound up saving very little this month. But that's not a major issue. I now have a bigger problem. How am I going to hide all these things inside my hat? Two children came to talk to me after today's show. I don't know why they were out on their own. They looked much too young to be unsupervised. I do hope they got home safely. Anyway, they said that they wanted me to teach them how to do magic. It's not uncommon for children to ask this, of course, but I've never seen any of them as serious about it as these two. I told them that learning magic is very hard work. But that didn't faze them at all. It's like they already knew. They seemed so committed. I couldn't turn them down. It seems like something's bothering Lorenzo lately, but he won't open up to me about it. Surely he's not upset that I agreed to teach those two children. I'll have to talk him around. I have a good feeling about those kids. They're naturally talented, and it seems like they're not new to the world of magic. They have all sorts of fantastic ideas. All I'm really doing is helping them develop a more professional standard training plan. They wanted to call me Master, but I told them they absolutely mustn't. Any magician worth their salt could have taught them what I have. They're the geniuses here. Compared to them, I don't deserve to be called any sort of master. With time, I have no doubt that they could become far greater magicians than I. My only concern is why they're so mature for their age. I fear they've had to grow up too fast. I don't dare to imagine what they must have been through. Gemma thinks so too. She doesn't like being around them. Says that their eyes are too piercing. They don't bother me, but then again, I've never been the sharpest tool in the shed. It's nearly time for me to go on tour. I asked the two kids if they'd like to come with me, but they shook their heads. I once overheard them talking about their father and their mission. Sounds like their parents have other plans for them. I guess we'll be parting ways soon. It's only been ten days since I first met them, but I think that I've gotten a feel for their personalities now. They're very tough, but also very cautious, and they trust no one but each other. This, I fear, is not a good habit to have. They hide things from me, too. For example, when I asked them where they live and why they wanted to learn magic, they lied. That's the thing about children. Whenever they're trying to cover something up, it always shows somehow. I can sense that their lives have been hard, possibly even dangerous, too. They're not like other children. 
It's a shame that I can't do more to help them. After thinking things over, I decided to tell them a bit about how I see the world. It's full of lies and falsehoods, and that is why we must find our own truth. P.S. I hope they won't find my nagging annoying. Children are so opinionated nowadays. Will it do them more harm than good for someone they've only known 10 days to lecture them like that? P.P.S. Maybe I'm overthinking this. Children aren't interested in grand philosophies. It probably just went in one ear and out the other. I bet they've already forgotten every word I said. Oh, Caesar, Caesar. Just mind your own business next time. Magic geniuses with a father and a mission, huh? Sounds a lot like he was writing about Linny and Lynette, don't you think? <gasps> so did they meet Caesar when they were kids? Let's go ask Linny! Hold that thought. As I expected, there's a lot of fishy things going on in this place. Fishy? Uh-oh, what have you found? All in good time. Before we go over our new leads, I want to tell you how a high-altitude escape is performed. First, the magician slots themselves into a magic box in full view of the audience. The box is then suspended high in the air, and a short while later, the base automatically opens. At this point, a dummy will fall out of the box, but it looks real enough to grab the audience's attention, and they start wailing and screaming. Meanwhile, the real magician, who has by now blended into the crowd, waits for a good moment to make their appearance and put on a hysterical performance. Oh no! Is that me? Did I just fall to my death? Very vivid description. Paimon can really picture it. And then what? The audience's gaze then turns to the magician, and by the time they realize what's happened, the dummy has vanished. As if everything that just happened was some sort of shared illusion. Of course, that's just how I think the process should work, theoretically speaking. The inventor of this trick never performed it successfully. When the box opened, Caesar was the one who fell out, and not the dummy. He fell right to the ground from the highest point of the Opera House. <sighs> no one could hope to survive that fall, not without a vision at least. And no one else has ever attempted this trick since. My understanding of how it works is just based on what I could gather from his notes and the relevant gadgets here in his workshop. So Caesar's famous high-altitude escape has never been done, huh? Paimon was about to say how cool it would have been to see it in person, but if it's that dangerous, it's probably for the best that no one else tries to do it. Wait a second. So if a dummy's supposed to drop out of the box, then where does the real magician go? How does he get out? Glad you asked. That brings us to the secret of said box. This box right here is the one that Caesar constructed himself to use in the performance, and it's not as simple as it looks. Inside, there's a device that only the magician himself would know about. Once the magician's inside, and the box is lifted up into the air, the audience's view of the box is fixed at a certain angle. From where they're standing, they have a clear view of the front, sides, and bottom, but the back and the top are now no longer visible. At this point, the magician presses a button inside the box, opening a secret door out of view. 
He then escapes through this trap door onto the opera house roof, waits for the dummy to fall and distract the audience, and quietly returns to ground level. That's way simpler than Paimon imagined. Even Paimon could probably do it. <laughs> well, there's a little more to it than that, of course. The hardest part of this trick is controlling the audience's mood and reactions. That takes an exceptional degree of showmanship. There's the falling dummy, the miraculous reappearance, the pompous performing. Maybe the magician would even have themselves tied up before it begins to strengthen the impression that there's no escape. Many days and nights of careful research and painstaking practice would have gone into this, all culminating in a performance just a few minutes long, but one that still manages to transform the shock and grief of a tragic accident to the joy and laughter of a mesmerizing magic trick. Caesar was a highly accomplished magician, but unfortunately, even he didn't manage to pull it off. So, how did it go so wrong? You said you found some fishy stuff here. Have you figured out what really happened? I can make a pretty good guess. I looked into the case files. The magic box Caesar was using at the time of his death had the secret button I mentioned positioned on the right-hand side. And, sure enough, he always used his right hand as his dominant hand in public. Okay. Nothing suspicious there. But here's the strange thing. Most of the devices in this workshop have the mechanism on the left-hand side, including this box right here. Which leads me to believe that Caesar was in fact left-handed. Because a magician can't afford to have their most basic habits stand out too much. People naturally focus their attention on the most important details of the task or situation at hand. But, a magician needs to be able to redirect an audience's attention at will, so as to avoid arousing their suspicion. The essence of magic is getting people to believe a lie. If even the truth raises eyebrows, the falsehoods become all the more difficult to mask. And so, Caesar trained himself to use his right hand to align with his audience's expectations. Great magic always requires sacrifices. But in his most stressful and nerve-wracking moments, and when no one was watching, Reflex would kick in and he'd use his left hand. That's why he set his gadgets with the mechanism on his left. Exactly. I think that's likely what happened. Caesar would have been under a lot of time pressure during the escape. He'd have had mere seconds to open the hidden compartment, retrieve the dummy, then open the secret door and make a swift escape. But I'm sure he was confident. He would have rehearsed countless times to the point where it was second nature. He'd barely need to think about what he was doing because muscle memory would guide him through. So he opened the compartment, took out the dummy, checked everything was in order, and then went to leave. With his left hand, he reached for the button and suddenly, his heart skipped a beat. It wasn't there. Much like when you reach for your keys but find your pocket empty, his mind needed a moment to process what was going on. Instinctively, his left hand would keep feeling around for the missing button, maybe for another second or two, until the bottom of the box gave way. With the stakes being as high as they were, just a two second delay cost him everything. The authorities would find nothing suspicious and conclude that his death was due to his own error. When in reality, someone switched the boxes and they did it to murder him. But how would they be able to make the switch without being noticed? That would be difficult to pull off, no? It would have to have been someone who knew that he was left-handed and who could move his props around without arousing suspicion. Someone who was always by his side. Isn't that right, Lorenzo? You just couldn't let sleeping dogs lie, could you? There's not a lot of people who'd go to all this trouble for some magician who died ten years ago. I didn't want to have to do this, you know. Silencing you the hard way just creates more problems for me to deal with. But I gave you your chance. I hoped you'd do what's good for you and back off like the lady, but... You disappoint me. You mean Gemma? 
So you are the one who's been threatening her! Yes, although however stubborn she might be, she was never much of a liability, but you people... You never even knew him, but for some reason you just wouldn't drop it. Which is why you can't leave this place alive. Take them out and make it quick. <laughs> Do your worst! Solidify! There is no escape! And voila! Stabilize! I will have order! Illusion shattered! Torn to oblivion! Here comes the finale! Tougher than you look. Had enough yet, Lorenzo? Your cronies can't help you now. I think it's high time you started talking. And what I'd really like to know is... Why did you murder Caesar? Well, if I had a mora for every time you said that man's name. Of course you idolize Caesar. Everyone else did. But I was the real genius magician. Me! He was just an amateur who did cheap tricks for gullible children. I was the one who made magic into the fine art it is today. The aristocrats doffed their hats to me! So it was jealousy. <laughs> jealousy. Hatred, more like. I hated Caesar. All he cared about was his magic. He lived and breathed it. He poured everything into his street performances and his stupid tours like it was just a hobby to him. Never bothering to think about Mora. What sort of fool devotes their life to the art of deception and never has a Mora to show for it? But the people loved him, didn't they? Oh, how they looked up to him. No one gave me a second look. All I ever heard was, Oh, your master's amazing, isn't he? Amazing? Yeah, so amazing that he was completely broke. Every other apprentice was living it up at their master's expense, but no, not me. I put in all the work, mastered all the skills, and it brought me nothing more than the life I already had. He forbade me from using magic to trick people out of their mora. There was nothing he hated more than that. And with his reputation in Fontaine, it was too risky for me to go it alone. As long as he was alive, if I dabbled in my own brand of money-making magic, he would expose me and it would destroy me. I had to kill him. There was no other way. He had to go. Hmm. And this was your only motive? It was reason enough. What other motive would I need? Well, I was under the impression that there might have been other factors at play. For instance, maybe you were in love with Gemma, but she was engaged to Caesar. In love with Gemma? D don't be ridiculous! Guess I was wrong about that then. <laughs> Next question. Are you the Phantom Weasel? I am. Caesar was so strict with me. He insisted that his way was the right way. That the sole purpose of magic was to bring joy to the world. I never bought into any of that. I was more interested in the practical value of magic. 
Sure enough, it helped me fill my pockets with all kinds of valuable treasures. Oh, yeah! Charlotte told us that the weasel would steal whatever people valued, no matter how much he was worth. That's just how it looked from the outside. What would any thief want with second-rate loot? I've only ever targeted high-value items. I stole cheap things as a way of practicing my craft. It was other people's overactive imaginations that conjured up the preposterous image they then dubbed the Phantom Weasel. So, that's the story, huh? Well, I hope you're ready to tell it all over again during your trial. What choice do I have? You're a pack of wolves, and you've got me between your jaws. You've seen what's here, and my last-ditch effort to stop it getting out has failed. What else can I do? So be it. I've enjoyed power and wealth for the last ten years, the likes of which Caesar could never give me. I wouldn't choose for things to end this way, but I regret nothing. Very well. In that case, I'll contact the guards. Traveler, Paimon, keep an eye on Lorenzo for me. I'll meet you just outside the workshop when I'm back. Lily has told me the whole story. Lorenzo, do you confess to the murder of Caesar and to framing him for the Phantom Weasel's crimes? Hmm. <laughs> Look who's finally developed a conscience. What kind of disciple murders their own master? I hope it was worth it. Because there'll be hell to pay. Looks like it's all over. What should we do next, Lenny? Should we start preparing for your show? Huh, let me think. Let's rendezvous with Lynette and Gemma first. With Lorenzo in custody, Gemma will no longer have to fear for her safety. Good point! We should go tell Gemma the good news right away! It'll give her some peace of mind for sure! <laughs> Ah, you're back. You were so quick. I've only just finished my third dessert. Your third? Lynette, come on, we've talked about this. Everything in moderation. You're not gonna have any room left for dinner now. It's fine. I'll shift to exercise mode and jog off the excess sugar. That's besides the point. <sighs> well, it's done now. But try to eat a more balanced diet in the future. <sighs> point taken. Did everything go okay? Of course! Lorenzo was no match for us. The guards are taking him into custody as we speak. Gosh, that's amazing. I'm sorry, I still didn't know if I could trust you, but now it seems I can. I had my suspicions about Lorenzo, but I... <laughs> it's okay, we understand. He did threaten you. Paimon would find it hard to trust strangers in your position too. But you don't need to be scared anymore. Everything's gonna be okay. Sorry. Sorry. My emotions are all over the place right now. I've been waiting for this day to come for so long. I always wanted to report Lorenzo. He took all of Caesar's property, which I found suspicious. But I had people watching me all the time, so I couldn't risk looking into it. I was so afraid. I was scared he'd do something terrible to me, and then no one would be left to visit Caesar's grave. So I never had the courage to speak out. Thank you all. Truly, thank you so much. 
Thank you all for clearing Caesar's name. I never would have guessed that Lorenzo was the real Phantom Weasel. He never showed any signs that there were problems between him and Caesar in public. From the outside, it looked like they got along great. Ugh, to think that Lowlife's been living life to the fullest all this time while Caesar's name was getting dragged through the mud. It's a travesty. At least his soul can finally rest in peace now, thanks to your efforts. If... if only I'd realized... before it was too late. <sighs> Don't blame yourself, Gemma. This isn't your fault. Yeah, you still have the rest of your life to live. Caesar wouldn't want to see you spending it feeling guilty. Hmm. Cheer up, Gemma. My brother's doing a magic show at the Opera House tomorrow evening. Would you like to come along? It might raise your spirits. This show will be a special one. We're holding it in Caesar's honor. In Caesar's honor? Really? Oh, thank you. I'll be there. Great. We'll see you tomorrow evening. Traveler, Paimon, don't be late. Don't worry, we'll be there. No way are we gonna miss out on a free magic show. Wait, Paimon feels like we're forgetting something. <gasps> oh yeah, Caesar's diary! We never found out if the two kids Caesar taught magic to were Linny and Lynette or not. Uh, Linny changed the topic back in the workshop so we didn't get a chance to bring it up. Oh well, guess we'll just have to ask Linny tomorrow evening. <laughs> Knights of Favonius with you next time. This time, my brother's going solo today, so I'll be watching with you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everybody's ready because the show is about to begin. The great magician Linny has prepared a spectacular show for us all tonight, concluding with an all-new grand finale that no audience has ever seen before. Thank you all so much for coming. Now, prepare to join me on a journey through the mystical and miraculous.
Exciting stuff, isn't it? Yes, it's just... It, it reminds me of him. No wonder. Caesar was a famous magician, too. So, how did you two first meet, Gemma? Hmm? Well, I was out on the street once, and I saw him performing for little children. Children love magic, because they're willing to believe in things that can't be rationally explained. Caesar had this amazing way of bringing them into a dreamlike world. And somehow, I felt drawn to him too. So I went up and asked him to do a trick for me. Aww, that sounds so romantic. What trick did he do? It was with a flower. He took it in his hand, snapped his fingers, and it magically appeared on my head. <sighs> I was so happy that day. No one had ever given me a flower before that. Oh, that's so cute! Uh, actually, now that you mention it, Winnie's done that one before. Is that right? Then I suppose he's a romantic at heart, just like Caesar. So let's treasure the time we have with him. After all, you never know when the people dearest to you might be gone. That's right. It's all over now. Um, Paimon doesn't really know how to comfort you, but at the very least, no one's going to be intimidating you from now on. You can breathe easy at last, right? Right. Yes, you can breathe easy now, Phantom Weasel. See? Even Lynette says... Wait, what? The Phantom Weasel? Lorenzo escaped? Where is he? Uh, what do you mean, Phantom Weasel? As Linny once said, a performer's job is to commit fully to their role and put on a flawless performance for their audience. But once the bag of tricks is empty and the curtain falls, it's time to end the show. The spotlight is no place for someone with no more cards up their sleeve. It's been ten years, Gemma. Aren't you tired of the Grieving Widow Act? I think it's time to put an end to it. What are you talking about? Uh, Paimon doesn't like this riddle. Traveler, Paimon doesn't like where this is going. Come on, say something! <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're all enjoying the performance so far. There will now be a brief intermission, after which Linny will perform the most electrifying act of tonight's show, the one we've all been waiting for. The final performance will take place outside of the Opera House, so please make your way outside in a calm and orderly fashion. The Phantom Weasel never did like public places, did they? Don't worry, this place will be quiet soon. Let's talk somewhere else for now. Dear me, this is awkward, isn't it? And unfortunately, I'm all out of gadgets, so I'm afraid I can't do any tricks to liven up the mood. This is a big mistake for a magician to make, but thankfully, I do have a backup plan. Now, who wants to hear a story? All in good time. Magicians are good at guessing what people are thinking. I know the questions you want to ask. And as it happens, the story I'm about to tell might answer a few of them. Really? Well then, let's hear it! I'm not dying of curiosity here! Let's go back to the very beginning. A decade ago, when the Phantom Weasel was terrorizing the Court of Fontaine, 
She never missed a target, never left a trace, and no treasure was safe from her thieving hands. But as her infamy grew, so did the readiness of the police, and her opportunities to act became ever fewer. Every day, she ran the risk of being exposed for who she was. Of course, she could not simply take this lying down, and before long, she found her ticket to freedom. She would create a scapegoat, a false weasel to close the chapter on her behalf. After weighing her options, she set her sights on a renowned magician, Caesar. After all, magic and theft shared enough similarities for people to buy the story when the truth came out. So... so then what? Being the master deceiver she was, the weasel easily earned Caesar's trust. Now all that remained was to frame him for her countless crimes. But as she was considering how to make her move, she noticed Caesar's aggrieved pupil, and a new thought entered her mind. Maybe I don't need to get my hands dirty after all. At her encouragement, Lorenzo tampered with Caesar's magic box, causing him to fall to his death. Afterwards, Lorenzo seized his master's property, and the weasel set about tarnishing Caesar's reputation. Two co-conspirators committed the perfect crime. <laughs> I've got to hand it to you. You're both exceptional storytellers. It's enough to make even me wonder whether there was really another mastermind behind all this. Pulling the strings. But I just have one question. You seem to think that I am the villain in this tale. What's brought this on, Linny? Is it something that Lorenzo said? Don't worry, Lorenzo said nothing at all. But I never believed that he was the weasel, and in fact, my investigation only made me more certain of that. He was too forthcoming with his confession, as if there was something else he was trying to hide. How disappointing. So you'd sooner trust Lorenzo than me? Even without a shred of evidence? A magician is an expert at playing the audience to get the result they want. And I have no doubt that you, Gemma, are equally talented in this regard. With a little help from Lorenzo, you put on a very convincing performance. The lovesick fiancé, whose devotion to her betrothed is unshakable, even under threats of violence. Caesar was maligned and hated by all for ten years, but you? Everyone sympathized with your plight. Who would suspect for one second that the lovely young lady always seen weeping in front of Caesar's grave was actually the mastermind behind his demise? No, not that poor lady. Uh, perish the thought. Wait. So you mean... the whole intimidation thing was just a hoax? Gemma and Lorenzo were both in on it? But... why would Lorenzo agree to that? And why didn't he sell her out even at the end instead of admitting to being the weasel himself? Yes, why indeed. Hmm. Maybe Gemma herself could enlighten us on that question. Well, Linny... If you're so confident in your version of events, then I think the answer should be obvious. Having killed Caesar with his own hands, Lorenzo was plagued by overwhelming guilt. Revealing the Phantom Weasel's true identity would serve no purpose. But, if the Weasel remained free, then she could take care of Lorenzo's loved ones. An excellent answer. Though sadly, a little dull. Is that right? Well, don't let me bore you. If you'd care to change the topic to something more interesting, I'd be much obliged. As a matter of fact, there's one thing I'd really like to understand. Why would the real Weasel have targeted things that only have value to other people? Could you shed any light on that? Of course. After all, we're just telling stories here, aren't we? If I had to guess... I would say that the real Weasel must have had a terrible childhood. Left to fend for herself after her parents died young. Betrayed. Scorned. Beaten. She'd scrounge waste paper from garbage bins to draw on, using twigs and dirt for lack of ink and pen. 
She'd sew ugly rag dolls from whatever scrap material she could get her hands on. This was her only source of happiness in life. But it was all she needed, and she was content. Until the world decided that even this was too good for her. Once again, she was betrayed. And this time, everything was taken from her. She felt like life was a miry pit that dragged her further down the more she struggled to escape. At that tender age, she should have been happy. Instead, she stood in the shadows and watched with envy as all good things in the world passed her by. This was a fate too cruel for anyone to bear. Her pain became a breeding ground for dark thoughts. Thoughts which festered and grew into a twisted solution to her troubles. I detest the happiness of others, in all its forms alike. I will rob them of everything they hold to be good and true. And it will fill the void in my soul. That's some pretty heavy stuff. <laughs> now it all makes sense. Does this story satisfy you, Linny? Yes, it is quite to my tastes. Thank you for helping to clear up my confusion. Huh. That's right! What drove you to write that letter, Gemma? What were you trying to achieve there? Because without that, none of this would have ever come to light! She didn't write the letter. <sighs> After ten long years, I'd hoped that the Phantom Weasel would be consigned to the history books by now. <sighs> but it seems like someone still wasn't ready to let her finally be at peace. Linny. Or should I call you the Phantom Copycat now? You were the one who posted that letter outside the Opera House. But why? Very sharp, Phantom Weasel. Still as shrewd as ever. Well, no need for me to be coy about it. Our goal was to clear Caesar's name. The most straightforward way to change the public's impression of Caesar was to force the Weasel to show themselves. Uh, that's it? You had no other agenda? Of course we did. We made it quite clear in the letter, I believe. I shall take from you that which you hold most dear, just as you did to me ten years ago. Uh, ten years ago? You mean Caesar's death? You, you met him? Uh, wait. Oh, I get it. You were those two obnoxious kids. It's been so long, and you're all grown up now. I didn't recognize you. He taught you magic back then, didn't he? For, what, ten days or something? <laughs> and you went to all this trouble. Why? Because you feel like you still owe him something? We remember all our debts, however great or small. Ten years ago, Caesar's reputation was torn to shreds and his legacy was thrown out. Ten years on, and no one cares what the truth is anymore. But we did not forget. And so we came to find you. And? What exactly did you take from me? I'm still standing, as you can see. Lorenzo has admitted to everything. I'm free. Free? <laughs> Do you really think so? Caesar once told me that even though the world is filled with lies and falsehoods, we must find our own truth. I think that applies to you too. Truth can take many forms. Prized possessions with nostalgic value, fervent hopes and dreams, and irreplaceable people. Life took many things from you, and those wounds never healed. When they ached unbearably in the dead of night, stealing became your way of numbing the pain. What are you trying to say? I'm saying that for the last ten years, you've been living a rather uneventful life. Perhaps that's because you found something other than a life of crime to fill the hole? 
Back to Lorenzo for a second. He murdered his own master, played along with your act, and took pains to make sure any suspicion would be directed towards him. But what did he have to gain from all that? He knew who you were and the things you'd done, and despite that, he was willing to give everything up for your sake. He's the reason that you haven't felt the compulsion to steal in all these years. You're more than just accomplices in murder. You're the only real friends each other has. So I think you know, deep down, that he is the only truth you have in your life. But that truth is gone now, and I guarantee you, you'll never see it again. <sighs> Congratulations on your freedom. Gemma. Your freedom will cost you dearly. From now on, you'll be all alone in a world full of lies and falsehoods. I do hope you'll be able to bear it. You've still got a long life ahead of you, after all. Gather round, one and all! The time has now come for the amazing Linny to perform his final act in tonight's show! I'm sure you're all wondering what he has planned for the grand finale. Well, wonder no more, for the answer is a death-defying high-altitude escape. A high-altitude escape? I'm sure you all remember the magician Caesar. This was the very trick that led to his fatal fall, after which he was dubbed the Phantom Weasel. So we have now learned that Caesar was wrongly accused and that the real weasel had now confessed to their crimes. Guess that's my cue to leave. Whew. I've been practicing this one for ages now, but I'm still a little nervous. Traveler, Paimon, I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. There may be a lot of people watching tonight, but you alone are my true witnesses. Lenny, wait. You two hid a lot from Caesar. He went to his grave without ever knowing your secrets. So what about now? Are you an open book? Or are you still the same as ever? You don't have to tell lies to end up isolated and alone. One day, you'll end up exactly where I am today. Maybe then you'll finally understand. You're wrong. I'm nothing like you. <laughs> so, uh, what are we, uh, doing now? Like Lenny said, when you're ready, let's head outside and watch the show. But what about Gemma? She'll figure out what's best for her soon enough. Oh, and if you'd like to see Lenny after the show, you know where he'll be. The usual haunt. Lenny's finale, then! Uh, this trick's a pretty dangerous one, but he should be able to pull it off, right? Magic should be mysterious, surprising, and defy logic. Magic is hard work. Every single movement has to be practiced thousands of times. It's alright. We're used to that. Uh, ah! We're sorry. You've taught us so much, but we can't tell you the whole truth. <sighs> it's okay. Do you still remember what I told you? This world is full of lies and falsehoods. I only hope that one day, you can find your own truth. Uh, what about you? Have you found your truth? Magic is my truth. 
I want to perform a magic trick so great that people will always think of me when they talk about it. For a magician, what greater honor could there be? Look! Behold! Linny is sealed inside the box. Will he manage to escape? Ten years ago, Caesar attempted this very trick, and it was at this precise moment that... Mysterious. Surprising. And logic defying. Isn't that right? This honor belongs to you, Caesar. I'm just sorry it's a little late. Could he possibly have done that? How mysterious. I didn't blink once. He just vanished right in front of my eyes. What a heart-stopping magic show. This was really worth the trip. Caesar's name has finally been cleared, and Fontaine's new star magician, Linny, has fulfilled a wish on his behalf. Oh, I couldn't ask for a better grand finale. It will make a great headline for the Steambird tomorrow, even if I do say so myself. <sighs> Looks like everyone really loved Linny's grand finale! Paima doesn't see Linny anywhere! Where'd he go? Oh! Lynette said he'd be waiting for us at the... usual... haunt. But... um... Where is that? Oh! You mean the one where Caesar's buried? Yeah, that's probably it. This whole magic show kind of seemed like Lenny's way of saying goodbye to Caesar. So it makes sense that that's where he'd be afterward. Alright, let's go look for him there. When the chain broke, Paimon was sure something had gone horribly wrong. Magic is a performance art. A magician has to get creative to keep the audience on tenterhooks. That's our job. So I tweaked Caesar's original setup a little to keep it fresh. I was honestly a little nervous during the live performance. The thought of falling, suddenly feeling weightless, seeing the sky and the ground spinning and spinning. Sometimes, I can't help but wonder what Caesar thought in those final moments. Did he regret taking Gemma and Lorenzo on? Or did he believe that it was his own slip-up right until the end? You know, Paimon's been wanting to ask you about something ever since we were in Caesar's workshop. You learned magic from Caesar once, didn't you? When was that? After I joined the House of the Hearth. To be honest, Lynette and I had an agenda when we approached him. I told you about my past before, remember? As a young boy, I survived by secretly learning magic from street performers. I'd watch their tricks and try to figure out how they were done. But I quickly realized that observation alone could only get me so far. What I saw was the polished final performance, but the rigorous training they put in behind the scenes remained invisible to me. 
I needed to learn how to improve my sleight of hand, hone my misdirection skills, and make niftier props. We were gifted enough that we'd made some progress by ourselves, but without proper guidance from a professional magician, we quickly plateaued. So that's why you sought Caesar out? Yes. We figured there was no harm in asking, but it took us by surprise that he was so willing to teach us. In all, we only spent ten short days together, but he was very good to us. By contrast, we hid so many things from him. For instance, when he asked why I wanted to learn magic, I answered, it's my passion. But in truth, there was already a lot more to the story by then. After being taken in by an aristocrat for our magic talent, then betrayed soon after, this was no longer about me doing what I loved. What amazed me was how the lie escaped my lips even as I was hesitating over whether to tell him the truth. Trust is a beautiful thing. Sadly, I'd forgotten how to trust by then. Lenny. Still worried about the way I feel? <laughs> you really are a gentle soul, aren't you? But don't worry, I'm used to it now. From the mansions of the elite to the house of the hearth, lies and selfishness have followed me and Lynette everywhere we go. After Caesar went on tour, we became busy with our missions. The next we heard of him was that he'd fallen to his death, and was now declared to be the Phantom Weasel. That night, I remembered his smile. But as I lay there, I didn't know what to say to him. To keep secrets is to put up walls. The longer you keep them up, the less you let people in. Then, one day, you look around and realize your life is like an empty auditorium after a show, full of seats once occupied by all the people who left. <sighs> but I guess that's the price we have to pay. You only realize how much someone really meant to you when you lose them completely. That's why I was so confident this would hurt Gemma. Because I felt it for myself. Yeah, cheer up, Winnie. We've had to say our fair share of goodbyes during our journey, too. But whatever happens, Paimon always believes in what tomorrow brings. Delicious food, fun toys, and the traveler by my side. Paimon just needs to focus on things like this and all the unhappy stuff goes right out the window. Um, you know, Traveler, doesn't that kind of make you Paimon's truth? Exactly. It's the same for me and Lynette. We are the truest thing each other has in the world and nothing can replace that. Life has taken plenty from us like it did from Gemma. But at least it left us with each other. That's what gave us the strength to get through the darkest days. That's why the darkness never consumed me and why it never will. Maybe we live in the shadows too, but we remember every precious ray of light that shines through. Alright, time to lighten this conversation up a little. What did you think of the show tonight? Were you happy with it? It was amazing! Paimon just wishes we hadn't been so distracted with the Gemma situation. We spent most of our time in the Opera House just talking and pretty much missed the entire first half of the show. Um, Lenny, could you do just one more trick for us? Whoa, that's a bit of a tall order, I'm afraid. The show's just finished, so my sleeves are decidedly card-free right now. Surely you can think of something. The Lenny Paimon knows can do anything if he puts his mind to it. Oh, all right then. I'll give it a go, but only because it's you. Watch closely. I have a flower in my hand. You liar! There's nothing in your hand! We ain't going along with this! Huh? My goodness, you're right! But I could have sworn I brought one here with me. Hmm... Okay, try this. Count down with me. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Now, have another look around. Maybe the flowers appeared somewhere else. Really? Let's see. Wow, there it is! Oh, this is a different 
flower from the last time, right? This one's called, um, oh yeah, a rainbow rose. But more importantly, Paimon has to know how the trick is done. Please, Lenny, pretty please. Well, if you want to learn magic, you'll have to start by addressing me as teacher. Ugh, fine. Please, teacher, please. <sighs> Since you asked so nicely, I'll share one little tip with you. Namely, the student of magic cannot solely rely on others being prepared to reveal their secrets. You have to observe, think, and find the answers for yourself. Is that it? Ah, look at the time. We shouldn't linger here too long. Thanks again for coming to see my show. I bid you both good night. I look forward to seeing you again. <sighs> All right, fine. See ya. Shall we head back down too? Oh, Paimon can't wait to read the Steambird tomorrow. Paimon bets Linny and Caesar will be plastered all over it. Let's head to the Steambird's offices tomorrow morning and see what we can find out. I'm very sorry, Charlotte, but my sister and I are quite busy today. I'm afraid we'll have to decline this interview. Oh, please, Linny, I'll only take a moment of your time, if you would be so kind. Huh? What's happening here? I spent all night writing my piece about the Phantom Weasel, and it was going to go to print this morning. But just as dawn broke, I suddenly received news that Caesar's fiance, Gemma, had contacted the guards and confessed to having been the real Phantom Weasel all along. That was quick. <clears throat> hmm? Too late, bro. <laughs> that was quick, you say? It sounds like I've got some catching up to do. Please, fill me in. <laughs> Whoops! Aha! My instincts did not lead me astray. You do have something to hide. Gemma turning herself in must have something to do with Linny's performance last night. Maybe watching my high-altitude escape trick reminded her of a better time with Caesar, and she could no longer ignore the voice of her conscience. Huh. Okay, then. Wait, no, 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 there must be more to it. If that's all it took for her to have a change of heart, how did it take her ten whole years? Um, well... Oh, I remember now! You and Gemma were nowhere to be found after the show. What happened between you? Quickfire question! Where did you all go after the show? Oh, we went to the cemetery and Linny did a private magic trick just for us! Actually, glad you mentioned it, because that reminds Paimon, guess what? Linny started using rainbow roses in his tricks! <coughs> what? Hmm. I don't recall ever having received a rainbow rose from you myself. Is this supposed to mean that they're more important to you than your own sister? No, I, I just, uh... What the... What now? Oh, did Paimon say something wrong again? <laughs> this is getting pretty awkward. What do we do, Traveler? <sighs> Seems like this interview wasn't meant to be. Well, never mind. There's always next time. Forgive my persistence, but when there's explosive news waiting to be found, I can't turn away. The news about Gemma has already made waves, and I'll stop at nothing to get to the bottom of it all. Apparently, one of the things she said to the guards was that her final wish is to see Lorenzo one last time. 
Oh, there's clearly a web of complicated relationships there. Can't blame me for being curious. All right, I guess I'll leave you to continue the rest of your conversation in peace. Bye for now. Um, Lynette? Paimon didn't mean to... <laughs> Don't worry, I wasn't angry. I was just trying to distract her. Oh, really? Oh, thank goodness. You scared Paimon there. Phew. You and me both, Paimon. You and me both. At least it did the job, right? Please, take good care of that rainbow rose. I'd be really upset if you lost it.